In 2013, Magnus Carlsen became the world chess champion. And at that time, at only 10 years old, Ali Reza Farusha had only played the game of chess for one year. And here we are, 10 years later. It is the perfect finish to the Julius Baer Generations Cup with a match between the 20-year-old Farusha and 32-year-old Magnus Carlsen. A big welcome, everyone, to the grand final of the Julius Baer Generation Cup. Jordan seems to be doing everything right with that anymore. He blundered his knight. Oh. It's full of traps. When you saw the reaction, he's like, oh crap, here we go. Like, what has this kid got in store? It's got to be a checkmate, right? I mean, that king, it's got to go. Oh, there it is, it's checkmate. Did. Oh my so god, wow. did he just miss that? Checkmate on the board. Eduardo Drizaga reacts, he celebrates. Oh, 
takes the bait. Check meeting, it's on the board, Simon. Oh, there we go. Oh my god, and we have a winner. I am stepping in for Tanya today, and it is a big pleasure to be here in the studio with your chess experts, Grandmaster David Howell, Grandmaster Simon Williams, and International Master Ivanka Hauska. It is the final day of the Julius Verde Generation Cup, David. What do you expect from the grand final today? First of all, Kaya, welcome back. Thank you. So good to <laughs> have you. you. It's the original team back together again. It really is. And uh, what better day? It's a big final. Yeah. I'm expecting it to be dramatic no matter what. It always is when these two play each other. And Magnus might start as the favourite, but uh, it will be fire on the board. Yeah, and Simon, Magnus, he's coming from that World Cup win. He has only lost one game in this tournament this week. He seems like he's just not slipping up. What would you say about the version we're seeing of Magnus Carlsen right now? It's a pretty good version. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the ultimate version, I think. And uh, he's just so good. I mean, like you say, he's just won the World Cup. And uh, I don't know where he gets his motivation from because he, he did that tweet where he said chess completed. Yeah. And he's basically completed everything. But he continues to play great chess and, and to win everything. So, yeah, incredible. Incredible play from him. And Ali Reza Fruja, he needs to be motivated today to be able to beat Magnus Carlsen. Not only in one match, he will have to win two matches, Ivanka. What do you expect from the young Frenchman today? Well, it sounds like this is a bit of a mission impossible, right? He has to beat Magnus twice. But we have seen some minor slip-ups up, slip from Magnus. He has blundered on occasion. And I think Ali Reza Faruja, with his dynamic style, should just come in with a fine-tuned opening repertoire. He has the right strategy. He has to mix it up. He has to initiate chaos. He has to ha just have that touch of solidity with the black pieces. Yeah. And uh, yesterday's day four was all about uh, finding out who from the losers bracket would make it to the grand final to face Magnus Carlsen today. And in uh, the losers semi-final, Abdusatorov got off to a bad start. This is just beautiful, uh, beautiful from Dennis again. I've used that word too many times, beautiful, but in this game, but it's just so harmonious. Look at how uh, these pieces combine and G5, like you say, is it just unstoppable here? I just don't see any way. Ooh. And he makes a move with less than a second on the clock. He does come up with the king. David, is there a finish blow? I do see a second. He's... This is an incredible technique by uh, Dennis Lasovic. Placing the queen, taking care of all the checks, and now we're going to see a mate on the board. And there it is. Checkmate by Dennis Lazowick in game one. It's going to be king versus king in the end. The it, black rook's going to give up, give itself up for the pawn. And there it is. Dennis Lazowick takes down Nordebeck Abdusatro. This is the uh, chaos button that he's just pressed. He has one connect for. Oh my gosh. Under 50 seconds, he plays a move. He immediately reacts and as does the bar. One second, he needs to make a move. Oi, oi, oi. Dennis getting very nervous here, not putting this in the back of the net, and this could turn. Wow, evaluation bar even says that this oh, wow. is level now. He's a cool no, oh, my oh my gosh! Look at this. It's turned around. Faruja, such immense resilience there. How did he do that? Yeah, that was oh, magic. Like a, I don't know. I mean, you, you turn around for a second and Laz you Lazarek suddenly just win. panicked. It okay, is yeah, on the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is... Oh, I'm really happy to see this. That is it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, Unbelievable chess here, unfortunately, for Danis Lazovic. After a fantastic run and a big fight, being so close to victory, a couple of inaccuracies, and it is the end of the road for the 16-year-old. Well, Lasa Vicky is still fighting to qualify for the Tour Finals with only one regular event left before we head to Toronto. Eight players will be going there and most recently Caruana and So secured their tickets. But three spots are still up for grabs. And let's take a look at the unofficial standings. Magnus Carlsen on for 75 points. Ali Reza Fruja on 150 points. The winner of today's match will gain an additional 50 points, but for Ali Reza Fruja, he has to win today's match to be secured one of those spots in Toronto. Otherwise, he will uh, fight with uh, Lazovic in the final event uh, to gain the points he needs to qualify for Toronto. So, David, Fruja, he must be super motivated to just get the job done today and secure his ticket.
It's a big, big day for Alareza Ferruja. The good news is, even if Magnus Carlsen does take it, points-wise, he's doing pretty well for Ferruja, and uh, he's guaranteed a sp uh, spot in Division 1 next time. I think he can play with the pressure off, even though, in the back of his mind, Toronto, it's such a big price. Yeah, and this is a golden opportunity for him, you know, to play in the final against Magnus Carlsen. And if he manages to turn it around, of course, he will get that spot into Toronto. That's right. It is a big chance and um, he's just got to play a little bit more solid, I feel. And I never say that. <laughs> I never like people playing more solid, but he got a bit crushed in the opening last time. So he needs to change that around a bit mm. in this match. And the final regular event on the tour, it's only three weeks away, actually. It's tight, these events. And that's definitely going to be an exciting one. It should go down to the wire to figure out either the last two or three spots. Yeah, uh, I can't wait. It's so much chess this time of year. It's packed the chess calendar. Yeah. We know we'll see Magnus there, Ferruja, Dennis Lazovic. And um, yeah, this I think this match today is going to kind of set up. It's going to build that momentum towards the final now as we build towards the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That final is going to be so exciting. I mean, it was uh, it, that's where last year was where we got hands from, wasn't it? So yeah, I, mean, I, I wonder what we're going to get this year. <laughs> so, Drama. Be interesting. Yeah. 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 Lots of chess on the board, yeah. lots of excitement, and of course, the prestige of uh, winning the Champions Chess Tour season. Yeah, but only today is going to be super exciting, you guys. I'm looking forward to lean back and listen to your commentary of the grand final between Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Vruja. They actually met only two days ago in the winner's final. Oh, here it's you normal. guys from my oh. move. Oh, oh, look at the ball. Oh, go down. <laughs> Question oh. mark. Oh, dear. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Magnus is back. Magnus is just relentless. Look at him. Just He's good, taking fun. everything now. <laughs> Ali Reza, Firuja resigns. Magnus Carlsen making it look easy today. With how much time did he have on the clock? Because it's a three-second second. increment. Barely any time. Oh, Ooh, not now, but the, the king Might is be morphing checkmate. into a mating net. He's going to get caged. Ali Reza Ferruja resigns. Magnus Carlsen wrapping it up in three games. Yeah, I would overall say that um, we played three very complicated games and um, I feel like I handled them uh, really well. It uh, definitely looked brutal on the scoreboard with three wins for Magnus Carlsen. Was it simply domination, Yvanka? Um, yes, uh, in simple words. I mean, Magnus won in three games. Also, the positions were very chaotic. And Magnus himself said it was a pleasure to play those games. So Ali Reza will need to shake things up, do something that's unexpected if he wants to defeat Magnus. Definitely. Furuja, what do you expect from him today, Simon? He should be coming in with a different game plan, or what do you think? I think he needs to try and change the 0-3, definitely, that he got in the last one. And um, he was playing very interesting chess in the last one, but his mm -hmm. openings were a bit too interesting. So, uh, especially with the black pieces, he was really pushing the boundaries of uh, what you can get away with uh, in the opening. So, I, I think uh, he's just got to tighten up a little bit there and wait for his opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, Magnus is playing great, but in a lot of games, there's always an opportunity against Magnus. But it's only one opportunity yeah. that you get normally. So he's just got to wait for that opportunity and grasp it, I feel. I think Magnus described this as uh, actually three complicated uh, games. He said he also did take some risks in that winner's uh, final. What do you expect from Magnus today, David? Yeah, I think the reason we love seeing this matchup is because both players take risks. They yeah. respect each other so much, but uh, they kind of respect chess more and they're happy to kind of go for each other. From Magnus, I expect him to do exactly what he's been doing throughout the tournament. He's completed chess, he's done it all, he's very relaxed. Uh, he'll take his chances when they come, but uh, I'm on Simon's side. Ferruja, not just to, does he have to win one match, remember, he has to win two matches, and the only way to do that is to stay solid. He cannot let Magnus strike first. Magnus, when he doesn't want to lose, he'll shut things down. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about Ferruja uh, staying solid. Yeah, let's take a look at the tail of the tape for today's big grand final. Magnus Carlsen, he uh, is coming from the winner's bracket and if he wins the match, he will be the winner of the Julius Baird Generation Cup. Ali Reza Vruza, he has to beat Magnus in two matches. What chances do you give him, Simon? I, I, I think he's got decent chances. I mean, uh, you know, it's a new day. It's a fresh day. He, he is, uh, um, well, they're both unbelievable chess players there's no doubt about that i couldn't believe it the other day when uh, i only found out he's been playing for like 12 years or something it's i like, know well, how, the, how the hell did he do that <laughs> it's incredible right i mean like to become that strong david you mentioned it was in a period of eight years he became world number two or something 
Is that right? Eight, which is just unheard of. So yeah. he's really uh, a magical player. So he can turn it on and, and he needs to today. Yeah, the fact that he actually started playing chess when he was only eight, nine years old. Here he is to face Magnus Carlsen in a match. How uh, special is that really, David? I mean, it's special for anyone. Uh, for Ruzio, maybe it's extra special because uh, he's one of the most talented players uh, of this new generation. We talk about generations and he's meeting the leader of the current generation, the big boss, Magnus Carlsen. And uh, yeah, I mean, what a world championship match this could have been. Maybe will be someday. You never know. But uh, either way, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big, big day. Definitely. And he is only 20 years old, Yvanka. If he actually is able to beat Magnus in those two matches today to win the tournament, where would we actually rate that in Alvarez's career? Um, it would be pretty high up yeah. there because to beat Magnus on demand once and then twice is going to be phenomenal. Phenomenal. And then, of course, to actually do it when everyone doesn't expect that from him, that would also be sensational. Yeah. And also bearing in mind that 3-0 scoreline as well from their previous encounter, I would rate that up pretty highly, especially yeah. when it comes to online chess. But, you know, this is just the start for Ferruja. You know, he's just 20 years old and he's going to get better and better. Yeah, but is there something in the air uh, tonight, do you think, Simon, for Ali Reza, a big day in his career? I, I, I think, again, it, yeah, it's very possible. I mean, um, he's done it before against Magnus. I mean, he's beat him in many games. They've played loads of contests uh, online and uh, he just needs to be on top form, yeah. obviously, to do it, to have any chance. And... Uh, he does need to do it twice as well, which is no. also a bit tricky. <laughs> Not once, twice. So, so uh, good luck. Yeah. yeah. If you were his coach, David Dalarez of Russo tonight, what would you tell him? What does he need to do to be able to, to do the incredible and beat Magnus twice? I would say be confident. Yesterday in the interview, Ferruccio himself mentioned that the other day was a bit heartbreaking. It was really tough. But also do your puzzle rush. He had a winning position against Magnus two days ago. Just one tactic, he let it slip and it all turned around. So if he takes his chance when it comes, who knows, it could be his best online uh, speed chess performance ever. Yeah. Well, we're going to put you guys at home on the line as well. We do have a quiz question today as well. And the quiz question on this final day of the Generation Cup is, in 2006, Vigie Anand crossed 2,800 uh, in rating as the fourth player in history. So who were the three other players who had achieved this at that time? And let's see what uh, happened when uh, Simon and David uh, was uh, introduced to this quiz question. Oh my god. Okay. So there was over 2,800. Stakes are high, Simon. What are we playing for? <laughs> um, mm. <laughs> well, stakes are super high for you guys at home as well because you are playing for this one the just resigned Ginger GM t shirt. Is it worn, Simon? Yeah, I mean, what could be better than um, winning a T-shirt with my face on? <laughs> what a prize that is. Is it worn? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the person who wins it will have to uh, find out that. So uh, maybe a little bit. Is that, is that <laughs> some whiskey stains we're seeing here? Could be from the good night last yeah. night. So, or uh, yes. <laughs> no, I think it's a fresh one. So no, no fit air. You're, you're not going to get any uh, stained T-shirts Yeah. as a prize. It is a cool T-shirt. And if you want to win it, you need to submit your answer on... Uh, X. Last time I was here, it was called Twitter. I feel old now. <laughs> it's been a while, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff happened in the world. Remember to use the hashtag chess champs. Uh, so answer that quiz question. Later today in the show, something very fun is coming up. It's uh, Simon and David driving go-karts. <laughs> okay, he's stuck. Yeah, I'm coming! I'm coming for you! <laughs> <laughs> Laters! <laughs> Was that Max Verstappen I was seeing there? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it was very much a tale of uh, the hare and the tortoise, but I won't spoil who won yet. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to see that in a break uh, later on today. Right now, we are waiting for 
game one in uh, the grand final with uh, Magnus Carlsen taking on 20-year-old Ali Reza Fruja. They are getting ready, the two players. For this grand final, it is best out of four rapid games. And if they are tied, then... Uh, well, actually, if they are tied, then Magnus is the winner. If uh, Ali Reza Fruja wins this match, wait. No, it's no, Armageddon. No, then it's Armageddon. I'm kidding. If they are tied, then Armageddon to decide the match. And Alireza Vruja, he has to win the match to take it to a second match. Here we have the regulations. I apparently need to read those. 15 minutes plus uh, three seconds increment is uh, the time control. And uh, Magnus Carlsen, if he wins the match, he will be the winner. The third time this season, he wins an event in uh, the Champions Chess Tour. Alireza Vruja has to win it to take it to eight second match and uh, Armageddon tie breaks. Magnus hasn't played those in this tournament. Do you think he actually kind of kind of wants to today? Well, I don't think Magnus would be averse to playing Armageddon. He's got a great track record historically there, but actually that could work in Faruja's favor. Just the fact that Magnus has had very short matches this uh, this tournament, whereas Faruja, he's had longer days. He's had these mm -hmm. long, long battles, long grinds, and he's had a taste of Armageddon himself. So. Yeah, I think the longer the match is, it could be a potential eight games today if Faruja can take it the whole distance. Uh, the longer he can drag it out, postpone mm -hmm. the results, I think the greater his chances become as the younger player. Do you agree, Simon, that the younger player, he wants to drag this out as long as possible? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, he, he just needs to start well as well. I mean, this is the key thing. I think if he loses the first game to Magnus, it's going to be really, really tricky. So mm -hmm. he needs to come out and uh, yeah, have a good first game. So this is going to be key. Yeah. It's the whole day. Now, Magnus, he's been in these situations a bunch of time, being in charge, the one who only needs uh, sort of the first match. Do you expect him to play some solid, I wouldn't say boring chess, but solid chess, Ivanka? Or could he still take some chances, do you think? I think Magnus is going to stick to his style. It's generally universal. He's happy to enter complications if so desired. But, you know, Magnus has been on a winning formula this year. Why not continue that? I think it's up to Ali Reza just to unsettle him, maybe surprise him in the opening, keep that solidity that, that David and Simon have been uh, referring to, and then, you know, take the adventure when you have the white pieces. And uh, okay. there we, we have them. We have been waiting for Magnus Carlsen to get ready, and here he is ready for game one in the grand final. And we have the first move. We have the first move. It is a king's pawn opening, and Ferruja has switched up his opening approach. This, this time it's the Spanish opening, the Roy Lopez. Two days ago, Ferruja went for the Sicilian and was quickly punished. Uh, White got a big attack. Magnus wiped him off the board in that first game. So he's definitely uh, spoken to a coach. He's definitely uh, kind of taken on new advice. And this is one of the most solid setups for Black uh, at these early stages. What will Magnus go for? He's looking away here. He's just picking which uh, variation to go for. This is one of the main lines. This has been played for hundreds and hundreds of years at the top levels. And uh, eventually Magnus pushes his pawn to d3. To, so taking a slower approach to this game. Uh, copycat here from Ferruja. And uh, all pieces will stay on the board here for a long time. So it's going to be tension packed, but rock solid for both players. Uh, what do you think here, Simon? Your prediction was correct. Yeah, I think it's a very good choice um, from Ali Razor. I wasn't sure if he might try to Berlin or something, but mm. this is more his kind of style because uh, he's keeping the pieces on. He has great experience as we spoke about yesterday on the sort of in these kind of structures he's probably the world's leading expert in the the italian which is very similar to this so he's just uh he's just uh, keeping it a bit safer but with potential uh potential to grasp an opportunity if it does come about and uh magnus also obviously knows these positions pretty well as well doesn't he so uh you know he's not bad <laughs> he's played a couple of games in destruction before <laughs> Just a couple, right? Um, yeah, no, but we have uh, seen Magnus just take a pause. The most natural move is actually to develop the knight there on the left side of the board, move it to the square in front of the queen. And uh, Magnus has taken the second most popular move, which is just to take a precautionary move, give the king some air and control the g4 square. Yeah. Is it just me or is Magnus moving a bit slower than he usually does? Considering he's got vast experience here, Magnus basically became world champion on the back of his uh, kind of play with 1e4. Uh, he was pretty much only uh, using this opening as white back in the days when he was kind of rising through the ranks uh, when he was back in Farouche's age. 
And uh, yeah, it's a bit strange. It feels like mm. he's freestyling, maybe trying to avoid Farouja's preparation. But either way, in past days, just this week throughout the uh, Julius Baer Generation Cup, Magnus has been very fast in the opening, uh, getting a quick time advantage against most of his opponents here. He looks surprised. So is the, yeah, is this a sign he is surprised? Is this a sign he has something very tricky up his sleeve? What do you think? Possibly. Yeah, it might be just he's looking for a sophisticated manoeuvre, uh, something that Ferrugia won't have expected uh, before. But the problem here is that uh, this is so well explored, as we mentioned, it's one of the most popular types of openings in chess, at least the pawn structure. Uh, so all the manoeuvres are well known. Um, it's a bit strange, at least to me, that he's thinking uh, here for white. Two minutes now in the tank. Yeah, maybe he's just trying to think what, what kind of middle game strategy he wants to go for here. I mean, uh, uh, there's various ways that you can play this as white. So you can play it quite slowly um, and and you can just develop your pieces. And he seems to be going for this strategy here. Or you can try to strike in the centre uh, as well by pushing a pawn. So I guess that's why he's spending a bit of time. It does seem a little bit odd that he, yeah. he's thinking so much here. This this move I, I, is, I, you know, I'm not an expert in, in this, this structure at all, but... Um, I don't know this move, personally. But uh, oh. also looking at the database, it's only saying that there's been one game with this bishop move. Everyone else has actually just developed the knight. And Is Magnus trying to take a shortcut? I'll have a look. I mean, it, it does seem to allow d5, doesn't it? That, that's, my first, mm. that's my first thing I'm thinking, because uh, the bishop is blocking the rook. White puts the rook in the middle to attack black centre. But he's moved his bishop in the way of that, and that that allows this typical kind of martial idea. Maybe David, I mean that you, you're more of an expert in these positions than me, by certainly. And uh, the yeah. d5 kind of seems natural, and he's played it, I think. So he's played it, and Magnus has reacted with the typical knight maneuver. Usually, we see the white knight first kind of relocate next to the other knight in front of the white king, making sure you're really solid on this side of the board. Once the other white knight reaches here uh, with the two pieces, uh, you're nearly never in danger. You can hop forward and start attacking the black king. But it definitely feels like Magnus here. It's the white uh, pieces that are cramped. Black has advanced on the queen side. Black has more space over here. Black has more space in the centre. Uh, look at all these pawns uh, kind of well advanced uh, in the middle of the board. Uh, I think Farouja has many reasons to be happy with the outcome of this opening. Uh, definitely not worse. Actually, maybe fighting for the advantage with black already if Magnus isn't careful. Uh, that being said, white is still solid and uh, I'm expecting Magnus to move his queen, bring his rook to the centre and still the central tension, as long as it persists, uh, it's a big question who will hold the advantage later. Mm -hmm. And uh, for black, I guess, it's whether he should maintain the tension in the centre, should he step the pawn forward, should he just leave the pawns as they are and try to centralise the rooks? Yeah. Or is he going to be tempted to actually exchange in the middle? It's not Ferruja's style to trade off pawns in the centre. Uh, if we ever do see black take the white pawn on e4, then it becomes very symmetrical. And I think that favours Magnus, who's uh, maybe slightly uh, superior here in terms of manoeuvring, or at least he enjoys manoeuvring more than Ferruja. Um, yeah, it just feels like a balanced position, but full of uh, richness, full of life here. And uh, OK, Ferruja now, he's forced Magnus to think, but Magnus, again, he's dropped a few minutes here on the clock. It's still early days. I'm not used to seeing this from Magnus. Normally, he's, I've actually played against him in a very similar type of position, and he's normally super confident, super quick. Division uh, one is still early days. This is only game one. We did start a few hours late in uh, division one today, but division two has already been finished. The grand final with Jan Pomniacci and Levon Aronian is over with uh, Jan Pomniacci winning that match, securing him a spot in the next uh, division one event. So we will see Jan Pomniacci probably uh, in the next event, which is cool. Yeah, what a field already. Yeah. Some big players in Nepomniachtchi. If he wins the next event, if he does well there, he's got a chance uh, at That's getting true. to Toronto. Yeah. He was in superb form playing in Division 2, actually. It was like he wasn't a man on a mission, you know, just dispatching everyone. And he wants to be in Division 1. And I suspect... As uh, David mentioned, yeah. he wants to show everyone what he's capable of. And to actually make it to Toronto as well. Incredible match there against uh, Levon Aronian, another amazing player. In this one, early days, Magnus Carlsen down on the clock. But now he uh, has Alireza Ruja thinking a little bit as well. He does. And uh, Magnus, he's gone for this night maneuver. So not a typical Spanish opening plan. It's definitely Magnus freestyling here, trying to be a bit creative. Uh, as Ivanka mentioned, not many games at all in this type of position. 
Uh, but he does have a specific idea in mind, and that's to land the white knight into c5. We might see that in a moment. First, the queen side is likely going to lock itself up. Uh, Magnus has just pushed a pawn there, and I don't think Alareza should get tempted to take that pawn. It would ruin the black pawn structure. Um, so it's going to get a bit more blocked here, Simon. Uh, who would you pick here and why? Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, black has a space advantage, so black's got more pawns advanced, and it's uh, generally a bit easier to to play a position when you have more space. So uh, black can try to move the queen up, move the rook over maybe, but uh, white seems to have more squares available for his pieces though. Well, there's that one big square C5 um, where the bishop and the knight are both pointing. And uh, maybe at the right moment, white has the opportunity to open up the C file. If he moves the rook over two squares, because he has the opportunity to capture a pawn uh, there and and open that file. So so there's there's actually a lot going on here. I mean nothing's been exchanged yet. There's a lot of tension. Those pawns in the middle, they're fighting against each other. The pawns on the queen side fighting against each other. And every single move, both players have to calculate the exchanges and the pushes and work out who they benefit. So it's a, it's a very very tense position uh, from Ooh, the opening so far. It's super rich, right? Very rich. Because, you know. uh, I mean, for Magnus, the thing that he's going to be running through his head is, you know, is Ali Reza going to actually lock down the center with this d4 push? And if he does that, is Magnus's pieces, are they ready for that closure? I, I mean, yeah. and also, as you've highlighted there, it's also possible to take the pawn. So many choices. So many choices. And the kind of natural continuation of Magnus's plan, uh, if he's been consistent, would be to try and land a piece into this square. This is the square you were talking about earlier, Simon. First time he would uh, kind of land in the black half of the board. And uh, knight to c5 here it looks nice. It looks pretty attacking this bishop. But I guess the bishop just moves. And now uh, the other idea Yovanka mentioned, d4, is actually a killer threat because it would break the coordination between white's knight and white's bishop. And uh, this knight is actually more vulnerable than it is strong, potentially. So Magnus's whole idea, it's been building up to this, but I think maybe now he's realizing that it's not that effective. And just the fact that black holds the space, black has extra space on the queen side and in the center with these pawns, means that, if anything, it's more difficult to play with white. The balance is still there. Objectively, we see the evaluation bar, um, it's level, but in terms of Finding something for white, it's not easy at all. No natural moves. Yeah, and Magnus down more than three minutes on the clock after only uh, 14 moves. Uh, a few moves ago, you were talking about the white knight, Magnus's knight, jumping in next to his other knight. Are you surprised to see it maneuver on the other side? Yeah, normally we see that white knight on g3 rather than b3. Uh, like you say, uh, I nearly said Tanya. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what have I done? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Kaya, you're right. The white knight is nearly always, I think, 90% of the time in this opening on g3. So Magnus doing some uh, different stuff. I would say strange, different stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's working. Um, I, I would say from the opening, if we just compare it to the other match that these two uh, two stars played in, uh, this this is a success for Faruja. You know, mm -hmm. he's got a very decent position, I think. Uh, I don't think he's he's really worse here at all. He's got equality. Uh, and it's also a kind of position I think he, he probably enjoys playing. All the pieces on the board, lots of tension, uh, and things. there's going to be some tactics, explosions uh, on the board at some point with some exchanges or pushes. So um, so I, I, I think it's, it's gone well for Black. And as you said, David, he's got a four-minute and increasing time advantage, which is surprising. Is this a sign that Magnus is for whatever reason, not, not so comfortable today. I don't know why he wouldn't be talk, comfortable. Talking about comfortable, uh, did you just read that comment from Featured Chat? I did I said no. that Magnus's passion was gaming chairs. Does <laughs> well, he have them chess stacked up chairs? Yeah. Well, I hear, he, I, hear he, I hear he collects them. So he's, he's actually brought a house in Norway just to stock his chairs. So he's got 400 chairs already there. And he loves the ones from ex-chess players. <laughs> So he buys them off uh, yeah. the studio. Most rich people have a huge garage with their Ferraris and, you know. He loves his chairs. Yeah, he loves Magnus them, just so. has the gaming chairs. Yeah. All around his bedroom, <laughs> everywhere, you know. Yeah, he, he loves he loves collecting chairs, apparently. That's, yeah. that's, that's the rumour. Just yeah. spreading that rumour. Yeah, just, <laughs> just putting it out there. So. Definitely not fake news, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many chairs is that? Three in the background? Or? Yeah. I can't count. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we have oh. mentioned you have been on one of those chairs, David. You I have, have had the honour of sitting on one of his collections. There, so, yeah. In Magnus's own words, one of the idiots in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's his yeah. lucky room. He seems to play really, really well here. And uh, meanwhile, knight to h2. 
retreating the knight. This is a typical type of maneuver when actually you're opening up the white queen to kind of uh, develop on the diagonal. The white queen might often sit on f3 later, and the square that white knight has vacated. But to me, it looks a bit strange to maneuver away from the center when there's so much tension. Um, it feels like Magnus, he's kind of mixed and matched two or three different plans here. And usually I'm preaching for consistency, so mm. I'm not sure. I was going to ask, is that a bad idea? Normally. Normally in chess, if you stick to a plan, there is this cliche, this saying, which kind of is debatable, but uh, they say a bad plan is better than no plan at all, uh, as long as you stick to it. But but two plans? Is there anything about two plans? Two plans are worse than one plan. <laughs> <laughs> one Kasparov, plan's than... <laughs> 1980, said that, I think. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Simon. That's right, no worries. <laughs> one plan is better than five? I don't know. <laughs> but either way, I mean, it just feels inconsistent. You've parked one night on one side of the board, and now the other one uh, further away. Totally don't agree. try it at home. I totally agree, David, because the, the other night on the left-hand side, I mean, you, you mentioned that going to F1 uh, next to the king, and this manoeuvre that White's played, it seems much better if you had the other knight uh, to join in mm -hmm. because, you, you know, they're, they're going to be much more powerful together, aren't they? So uh, so it does does seem a little bit strange, but it's still it's still an OK position for Magnus. It hasn't gone, hasn't gone wrong yet. But it's also quite interesting because I was also completely taken by surprise by that move. But uh, now that I kind of, it's on the board, I'm thinking that's quite clever again. Is passing the decision to Ferruja. Does he trade in the in the middle? Does he just connect the rooks, centralize? And that's again a very difficult decision to take. Should we jump in and mm -hmm. show what might happen here? What's going through Ferruja's mind? Uh, we've talked about a few options. I personally quite like uh, one you alluded to there. Yvanka just kind of just move the queen, connect the rooks. Why not just bring your other rook into the center, delay the tension, bring all the pieces to the party, and. Often tactics work in the favor of the side whose pieces are more centralized. Here, that would be black, uh, especially if you can get your rooks both in the center together. Uh, but yeah, releasing the tension also makes some sense here, especially while the white knight is away from the middle of the board. The only problem here is that, okay, you might trade a queens, and we know about Magnus Carlsen's skills in the end game. Uh, so I think stylistically, this one would be uh, not kind of at the top of my list. And the other one which is tempting is to gain space in the center, but here it's just a trade of pawns. And once the white bishop moves, you do have some safe squares. It's no clear path forward. And actually the white knight might start to relocate towards some nice outposts later on. And oh. wow, he goes for something similar. Right, yeah, he initiates a pawn trade and there you go. He believes that this particular position is great for black. He does control the b4 square as you've highlighted, but on the other hand, White's plan is very simple now. It's just going to be about moving all the forces to the right side of the board. Yeah, if you talk about pawn structure here, white pawns uh, in the center, they kind of point towards the right. And often uh, it might sound simplistic, but if your pawns point in one direction, that's the side you should be attacking. And uh, Magnus does have this pawn storm idea of throwing Freddy the F-pawn forward and then uh, just kind of advancing in the middle of the board, whereas black has to play with pieces rather than pawns. And here we see Ferruja relocate his knight. He's going around towards the queen side, and it might well become a battle of flanks. Magnus is going to fight on the king side. Uh, Ferruja is going to switch to the other side of the board where he has some really nice juicy posts for his knights. Really fascinating, really imbalanced decision. This is why these two players, it's always fire on the board. They just never play for the draw. Always the most ambitious move. And do you think this is a game, looking at it, that will end up with a winner? I think a draw is the least likely right wow. now, but still early days, of course. Yeah, we're only 18 moves into this uh, game one. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces uh, thinking again now. What do you think about Magnus so far today, Ivanka? Does he seem maybe a little bit off? Um, that's, that's a little bit harsh. Yeah. I wouldn't say that, but I, I, he's certainly slower than he's normally yeah. been playing. Normally he's like got a time advantage. He's very confident here. You know, he, Magnus is six, on, six and a half minutes, whereas Ali Reza has nine and a half minutes. But, okay, Magnus speeding up and uh, relocating the knight. He's not too proud to say that he made a mistake. Uh -huh. Yeah, often the top players, they just play move by move. Uh, they look at the specific position, even if their knight, even if their pieces landed on bad squares previously, they're happy to say, OK, it might have lost, uh, kind of cost me two moves here, but I'll bring the knight back to the centre. And uh, meanwhile, Ferruja, a bit of a mysterious knight retreat here. We joked in previous days, knight on f8, there is no mate. Knight on f8, what were the other rhymes? Gets no we... hate. Gets no hate. <laughs> but what's the knight on f8 doing here? Protecting the black king, but... Uh, maybe on F8, making a gate. 
<laughs> no, I don't not know. Not too late. Not too late. Not too yeah. late. Maybe he wants to jump in to the F4 square. That's the only thing that I can think of. Oh, using it as a gate. Yeah. Yeah. Towards. Mm. To improve his fate. Yeah. And their fate. I don't know any We need help. <laughs> we need help, Jack. Uh, <laughs> either way, it's a manoeuvring phase. And I just want to mention as well, here as commentators, we can only really talk about momentum in such manoeuvring positions. And it's total opposite of the other day, where often Magnus was far, far ahead on the clock. Mm -hmm. Faruja actually missed a winning opportunity and went, kind of got outplayed because he was down to a minute or two far, far before Magnus. But here it's kind of rolls reversed. It uh, feels like definitely totally different match these early days uh, compared to uh, that previous winner's final. It's a bit mysterious, this game, actually. Um, it's changed quite a lot. I mean, uh, I, I was thinking the change in the centre personally. I, I, I quite like it for White. But what White's pieces are quite clumsy here, it, it seems to me. I mean, you'd want to put the light square bishop where the, the knight is on the left-hand side. I mean, it's kind of cramped right now. Yeah, it's a bit mm. cramped. So if you look at White's bishops in general, they're 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 kind of like you know it's like a traffic jam, mm -hmm. uh, traffic jam of cars there all getting in the way of each other, and uh, um, to manoeuvre them to better squares is going to take some time. Um, I do Isn't feel it very un Magnus like to put his pieces on bad squares, basically. It, it is. He's got a nice. Well, he's now manoeuvring it, so the bishop is coming around to get to that diagonal, and he is opening up the rook. And I think he will get uh, quite a nice position for his pieces. I mean, structurally, pawn structure, because yours evaluate a position in two ways, the pawns and the pieces. I quite like White's pawn structure. Um, it seems it's very solid in the centre. Um, I was a bit surprised by Magnus's move with the knight on the right-hand side, because I thought he could have used the pawn uh, in, instead there. But it's, uh, it's really in the balance at the moment, this position. It's just very, very tense. And we see the idea behind uh, Ali Razor's knight uh, gate, um, F8, can't be mate, <laughs> create, um, <laughs> late, bring it, <laughs> hate, bring, bring the gate. I don't know, I think I've already said that. Okay, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> it's the last day. Date. Date. Date, date, create. Mate to a date. Yeah, that's it. Well, we're, going, we're going through the whole English <laughs> or of anything that. Eight must be the, le the number with uh, the most rhymes. It, it must be, yeah, yeah, it looks that way. <laughs> Even though I'm struggling. We can't find a good one, uh, but there's a lot of words. No, just, <laughs> just random words coming out of the mouth, as usual, there, uh, uh, for me. And uh, But I mean, this this it also looks all right for black, right? I mean, that knight is a nice centralized knight. It's uh, got potential. I don't see it going anywhere at the moment, but. Um, I don't know which, which. Who would you rather be here? Would you rather I'd be white rather or black? Be black? You'd rather be black. It's interesting because. What about you, David? Would you? Oh, if I had to choose, I would probably say white, but I wouldn't mind black's position either. It looks like he's got a very healthy position. Uh, but I'm very much about the long term, and I'm on your side, Simon. Just white's pawn structure, long term's better. But dynam dynamically, in this moment, it feels like black's very active. Oof. I mean, that's why it's so hard. This game could really go either way in the next few moves. You know, I would kind of argue that the pawn structure is the same. Yeah, you know, I understand that the pawn on a C7, that one's backward. It's also on an open line. It's a target. But on the other hand, the white pawn on D3, that's also pretty weak as well. And black has a beautiful square on B4 just to balance out everything. And, uh, okay, well, we did see the bishop zoom in and attack the rook. Rook is now lifted and, oh, I, I was hoping, well, are we going to see? Queen has entered the action. She has, and she's also defended the knight on c6. So maybe Ali Reza is setting up the move, a bishop to a6, attacking the rook. Big threat on the board, Yvanka. Mm -hmm. oh. This rook almost trapped. It uh, looks really active, white's most advanced piece, but actually it's running out of squares. If white, for example, loses a move, let's just, uh, for its kind of argument's sake, put the white king in the corner, then suddenly this rook is hit, and the only kind of retreat square is to go back. Suddenly you've lost connection with this pawn. That might be fateful later, but uh, also you've kind of locked in your own bishop on b1. The black knight's going to jump into this b4 square. Suddenly the black pieces are pouring forward. Look how active these ones are, just really invading. It's a uh, problem, isn't it? The white's pieces, uh, they, they are just discombobulated, and... Um, they, they're just getting in the way of each other, as we said, and you know that is a big threat. That bishop a6, and um, this this seems to put white under some pressure now. I mean, uh, they're all on the wrong squares. All those white pieces on the queen side, and uh, he's got to find a way to try and uh, free them somehow. But not so easy to do. Not so easy at all. These black knights are basically like the gatekeepers. They hold together this pawn, and therefore black has more space, more space to manoeuvre. His pieces are more flexible. And a big, big question for Magnus, down to th under three and a half minutes. 
this is definitely turning in Black's favour. He needs to stem the momentum, stem the initiative now. Uh, but he needs a clever move. I'm not seeing it, I've got to admit. Uh, evaluation bus still says level, but that could change dramatically in the next turn or two mm -hmm. uh, if Magnus isn't accurate here. So what is going through Ali Reza's head right now? He knows he needs to, uh, to win at some point today. Do you think he's looking at this and thinking this is a big chance and he has to take his chances today? I think he'll be slightly excited. Mm -hmm. uh, he won't be carried away because everyone knows it's Magnus Carlsen. Things can turn very quickly against you. Uh, but I think he'll be looking at the clock, one eye on the clock. He's thinking this isn't the typical Magnus. This is not the Magnus we've seen throughout this tournament. And mm. yeah, he also easy moves for black, easy plan, big threat. It's yeah. uh, definitely pressure on white. It's also super important when you're thinking about chess not to let emotion come mm. into your assessment. Which must be so difficult. It is very <laughs> difficult. because This is, this yeah. is often a way that I blunder because I'm like, oh, I'm winning against the Grand Master. <laughs> and then I, what do you know, I've blundered. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, so what, what Ali Reza will be thinking about is maybe I'm slightly better. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. I yeah. mean, it sounds really dull and boring, but it is the correct way to think. You know, you've got to be Bruce... Uh, I was going to say Bruce Willis, but that was not the person I was thinking of. Bruce Lee about it. You know, uh -huh. Your mind is like water. <laughs> yeah, cliche, so you have to cliche, stop there. Cliche, cliche, yeah. I yeah, like yeah. my position. Ooh, and it's against Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, yeah, you, you, know, you, you have can't to stop be before you go there. Exactly. And uh, I actually remember Magnus uh, during the commentary of the 2022 candidate saying that Ali Reza Farouja suffered from nerves. Aha. Uh -huh. And he, his quote was like, that dude is always nervous. <laughs> <laughs> that dude, I like it, love it. You know, so. But he, he, he's young, isn't he? I mean, yeah. uh, he, he's going to be more emotional just, just naturally. And, yeah, uh, totally. And you can see in his chest, he gets quite excited. So maybe uh -huh. you can you can play against that as you say you yeah. know just try to you know in this position as black you would be getting a bit excited wouldn't you I think because you're, you're seeing that uh, you know you're, you're starting well look at Magnus's time as well I've just seen yeah. it tick down he has just played Bishop A2 I was wondering about this if he can give up the exchange somehow which he's probably going to have to so this is a very interesting move uh, but that bishop it looks terrible at the moment but that could be a really good piece that's your star piece Bobby Fisher in the Raw Lopez, as David said in, um, in another day, used this bishop so well. And he, he was uh, one of the star world champions in, in this kind of structure. And maybe this idea is to give up the exchange, David, here, if bishop a6, take the knight or something similar. I'm not exactly sure what, but there's a couple of options here. Yeah, like you say, Simon, this piece looks terrible, but it's about to become the best piece on the board. And I think you're right. You just start sacrificing things just to open up this diagonal. Look where all the targets are. The Black King especially feels uncomfortable. And uh, Bobby Fischer's favourite Spanish bishop, the light square bishop, uh, I think will come to life. For example, you could start by hitting the Black Queen just to gain a bit of time, force her away. And now go for your move, sacrificing. And uh, yes, you've given up some material. Rook for knight, that's a couple of points. But suddenly the white knight will spring into action. Look how things are clearing off this diagonal. And... After a set of trades, look at the bar, start to zoom up in white's favour. You're hitting the black queen. And where does she go? No safe squares. Uh, if she drops back, then she could uh, potentially walk in some severe trouble. The pawn steps forward and suddenly that bishop, which was blocked just three moves ago, uh, is going to play a key role in winning this game. Suddenly the black king is basically uh, powerless to prevent this attack. So, wow, it's actually on the board. We're headed in this direction. Magnus has just played the move e5 and I think he's actually tricked Ferruja. We said he had to be clever. He invested a lot of time there, Magnus, but now he's got to go for the sacrifice. If you don't, then you're simply dropping this rook or the pawn behind it. But the sacrifice looks powerful, looks strong. I mean, do you think Adi Razor maybe uh, got a little, you were talking about getting a bit too excitable there. And maybe at that moment, he was like, wow, I'm going to win the exchange. And he played bishop a6 very quickly because this line, pretty forcing really, because Magnus couldn't move the rook because he loses that pawn, Yvanka pointed out. So. Um, this is getting very exciting now. Yeah. Magnus sacrificed in exchange. We have a sacrifice. Magnus is ticking down to one minute on the clock. I was told before this move, both players were above 97% in accuracy. So they are playing some of their best chess already. Yeah. I mean, we're used to it at this point, these, uh, these players. There was one game, what was it, yesterday, the day yeah. before? 99.7% <laughs> accuracy from oh. both players. Yeah. And uh, yeah, these guys, they're good. They're pretty good. And now we're expecting Magnus to take in the centre. And he needs to do it quickly. Oh, he takes the other way. Wow, that's so surprising. Yeah, that's odd. I mean, yes, you're grabbing a pawn, you're winning some material back, but we all know the rhyme about knights on the rim. Yeah. Being a bit dim and grim. Oh, <laughs> dim and grim, <laughs> all the fall off the edge. And... But 
why why take that pawn rather than a nice central pawn? Maybe, because uh, maybe he wanted it all, right? Maybe he just thought the knight can drop back and but, grab yeah, the, the centre is, pawn as well. But Black's knight is so good in the centre; it yeah. blocks the bishop. Why not get rid of uh, that lovely Black knight in the centre? I, I don't understand that that decision, but still probably okay. Still good compensation. Yeah, but uh, we see the evaluation bar. It still might be quite promising for White if Ferruja allows Magnus a couple of moves, maybe to get that White Knight back off the edge of the board, back towards the centre. Uh, but is there something he can do immediately to gain an advantage to show that his extra material counts? I mean, to me, if I were playing with either colour, I would just say, OK, it's a mess. It's like you were saying earlier, Yvanka, with in your head, you just say, I'm slightly better. Here, both players are just saying it's a mess. Uh, they don't know the evaluation. And oof, what to do next? It's no easy moves for black, at least. Maybe that's what Magnus is banking on. Magnus under one minute. I think it's mm -hmm. worth just, you know, that that's not a lot of time in a position like this where it's immensely complicated. The queens are on the board. Most of the pieces are on the board. You sack some material. Uh, you, you know, it's going to be a very exciting finish to this game. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And like you both said, it's really chaotic on the board. And I was wondering, what is the best strategy here? And we see Ali Reza go for the improvement strategy. The piece that wasn't working is now on an open line and perhaps the rook will come to b2 and attack the queen and the bishop. Well, it will certainly do that if it's allowed. Big threat. As you point out, Yvanka, rook to b2, protected by this bishop on a3, and that would be a fork, a double attack. White would lose a piece. Uh, not actually that easy to defend. Magnus chooses to trade queens. We know he loves an endgame, but he is material down here. He's down the exchange just for one pawn. Uh, so will we see a queen trade? What do we think? I mean, the, the natural move would be to exchange queens then to continue with that plan. Yvanka pointed out throwing the rook into Magnus's guts there. But wouldn't it make sense for Ferruja to keep the queens on? He's got so much more time. Maybe, yeah. yeah. It's tempting. And it's Ferruja's style to keep the queens on. Yeah. Um, I'm on Simon's side. I mean, in general, I love my end games as well, so I just wanted the queens off the board. Uh, material up kind of helps here, but there is some argument for keeping the queen on. Uh, you could retreat her, possibly. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of team keep the queens on the board. Ooh. I know the queens have come off. The rook is now under attack. So will he remove the rook to b2, attack the bishop? Yeah, that is option one. It's going to be either hit the knight here or hit the bishop. And uh, let's give Ferruja some time to think. But if he can consolidate, OK, he attacks the knight first. If he can somehow trade off another set of minor pieces, he's going to get closer and closer to winning here as black. So if he can ever pick up that white A pawn, uh, then I think Magnus's chances will disappear. And wow, look at what the computer says. Ooh. White only has one move, otherwise the advantage grows massively for black. And of course, Magnus finds it. <laughs> Bishop takes knight. Uh, this was the only way to minimize the damage. Uh, but you have parted with your beautiful light squared bishop. We said that might become the uh, most valuable piece, the MVP, uh, just a few moves ago. And now it's what we call superfluous knights, the white knights kind of holding on to each other. But it's hanging by a thread here for Magnus. And less than 30 seconds on his clock. Remember, only three seconds increment. It is starting to look good for Ali Reza Ferruza. Yeah, I think I would pick black here. Currently, we should mention it's knight and two pawns for a rook. So it's level material uh, in terms of points. But black's got the bishop pair. Black can grab a pawn on d3. I'm not sure you want to do it now. There might be some tactics. But uh, yeah, this one with 27 seconds left. Ferruza must be a huge favorite. Is yeah. he looking at Magnus's clock right now? He'll be aware. But again, it's you don't want to get too emotional if you start playing on the clock. Magnus is good enough to find the best moves even with 20 seconds on his uh, on the timer there. So, yeah, you don't want to get too carried away. Yeah, I think there's a little rule that um, if you have a good position anyway, there's no reason to try and move quicker to hustle your opponent. But uh, if you're like equal or probably if you're a lot worse, then these ideas of playing quicker, trying to put more pressure on your opponent are much more important because you might just be able to win the game by playing the best moves here. And uh, I think that's what he's trying to work out. I mean, he's got the two bishops, he's got the two rooks, and Magnus has only got one rook. And uh, it's a very dangerous situation for Magnus here. This would be a major win as well. If you win with black in the first game, this is what he needed, Ali Razor. He needed this win, um, especially after that last match, to bring his confidence up and be big favourite to take the first the first leg at least. Yeah. So. The position is still pretty messy though, so I'm pretty sure that uh, Ferruja is looking at ways to simplify and there you go. He retreats the bishop in order to attack one of the knights. And the reason I say that the position is messy is because white also has a past A pawn that could also limit the, 
the material. And uh, well, we see a trade and there he comes. Ah. The A pawn starts pushing. It's the only thing white can do. Maybe he missed this move. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's a, quite an obvious move, but I mean, uh, yeah, this this A pawn's quite strong, isn't it now? Um, it's going to tie down one of the black rooks, this uh, this A pawn. You'll have to keep half an eye on that one forever. And look at the white rook lined up as well against one of the black pawns. The white knight suddenly looks beautiful. I'm really surprised, I've got to say, it looks like black's bishop pair was kind of one of his biggest assets just a few moves ago. And he's traded off a bishop for one of those white knights that was hanging out uh, in midair in the centre. Didn't feel necessary. It feels like Farouche has kind of taken a safety first approach, but look at the clock now, yeah. it's balancing out. And you all know about Magnus Carlsen's endgame skills, level endgames, even with material imbalances uh, can go either way. And Magnus makes a bit of a grimace yeah. there, a bit of a face. What is that about? I, I'm, I mean, I love knight b3 here, very, you know, as, as an option, but I, I don't know why he's grimacing. I mean, uh, this is probably the best he position he's tends... had for quite some time. Oh, and, and he plays this move. I thought he was going to grab the pawn. <laughs> there was material there for the taking, but instead he chooses to restrain the light squared bishop. Yeah, wow. he's uh, actually taken away all of Black's best squares for that bishop. Uh, Black's bishop wanted to kind of zigzag back into the centre onto the d5 square to protect uh, the isolated e6 pawn. But, OK, both sides going active, not materialistic at all. Until this move, Magnus does snap off another pawn. It's level material yet again. But uh, whose piece configuration here is going to be better? I think I would start taking white now. It just feels Ooh. like you're out of danger completely. And uh, Black's rooks are disconnected. That white a pawn is so strong right now. Yeah, and this this is a move I, I I thought could be very troublesome for Black. That knight coming forwards to C5, where it's actually seconds. It's got to move. No time at all. Wow. With only one second left, Alareza Frugia is now in trouble. Yeah, and uh, the knight comes in, attacks the rook, and Magnus is going to pick up the E6 pawn. Yep, that has gone. So now he's material up. He's got three pawns and a knight just for Black's rook, but Black's rook is very active, and it's going to keep harassing the white bishop. There we go. The problem is the white bishop, its diagonal is quite short. It needs to keep protecting that white A-pawn if you want to win this game, but you're running out of squares. Maybe Farouge has found a way to kind of uh, draw this. And OK, as I say that, Magnus doesn't care about his bishop. He counterattacks against the black bishop instead. Is he going for the win? He's going for the win, Magnus. It's only Magnus here mm. who can really win. Even if the white A-pawn drops off, it should still be uh, drawing for white there. But OK, he's got two past pawns and a knight. Can he start running with them or can the black rook hold them off? It's hanging by a thread here for Ferrugia, but he might be in time. Oh, he wins the white A-pawn. Interesting ending here, though. So you've got equal material, uh, the rook much better than a knight, but those two pawns, a little bit dangerous. I mean, uh, I, I don't think they're going to be enough because you've only got one pass pawn here uh, and that shouldn't be enough against the rook. You could even lose this if you push too much as white, but pretty much all the danger is uh, is with black here. And uh, I'm not really sure where this game turned as well. I mean, Farouja, I think David pointed out, um, and here we see maybe a pawn dropping. He gave up his bishop pair, and that 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 was probably the mistake made. And what can Magnus do here? Can he uh, throw his pawn forwards, do anything like that? I, I, I was I thinking you might as well, right? Yeah, and uh, there he it. comes, two past pawns headed towards the black king. Ooh. Oh, Magnus captured that with the knight. I think he's just trying to head it towards a, a draw now, I, I, I think. I think he's kind of realised that it's, it's not going anywhere else and there's not enough material here or, or really any danger for either side to, to lose this one. The black rook moves away as far as it can from the knight to avoid any forks and white only has one pass pawn, uh, but the black rook is very strong here, uh, tying down white, so should be should be a, a, a relatively safe draw here. We should mention, if all the pawns disappear, just a rook versus knight. It is a draw, and OK, Farouche gives up his winning chances. It's going to fizzle out to king versus king. Everything off the board, a fight to the bitter end. It's a draw. There it is. Uh, game one, a draw, still tied. Uh, Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Farouja after the first game in the grand final. Ali Reza Farouja looking over this. Was this a missed chance for him, David? Big missed opportunity for Alariza Farouja. He had a lot more time on the clock. He had a big advantage, a material advantage as well on the board. But 
in the end, uh, Magnus too good in the end game and closed it out to safety. And I just want to highlight one moment where maybe Alareza missed an opportunity. It was here with White's Knights not actually being as impressive as they look. I think he could have, for example, dislodged one of the White Knights with uh, dropping his bishop back. He could, for example, have just defended his weak pawn in the centre. Uh, but what he did, giving up his beautiful dark square bishop for one of the knights, and suddenly there was no risk anymore for White. This pawn, this White A pawn, was the clincher. It managed to secure, uh, managed to ensure that one of the Black Rooks was passive and a draw a fair result in the end. Magnus uh, giving a little bit of a face after the game ended with a uh, draw. Is that shaking of the head for Magnus Carlsen? Yeah, <laughs> classical Magnus, but it is a draw this first game. Magnus here with the white pieces. Ali Reza Vruja will have the white pieces in game two. He has to win this match to take it to a second match and uh, win the Julius Baird Generation Cup. The final continues in uh, a few minutes, but first a little break. It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. Well, it is all about an exciting grand final today between 20-year-old Alireza Vruja and 32-year-old Magnus Carlsen. But we're also going to be talking a little bit about racing today. And earlier this week in the studio, we were joined by a very special guest. He is a Formula E former world champion, a United Nations ambassador for clean air and a Julius Baer ambassador. We are so happy to be joined by Lucas Di Grassi. Lucas, welcome. How are you doing today? Hi, Tanya. Uh, very well. Thanks for having me. We're so excited uh, to have you here with us. Uh, and I'm going to jump straight into it. Lucas, what inspired you to become uh, uh, an e-racer? Uh, well, I did my career as a as a normal racing driver. I went all the way from karting to Formula One, um, passing through Formula Three, Formula Two. Uh, then I did a few races uh, in endurance, which means long uh, long races, twelve hours, twenty four hours. And then I helped to create Formula E because the future of the technology that we'll see on the roads uh, are electric. Actually, the present. In, uh, in Norway is already electric. So then we decided to create the Formula One of electric cars, which was Formula E uh, 10 years ago. And I've been involved in Formula E ever since and been racing there and the championship is growing. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy where I am after a nine seasons racing Formula E. That's so cool. And with all of this, how did chess find a way into your life? So uh, chess has been actually a very recent part of my life. So. Um, we have been using the analogy that the Formula E race um, is a bit like chess at 200 kilometers per hour because you have to make a lot of strategic decisions while driving the car in the limit. Um, and these strategic decisions are a lot like chess. Like you can, for many laps during the race, try to put pressure on your opponent and try to understand where are the flaws and where he's doing mistakes. And then in the right moment, you attack and overtake. So you need to be extremely uh, good in strategy during the race to be able to succeed in Formula E. And that's all due because you have a, a energy management during the race. So the battery is going down. If you attack too much, the battery uses too much energy. If you don't attack, uh, you get attacked by others. So it's all this balance between uh, being aggressive, but at the same time, um, positioning yourself in the right moment to make the attack in the last few laps and win the race. And Lucas, we also know that you're part of uh, the Mensa community. Uh, and I'm guessing that you do enjoy a bit of a challenge off the track as well, because we've got something fun planned for you. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I enjoy I enjoy a challenge, and yeah, I'm very competitive, so I'm not very good at chess. So I get very angry when I when I lose. So uh, of course, uh, I, I still have a lot to learn and uh, trying to understand how this game goes. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm a very competitive. I'm up for a challenge all the time. Yes. That's all you need for today to be competitive because, Lucas, you will be playing against our very own David Howell. And the challenge is how long, how many moves and how long can you last against uh, David? Uh, David's here. David, are you ready? Yeah. Hi, Lucas. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was a challenge. Uh, nobody told me. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have prepared myself better. But, you know, you're all about taking those split-second decisions on the track. Uh, so it's high pressure, Lucas. Are you ready for this one? Um, yeah, I'm ready, yes. Let's do it. Let's do this. <laughs> there is a twist, however, in honor of the fact that you are one of uh, the world's best drivers. We're going to make it fast and furious. I'm only going to have 30 seconds on the clock, and you're going to have two minutes. So hopefully that uh, balances the odds slightly. OK, uh, let's do it. Let's do it. OK. We'll get the game going now. Good luck. I've started really slowly here. I've lost a lot of time. Symmetrical chess, playing copycat here. OK, I've got to go for checkmate. I've only got 20 seconds. I need to start pre-moving. Hopefully, I'm distracting Lucas here by talking. That's my plan. OK, I've won a night, but still a long way to go. Whoa, first check of the game. Surprised me there. Hitting my night. Oh my god, I've only got 16 seconds. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to have to attack. And OK, I've won the queen. Here we go. OK, still a long, long way from checkmate, though. This is not going to be easy at all. Oh, I'll take that one. Check. Oh, 14 seconds. Race against the clock. Look at that focus. I'm trying to distract him, but it's not working. OK, I'm taking that one. Ooh, maybe a mouse slip there, I'm hoping. I must slip too, but <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm just going to get everything off the board because I'm panicking. <laughs> Nine seconds. Oh, wait. Oh, no. My... Mr. Mate. <laughs> Mr. Checkmate. <laughs> this is going to go on much longer than I was hoping. Okay, seven seconds. I've got an extra rook and two bishops, but Lucas is defending really, really well. Okay, that's a check. That's a check. And I think I've got him. I've caught his king in the corner. Five seconds left, though. Oh. Oh, uh, where can I go here? <laughs> oh, sorry, Lucas. I think next move, it's inevitable. Oh, five seconds left. Checkmate is coming. Oh, where, where can I move here? It's not stalemate, luckily. You do have two pawns you can push. Ah. Uh. There we go. That is checkmate. Okay, good job. Oh. <laughs> no, good job to you too. I mean, you got me down to my last five seconds, and the game did last 28 moves. That's longer than some grandmasters have lasted. <laughs> so well done. What did you think of the game? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's unbelievable how you guys can play uh, so good. It's um, it's. Uh, like what I what I what I love about chess, you have all the information there, right? So it's just a matter of uh, of um, of uh, understanding how the, the 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 probabilities and making so fast decisions like this is for me inconceivable. Like you had like twenty seconds, I would not even think about which uh, which uh, which pieces to move. So it's kind of this type of uh, let's say mental ability that you guys train your whole life that we also do while we race and it's um it's uh i can imagine that that this mental ability can relate a lot to what we do on the racetrack so congratulations it's really impressive yeah lucas i just want to say thank you so much for the game and thank you for joining us today thank you very much and uh i hope i can uh, can learn a little bit more and improve so that was recorded a few days ago. And good job on Lucas, uh, lasting 28 moves. Remember, one of the smartest men in the world, Bill Gates, only lasted nine moves against Magnus Carlsen in the same time control. And, well, Lucas did try David's sport here. So, in the next break, we're going to show you what happened when David and Simon tried Lucas's sport doing a go-kart. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm getting stuck. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming for you. Liz. <laughs> 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 They look fast, they look fierce, and after the next game, we will show you who won in a go-kart race between uh, David and Simon. But now it's game two, Magnus Carlsen snacking up to get his energy up. The first game was a draw, and in this one, Ali Reza Ruja will have the white pieces. So Yvanka, what do you expect from the 20-year-old who has to win at some point today? Well, here we go. Yeah, and I'm expecting it is gonna be a full-blooded challenge and there we see the Sicilian on the board and Magnus he's really taking up the gauntlet he's saying you know you know Ali Reza you like to play sharp openings show me what you got mm. this is provocative from Magnus uh, yesterday we saw something similar but uh, also provo uh, provocative there but uh, something with a maybe safer reputation here it's like waving a red flag to the ball he's basically said okay white you take the center, you take all the squares, and I'm going to try and counterattack later. This is known as one of the most risky uh, variations of the Sicilian. Really? Football. Exciting. Yeah, exciting. It shows Magnus actually wants to win this. Uh, no solidity at all. But uh, Ferruja, I think this should be a good sign for him and his fans. Uh, at least now he's guaranteed a big fight. He's guaranteed at least some attacking chances. The Black King often a big target in these types of openings. Simon, are you as surprised as me? Uh, yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I, I, Magnus has been playing really sharp, hasn't he? I mean, in, in the previous match against uh, Ferruja when he had black, uh, he played a line which was probably losing uh, for him in a sharp Sicilian. So it, it's great to see this. I, um, I think uh, Ali Reza will be very happy to get this on the board as well because there's big pawn in the centre of the board. You can base an attack around. White's knight in the centre of the board. It has some juicy squares. Uh, it might be able to jump into. And this is just a very exciting uh, opening position. Uh, one of the problems that Black has here is where do you put the king? Because uh, if you leave it in the middle, well, okay, it's never safe there. If you castle king side, uh, you can also come under a big attack. So that's uh, that's what uh, the problem that Magnus has to solve here. Where does he put his king? Adi Razor can just castle. It's easy for him to put his king somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is game two in the grand final in Division 1. Earlier tonight, Division 2 was decided. Jan Pomniacci winning the match against Levon Aronian to win Division 2. And we have some updates on Division 3 as well. Sam Sevian playing Shahriar Mamdyarov. And uh, Sevian, coming from the loser's bracket, has been able to win the first match to force a grand final reset in Division 3. We will follow that. As well, this is game two, though, in uh, Division One Grand Final with the bar inching up for Ali Reza Farusa. Slightly. Slightly. It is uh, inching up. This is still a relatively well-known position. Uh, again, it's kind of provocation is the name of the game here. Magnus now, at least, he has forced the white pawn forward to e5, the far advanced pawn Simon was mentioning. Uh, it's normally a very kind of uh, strong pawn. It is a strength. But it is a target as well. And uh, Magnus with this last queen move, he's saying, I don't need to castle. I don't need to develop. I'm just going to hit your pawn on e5. And meanwhile, more snacks have appeared. Yeah, is that a carrot? <laughs> yeah, he loves his carrots, Magnus. Yeah. He, he mentioned the other day that he, he, he stopped eating or he stops eating at like four o'clock or something like that because he didn't have... So that's why he's got the carrots. And as soon as he had the carrot in the previous match, he, uh, um, he did really well. He won the game, so... His magic ingredient is the carrot. And uh, Ali Reza jumping in with the knight to give a check. And uh, after it was promptly traded off, then uh, we see Magnus step up the queen to the c6 square, forming a battery to threaten potential checkmates. So that's why Ali Reza played the blocking move f2, f3. Mm -hmm. But this game is sharp. And again, looking at the stats here, I can see that 58% um, of the games have finished in a draw, but 25% have finished in a win for white. Oh, how about for black? Uh, uh, 17%. Thank you. Ooh. I was going to say, save me from doing my maths there. <laughs> 17%. Okay, so white's slightly ahead in this position. And I think we have to jump in because the position has just changed a lot. Let's show an action replay of the just the last few moves uh, we saw here. Black attacking, trying to snack on this pawn, just like Magnus is snacking on carrots right now. Uh, this was met with a check. And don't take this pawn. It is poisoned on d6. This is actually a recurring theme into the current position. Uh, this would walk into a self-pin. Uh, suddenly the Black Knight is lost because it cannot move. Mm -hmm. uh, the Queen is undefended behind it. Uh, so Magnus, of course, sidestepped that. There's a big, big battery along this diagonal. Potential checkmating threats, uh, as Yvanka mentioned, F3, therefore blocking the queen's diagonal. Magnus pushes forward. The knight is then hit. And 
knight to f4. I must admit, I'm out of theory here. I'm not sure exactly uh, how black proceeds next. To me, it looks really beautiful for white here. This is a weak pawn. Uh, if white just steps forward, for example, uh, hitting this pawn, Yvanka, are there still games in this database? There are still games. And um, basically, black says, you know what? I'm not bothered by materials things. I'm just going to get the king as quickly as possible to safety, castle king side. And after that, white has a choice. You can take the pawn, you can centralize the rooks. You can even improve the light square bishop. Okay, even in this position, mm -hmm. improving the light square bishop, let's just show that tactic. You want to kind of maybe zigzag over to harass the black queen. And don't take this pawn if you're Magnus Carlsen. Again, it's poisoned. Uh, so many tactics here. The bishop jumps out the way with a check, gaining time. And when the king reacts, queen takes queen. Actually, Magnus walking a tightrope here, but he clearly he knows what he's doing. This is a uh, total reverse of the previous game, mm. uh, because look at the clock times. He's got 15 and a half minutes, much more time than he started with. And uh, it is Ferruccio who's been surprised. This is where the opening battle, we talk about it in chess, picking your openings. Uh, you have to be so uh, kind of diverse with your opening choices these days. You have to be really clever. Uh, maybe he'd pinpointed that Ferruccio doesn't have any experience in this position or hasn't had any games in this line. And uh, Magnus... I'm still not unsure about the objective evaluation. Still looks good for white visually, but uh, if he solves his opening problems here, holds the draw without any trouble, then big success for him. Yeah, still snacking on that uh, carrot, Magnus Carlsen. And uh, do you think it has to do with keeping his energy up, uh, feeling that the carrots make him lucky? Or do you think it's uh, for the same reason I used to eat carrots a lot, because it would give me a nice tan? Maybe he's going on vacation somewhere or something like that. <laughs> Is that right? It gives yeah. A yeah, it does. Make it, makes you go orange, doesn't it? So you're, yeah. you're if you eat too many, if you keep oh. the perfect yeah. amount of carrots, it's going to give you that nice golden tan. So, so what is yeah. the perfect amount? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I would say three a day. Is that a guess? Keeps the doctor that away. is a guess, but that's <laughs> it's something like that. So I if would. you had five a day, you'd, you'd go orange. Let's yeah. let's test it. On, on me? I'm already orange <laughs> enough, thank you. <laughs> so I don't need to go any more orange. <laughs> um, I think it's the same with turmeric, isn't it, as well? Another thing. So, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it is just uh, obviously to give him a bit of energy uh, yeah. in complicated position. But um, everything David was saying there, this uh, you know, it is theory. Magnus has prepared this position, but. To someone who doesn't know this position, it, it, it looks horrible. Uh, it, I, I think absolutely horrible for black because uh, it's equal material. The white pawn right cutting the board in two, right in, in black's guts there in the middle of the board. That, that can't be easily taken. Black's pawn looks very weak on f4. Um, white's white's going to put a rook on the open file. And um, I'm very interested to see what Magnus's idea is after this bishop d3 because... Uh, you, you really want to know what you're doing in a position like this because it can go horribly wrong otherwise. So what is the idea? What what what, what should Black do here? I mean, uh, it's it doesn't look nice to me. It, yeah, let's consult the oracle, Yvanka. Yeah, no, I was going to say that um, this move has actually never been played before. So I, I'm just uh, res relying on my own wits. And uh, I was. it does force Queen takes pawn as Magnus has played but this does allow the white ki sorry the black king to get caught in the middle of the board i was going to ask about that black king are you 100 percent sure he's got a castle uh, uh Not to the, yeah. yeah i mean could he castle the other way is he just not gonna move it now it's check and he has to commit. Uh, unfortunately we can't castle when we're in check so he has to decide which way to go but not attractive at all I would walk towards the side with more pawn shelter, probably. But there we see <laughs> the natural move uh, running behind these pawns. And suddenly the evaluation bar reacts. It's a massive advantage now for white. I think just queen e2 is one move, right? I mean, and this is just a kind of a position that Ali Reza really enjoys playing. I mean, the evaluation bar showing this is a stronger move than queen e2. But uh, it's maybe you can even swap queens. That's mm. not completely stupid. Oh, bishop oh, f5 or something. Or oh, bishop b4, yeah. One of these moves. But it, it's... You don't want to be defending uh, a really uncomfortable position against, you know, where you have no activity against someone as uh, as active as Ali Reza, who plays these positions great. And as David's showing here, the, the exchange of queens is actually a very clever idea. So maybe you have to go to d8 then. But how many people would put their king, keep it in the middle mm -hmm. of the border? I guess the c7 square is where you can... You know, well, he does it. it. He does. He, found, he finds the right move straight away. No surprise, really, uh, that he, he finds it straight away. It's, that's what he does, isn't he, uh, in this? But it still looks very scary for Black, though. 
it's still super scary. You could imagine the White Queen coming up and kind of checking the Black King on this diagonal. Uh, you can imagine certainly uh, when, wherever the White Queen goes now, uh, the Rook lining up and it's got huge targets on the D file. Uh, I mean, Magnus is temporarily a pawn up, but remember it is one of these ugly doubled pawns on the F file. That doubled pawn really counts for nothing. And Ferruja, he's happy to go into an end game, just like we showed. He offers the queen trade now. I think you pretty much have to trade queens here as black. You cannot keep the queens on the board with such a weak king. You will get checkmated. And when the queens come off, I guess Magnus is banking on the fact he can defend this pawn, but still hanging by a thread. But what do you think about this uh, decision to trade of queens? I'm just asking because it breaks one of my golden rules, which is when you're attacking the king, it's, a, it's normally a good idea to keep the queens on the board. I agree. Despite my love of endgames, I don't think I would have done this. Mm. It just feels like momentum was on white side. And also, you've got to know your opponent. You're playing Magnus. Endgames always seem to turn on his favour. But I guess Ferruja here, he's banking on this position being forced. And then he's thinking maybe he's going to go pawn hunting here. And still looks pretty nice for white this endgame. Yeah, but I mean, I... I, I... I totally agree with what you're saying. Keep the queens on the board would have been much more scary. Uh, and I think Magnus would have been much more uncomfortable uh, with the queens on the board because you always have to watch out. Your, your king is just more of a target, right? Uh, and here, the black king could actually be quite a nice asset because the queens are off. The king is in the middle of the board. And yeah, Ali Razor is going to win his pawn back. Um, so he still maybe has a nice position, but it's, uh, you know, it, it makes it a bit easier for black to play. That queen exchange. There's also a big threat on the board of uh, the bishop actually coming in to take on uh, d7. Yeah, nice move. Nice, Yovanka. And uh, that would force the black bishop into a pin. Maybe we just show the threat because uh, Magnus actually, uh, he has two dual threats to face. I think this is the lesser threat. This pawn is going to drop anyway, so you have to just leave it here. But uh, if, for example, I try and chase your bishop, then this would be a huge uh, blunder potentially because bishop takes pawn would allow a pin, a temporary sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, next move, you line up, you win this bishop back with interest. And of course, we all know about rooks on the seventh rank. Uh, here, it's all the targets. This rook is going to feast on this pawn later, this pawn later. You could even start bringing the other rook up to the seventh rank and all these black pawns will be targets. And uh, this would just be game over. So uh, he has to deal with this. Uh, Magnus Carlsen right now, bishop takes pawn here. I'm not sure how to deal with that. Uh, I wanted to move my king out the way off the back rank. You always want to connect your rooks and uh, kind of bring them to open files later. But uh, again, you walk into a pin, rook takes pawn, and suddenly this bishop is pinned, meaning that this pawn is still threatened. It's a really kind of clumsy uh, configuration here for black. It's really flimsy, could collapse at any moment. Mm. But he's played fast up until this move, Magnus Carlsen. Is it possible he has some sort of a plan with this uh, strange situation, his king all open? Yeah, I think he believes in his drawing chances here just because it's reduced material and he's never uh, never scared of an endgame Magnus Carlsen. But yeah, it doesn't show as a much kind of ambition as I was praising for mm. him for earlier. I was saying it's a provocative opening. You're saying, come at me, come at me, and then you'll counterattack later. But there's no counterattack here. It's just Black playing for a draw. Mm. Am I wrong? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it feels like Black is just playing for a draw. And it's difficult to find a move. I mean, the lo most logical one is the king stepping up to c7. I mean, you could try rook e8, trying to make some exchanges. I mean, something like that would make sense. And the more pieces you exchange, maybe the closer to a draw you can get. Um, that's probably the move I'd play. Just bring, bring the rook to the center and, uh, uh, you know, at least activate one of my pieces um, if I can play that. Mm. Um, may, maybe make some sense here. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a strange situation. I mean, you can see him on the camera. Yeah, now finally he kind of reacts yeah. to the situation, it seems. Strange. I mean... Uh, but I wonder how yeah. narrow is the path? Because we see the evaluation by a slightly in white's favour. I'm just curious. Yeah, maybe is we it... can get the Stockfish uh, engine suggestions up on the screen. How many moves here does Black have to kind of keep the game roughly in the balance? Oof. Oh, look at that. Yeah. White's advantage grows massively if you don't find the move pawn to A5, and that's not 100% obvious. Uh, we were saying that the Black King moves the second best move according to the computer there. Uh, that's the more natural for a human, but suddenly White's advantage grows to over plus one. and some middle games, plus one is tolerable, manageable, but in an end game, plus one is very significant. Uh, mm. And yeah, pawn to a5, the whole idea is that the black rook on a8 will activate, it will defend things uh, kind of by moving to the a7 square, the a6 square. That's not obvious, Simon. No, I mean, the problem with like a move, natural move like rook e8, which, I, which looks very human, is that the tactical threats actually remain after white's rook just wins the pawn back. So uh, uh, this position, 
there's rook takes bishop as a big threat and uh uh, you, you know, you're, even though you're in an ending, this is really, really horrible. Your king can't move because of the ideas we've shown before. White can even start moving the b-pawn up the board. So a5 is not an easy move to find. Magnus will find it. I bet you anything he'll Ooh. find it. Um, Tempted anyone? to take that bet. Yeah. <laughs> take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I kind of regret saying that if you do. It's more of a bluff, that one. But uh, the idea of a5... Say it with is, confidence. I, I said it with confidence, exactly. but I, I, even if I didn't mean it. Um the a, I think a5 at least tries to get, as David says, the rook in the corner up as a defensive piece, but uh, it also stops these b4 ideas, uh, which we, um, we we saw might be very scary if White's able to get them in. But it's uh, it, yeah, I, I think now the more I'm looking at this position, uh, the more I'm actually realizing that Magnus could be in a lot of trouble, oh. uh, and he's in a tough spot here. He's got to find this very difficult move. I mean. You're getting attacked in the centre, so you move a pawn on the side of the board. That's not very natural, is it? Um, he'll find it, though, won't he? Yeah. Ooh. Thinking for almost five yeah. minutes now. That's a long time to think in this time control. That's a long time. OK, will he find it? Come on. Who, who, there's a bet in the air. After you, Ivanka. You're the queen of predictions. Yeah. We know that on this show. He'll find yeah, it. Yeah, I think he'll Same find conference. it by process of elimination. Because he'll he'll look at the king stepping forward and he'll go, I really hate that. And yeah. you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So yeah, I'm gonna say he's gonna find it. Okay. I David. Think, yeah. The bank is right, of course. I like Good job, you guys. It always comes to David last and he loves delaying it. Yep. So the move comes in, he do <laughs> dodges the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it was tough. I think you're right, Yavanka. Process of elimination. The, that's what all the top players do. They calculate, calculate, calculate. And if the lines aren't working out in their favour, they continue to look for alternatives. And he was looking at the king moves, the rook moves, Simon mentioned, all of those, and they weren't working out for black. Your king was walking into the firing line and eventually you stumble across a move that does survive, that doesn't lose immediately or doesn't uh, kind of worsen your position and you have to play it. So. Um, that's how often the top players find the best moves. And here, okay, big threat. Rook takes bishop is threatened due to the pin on the d file, so the black king has to evacuate. And uh, here we go. The black king is walking, but nice defense there from Magnus Carlsen. He has found the only way to keep the disadvantage to a minimum. And uh, okay, what next for White? The problem is for Ferruja, he was playing for tactics. Now he has to switch gears and maybe play more strategically. White does have the better pawn structure. If you look at the left half of the board, uh, the queen side there, White has three connected pawns. Black has two isolated pawns, so three versus two majority. On the other flank, the king side here, it's four versus three in Black's favor, but two doubled pawns. So the four doesn't really make a great impression against the three. And he's trading off bishops. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess Black's Bishop is a great defensive piece. I mean, the, this move is trying to keep the pressure against the, the pawn in the middle of the board, which the bishop is defending. Um, but uh, it, it, it is double-edged as well, because, mm. I mean, if the bishops come off, Black's majority on the king side of pawns, pawn majority becomes a lot more dangerous. So uh, mm. um, Black can also, Magnus now, can get that rook in the corner and swing it across at some point to try and activate it. So this A5 move was, was very clever. Yeah. Uh, very, uh, otherwise, he'd have been in serious trouble. But he always finds these moves when he when he needs to. That, that's that's why he's the best player yeah. in the world. I really do think that Magnus needs to start activating his pieces. Now is not the time for being passive at all. If you is there a trap? If you take this bishop, I was going to say mm. maybe the white rook gives you a check. Yeah. Uh, white doesn't really want to take back the bishop with a pawn because suddenly this pawn in the center is actually isolated and weak. Uh, but if you give a check, you dislodge the black king. You force the black king to commit. If it goes back to the back rank, we know that that's not a great place for the king. We've seen that already this game, but suddenly a problem of two pawns being attacked. And Magnus, of course, he doesn't make this mistake. He defends the bishop with his rook, but the evaluation bar is still slightly uh, heading up now in White's favor. Uh, I'm expecting here the bishop to take this bishop. Maybe you can delay that, uh, that tension. You can just improve the white king. You can, I don't know, push a pawn, but Magnus, he's really, really on the back foot here, lower on time. And Every move, notice how he's got to find one of only two moves or forced moves just to stay alive in this game and it's still not pleasant. Yeah. Both games, he's been on the back foot. Exactly, he? and first one, you said it was a missed opportunity for Ferruja. David, will this one be as well if he doesn't win it? Yes. Uh, earlier I was talking in the day about the longer the match goes, the more Ferruja will kind of fancy his chances if the scores are still balanced, but the way the first two games have gone, if he doesn't win either of them, if this one ends up as a draw, then he'll start... I think he'll start to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. I think it's only natural, only human to get frustrated. Definitely. Because you don't get many chances against Magnus. 
So we should expect Ali Reza Ferruja to really fight for a win in this game now. He has the white pieces and he's definitely up on the clock again. Magnus Carlsen in trouble. Yeah, in trouble. I don't know, with best play, maybe he can hold the draw here. It is Magnus after all, but uh, I definitely expect Ferruja. He's found so many testing moves and yeah. uh, a lot of the top players, they play strategically sound moves, but he always has a kind of tactical idea behind everything he does. First, he kicks the Black King back. Makes a lot of sense. He protects his bishop in the centre as well. What next? I mean, yeah, Magnus being clever with his king retreat as well, tucking it to safety. He could have stepped it forward, but the king would have been a target there. I think Ferruja has to also now consider what Magnus is going to do. Like, Magnus has a natural target. He's going to put a rook on the open line and target the B2 pawn. So I think if uh, Ferruja takes some care on that side and tries to kill that activity before it even manifests, then Ferruja will have a very pleasant advantage. Yeah, and Magnus leaning back, he looked pretty happy with uh, that last couple of moves. The bishops are off the board. Again, that was the most natural move for Ferruja, but uh, yeah, maybe there's just no way to kind of break through right now. It looks so tempting to put a white rook on the seventh rank. We talked about that being uh, the dream location, seventh heaven yeah. uh, for a rook, but maybe a rook trade will happen there. Should we uh, dive in? Because I'm kind of excited about that rook move. Mm. The most natural move, at least now, I think Farouche's plan is to drop the rook into d7. A killer threat now. If both rooks land on the 7th rank, that's just game over. Uh, this pawn will drop, then this pawn will drop, then the h-pawn will drop as well. Uh, but, OK, black can try and trade off rooks and go active. What is happening here? This is based on the tactic that if a rook trade does happen, white can actually win a pawn. It's now three versus one on the queen side, but the problem is you're just too late. One move too slow, black gives a check, and then another check and takes on b2, and black's rook is so active, this should be a draw, cutting off the white king. And this is on the board. I think Magnus, does he need to find this move, or at least one of these rook trade ideas? He has played it. Of course, he'll find the best move if there's only one. And suddenly the black rook is getting active, just in time for Magnus Carlsen. Mm. Yeah, I, I think Magnus just has enough activity here. I mean, you can try uh, to go rook e7 here as well. Maybe we could show that line because obviously this was, uh, I think Nimzovic was the first person to write about having a rook on the seventh rank. And uh, I guess Magnus can uh, exchange one rook off and again, activate his rook. Maybe in a different way though, go rook b8, attacking that pawn, which if you, you have to really defend with something like b3, and there could be a lever like a4 now, and this kind of move a4 will be key to the defence. Without this move, you'd be in a lot of trouble because you wouldn't be able to get your rook active, but the most important thing in a, in a rook and pawn ending is to is to get your rook active, and you can see in, a, in an ending like this, the black rook gets extremely active and he will have no trouble uh, drawing a position like this at all. So, so it's not clear, and the live board, this has happened, rook d7, rook d8, um, so it's not clear how Ferruja can keep an advantage now because all of these lines, a black rook is getting into white's position. And as soon as that happens, uh, I feel black's going to be active enough. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you could go rook takes a5 here. That's quite funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, maybe that's a very strange that's... move. Um, I think it's a tactic like you pointed out the other day, Yvanka, this yeah. one. Uh, <laughs> but it... it, it Probably doesn't work here, well, but actually, maybe, actually, it's maybe worth a try. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's jump back in actually to show yeah. this because it is really flashy and yeah. it wasn't on my, my radar. I've got to say, I wonder if it was on Magnus's. Rook takes a5, yeah. ignoring the threat on the rook, and look at the standoff. This um, kind of standoff between the two rooks here. Uh, no matter which rook black takes, white will take the other one. Uh, for example, if you take this rook, the other rook will drop. If you take this rook, the other rook will drop with check. And uh, I actually think it's the other one you have to take. You have to take on a5 here, and after this check, the black king moves. Next move, at least you can snack on this pawn. And, uh, oof. Is there There's a huge difference? A huge difference. If you took the other rook, actually, then uh, I think it's losing for black on the spot because suddenly after this check, you're not threatening uh, the white rook and white will have time to connect uh -huh. three. And uh, long term, these will win the game. So, yeah, it's a big, big difference. And I think this would be clever from Alarisa, at least if he wants to give Magnus... Always on yeah. the board! He's played it. Yeah. Nice spot, Simon. Well, I mean, I think he has to. But again, it does seem like Magnus's rook is still going to be uh, active enough here because white cannot defend uh, the A2 pawn. Wherever white moves the rook, the black rook is going to come and take on A2. And is there any way uh, Ali Razor can keep the game winning chances alive here? Because uh, B2's on pre... 
and the Black King is starting to get very active as well. I mean, that Black King uh, can come via the diagonal towards White's pawns as well. And, uh, you know, you have to be careful not to allow such things as that. So I think it's still okay for Magnus here. Yeah. Uh, but he's defended so well, hasn't he? And uh, did Andy Race really have any big chances? Though we were saying it's a missed opportunity. But where where was this missed opportunity? It's I you know I I, I don't think there was any missed wins as such, were there? No, I don't so think it's... so. But I mean, if I'm going to pinpoint one moment where I think that Ali Reza could have improved, it's perhaps avoiding that queen trade. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'm not going to be too critical of it because this was a really tempting ending to get into, and uh, the move a7 a5 was such a difficult move to spot and calculate, and. Yeah, it's an interesting position here as well. And I was wondering whether Ali Reza's rook could get up to some mischief there on the right side. But uh, Magnus, cool as anything, just simply goes, no, I'm going to capture the pawn. This is probably the only way to try and play for a win, keep playing for a win. And this is great to see Ali Reza do this because uh, he's brave because he's going to get quite an unbalanced position now. Um, but yeah, he's still playing for the win. Nice. Yeah, still playing for the win. And this balancing act Magnus has, just having a weak king in the opening middle game, but then it becomes such a strength in the end game because it's never castled and it's centralised. I don't think anyone else in the world can get away with that. And uh, maybe Steinitz would have been proud of Steinitz king. But uh, anyway, all these checks now, forcing the white king away. Uh, this is in order to tie down the white rook to white's pawns on the second rank. Uh, the problem is the only way to evade the checks, to keep the game going, to keep the winning chances alive, is to walk away with the white king but then the black rook has uh, serious threats against the white pawns. Magnus looks pretty chilled, you could say. And also the time situation means that Alareza will not be confident here about his chances of converting. Well, converting what at this point? It might just be equal, this endgame. Magnus has survived the worst. Down to under two minutes on the clock, Gali Reza. Is there any chances for Magnus to win this game or is that hope? Just uh, not you there. Know. You never know with Magnus, yeah, but I would say if Alareza is able to pull the brakes now and body language looks like he's ready to take oh. the draw, mm -hmm. this is going to fizzle. Yeah. Like he, he trusts Magnus's end games there. So then they have got a draw. So, yeah, well defended by Magnus there. He's a, he was under pressure throughout, but uh, held on to the draw. Game two is a draw. Still tied after two games in the grand final. Alareza Ferruja, he has to win a game at some point to have any hopes of winning the Julius Baird Generation Cup. And this game, another game with chances for him, David. Another game with uh, real chances for Alareza. And the one big debate uh, here is whether he should have traded queens. Magnus Carlsen had a very weak king as black, caught in the center. And here Alareza tried to transform the nature of the position by playing the move bishop to f5. If instead maybe he'd moved his queen, for example, to e2, we would have seen a big attack against the black king. And who knows, the game might have ended differently. Instead, after the move bishop f5, very tempting as well, we saw a queen trade. And uh, it was this position Magnus found the key defense, the only move to minimize the damage, pawn to a5. And later, as we saw, the game did fizzle out to that draw. Mm. Magnus, he was snacking on carrots uh, during this game. This was his reaction when it ended with a draw. He seems uh, quite chill today. Magnus Carlsen, they are tied, Ali Reza and Magnus, after the first two games. Look at that, two draws so far, two rapid games to go. And if, uh, well, both of them are tied, then we're gonna see Armageddon in this match here in the grand final. Magnus Carlsen will have the white pieces in game three. The final continues in a few minutes. First, a little break. September bots are here and it's time for a monumental clash. This barbarian might not crush you on the board, but he certainly can crush you with the board. Speaking of crushing, this giant is a living siege tower. Usually found in groups, goblins are fond of sharp, pointy objects and other people's pieces. The battle-hardened Valkyrie might give you a game once she's done arm wrestling a golem. This hog rider and his noble steed might give you a headache or two. Skeletons adore her, foes fear her. You'll need to bring your A-game if you want to beat this witch. Yes, that probably is a rabbit up his sleeve, or a huge fireball with your name on it. We hear wizards are pretty good at chess. Not just a killing machine, Pekka loves tiny butterflies. But you're probably not a butterfly, so watch out. 
the Archer Queen thinks highly of herself, and for good reason. She is a skilled tactician, deadly opponent, and your worst nightmare. Play them all on chess.com. Ten seconds. Every oh, second counts. Hikaru oh. Nakamura is surviving. Or Rook A8. Whoa! Oh, he blundered his queen. He's got oh. 40 more seconds. Uh -oh, he's rookie burn. Rook he's five. losing. Oh, oh my god, he's gonna flag! Like, no! He flagged! He flagged! He flagged! Oh, he got oh, it! Oh my god! He made it! Oh, oh my god! god. <gasps> oh, he's gonna get him on the board! He's just gonna move quickly. Oh, oh! oh my gosh! Spell chess is coming to chess.com. Enchant your pieces with one of two spells, jump or freeze. Players start with two jump spells and five free spells, which recharge after five moves. You may cast your spell whenever you wish before making a regular chess move. Jump is a spell cast to one square, wherein if there is a piece on that square, other pieces can jump over the charmed piece. The freeze spell is cast over a 3x3 three three square area, and the pieces in this area are temporarily frozen in place. Combine your powers of chess and sorcery to defeat your opponent. Come see what Supercell and Chess.com have cooked up in our new variant, Spell Chess, dropping on September 1st. Ah! <laughs> Think you know who will take this year's Speed Chess Championship title? The SCC field includes reigning champ Hikaru Nakamura, World Cup victor Magnus Carlsen, JSCC winner Gukesh D, and the world champion himself, Ding Loren. It's a crazy, exciting field, and you can now submit your predictions for how this tournament will unfold for the chance to win Diamond Membership. Use exclamation point fantasy in chat to learn how. And hurry, bracket submissions close when the first match of the SEC begins on September the 4th. Join Chess Kid for the highly anticipated conclusion of the 2023 Youth Speed Chess Championship. September the 6th, candidate master Aaron Mendes goes head to head with Antoni Radzinski for the crown, with Fun Master Mike and friends covering the action over at twitch.tv forward slash chess kid. Use exclamation point YSCC in chat to learn more. They are tied, Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Verruza after two games in the grand final. But now they are fast, they are fierce, they are without fear. Of course, I'm talking about David Howell and Simon Williams. Who will win when those two meet each other on the go-kart track? Welcome to go-karting. Myself and Simon are pretty nervous right now. It's well known that Grandmasters are terrible drivers. Simon, are we going to survive this? I think it's going to be interesting, David. I think you might have a bit of a weight advantage there going on. I can't beat David at chess, so I've got to try and put my foot down at the go-karting. We'll see what happens. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's quite scary, yeah? It's, it's I'm shitting my bit. pants. If you hit that hard as well, you're probably going to yourself up quite badly, yeah? I'd imagine, you know? I remember when I was a child, like, I got traumatised. I kept hitting the... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm quite scared, but I'm just going to take very easy to start with. And nice and chilled, I think, is the way to do it. Oh, no. Hey, you're both ready to go. Just, yeah. Good luck, Sai. And you, mate. I hate you! <laughs> That's some crazy shit. Simon, you're too fast, that. <laughs> you were being so modest. <laughs> just, I just don't really care. It's like... I've been swindled. I've been swindled. Okay, are you ready? Yep. Oh, there are the lights, yeah? Is it seven laps? Eight. 
Crowning glory, my finest hour. But I was a bit dirty, I <laughs> made him crash. He's gonna kill me. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> Mother <laughs> Oh, I can't believe I lost you, David. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You're so much faster than me. I know. It seems to be going right until I crashed. I think I raced like I played chess, a little bit uh, a little bit risky. I couldn't get the bloody reverse button to work. I was Sorry. like, ah. I think my new profession is professional go-karter. Um, I tried the chess, it didn't stick. That was intense and congratulations, David Howell, uh, the champion. Thank you, but dirty. I was a bit dirty. Dirty, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> blocking, blocking tactics. Just like your chess, you know, so. Gonna do anything you can to win. Yeah. Wow, new profession, as I said. Yeah. <laughs> We were actually saying that, like, I don't know if anyone's played Mario Kart, but I used to, I used to love Mario Kart, and uh, David's like the mushroom, and I'm, I'm, a, bit more, I'm a bit more like Bowser, <laughs> <laughs> Just trying, trying to squeeze on through. But uh, it was, it was loads of fun, though. Great fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was terrified. Yeah, I've got to say, but best yeah. day ever. Best really? Day ever. Yeah, genuinely. It was really good fun. And you seemed like you actually had some skill in it, Simon, before. Well, yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, I haven't done it for like probably I don't know 25 years, but it was yeah, it was great. It was like a bit of speed, so uh, love to do it again. Yeah, it's just uh, I'm gonna beat you next time. We're <laughs> yeah. always talking about it uh, when we talk about other sports as well. Were you able to use any of the chess skills, David? Here, uh, just the dirty skills. <laughs> Try any trick to win. It's all about winning, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> it's all about winning. You said it. It is all about winning. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces here. This is game three. 
in the grand final. And Ali Reza Vruja, he needs to win at some point. Moves are coming out really fast now. Moves are coming out fast, and this is the first new move of the day, uh, at least in terms of this individual battle, the opening battle. Earlier, Magnus went for a really slow approach, and it really backfired. Vruja had an advantage as black. Uh, so this time, instead of the timid d3, he brings his knight out. And uh, this leads to a to totally different uh, type of animal. Uh, it's still a Spanish opening, of course, but it has forced Ferrugia to think. So, surprise, the name of the game in this one. Yeah, they, they, I mean, Magnus and, and Ali Reyes had a bit of time there to, to work out uh, what to do. And clearly, Magnus wasn't happy with the way the first game went. And he probably wasn't happy with the way the last game went. So, he hasn't got an initiative or any chances to win so far. So, there's a big improvement for Ali Reza on the past games. But as you mentioned, this night coming out is... Quite a bit slower, I'd say, um, this one. Or you're going for more central uh, control straight away with that knight uh, looking looking towards the D5 square. Yeah. Uh, I'm still bitter about that go-karting, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> David blocking me. The car not working. Oh, dear. Hashtag, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it again. That I... little bump at the end, that was that was an accident, of course. <laughs> so... I bribed them beforehand to uh, tinker with the car. But I don't think I've ever met anyone who loves winning as much as David Allen. Oh, it's, yeah. It well, is well, well, hang on a minute. I have played backgammon with you. Oh, Carl, yeah? <laughs> so... Anyone other than me. <laughs> Problem is, I never win. I think Ooh. you beat me in back, yeah. so, uh, oh, I'm just a loser, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> what can we do to build Simon's confidence, you guys? Um, yeah. We'll find something. Yeah, I reckon we need battle go-karting. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but something involving, like, clubs, I think. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not that I'm angry at all. <laughs> send, send in your challenges next time uh, for yeah. the next show. Yeah. Yeah. We need ideas. We need ideas. David yeah. versus Simon. <laughs> That's actually a good uh, series. I want to see that. Be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chess boxing. Yeah. That's oh. what I want to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I oh, resign yeah. now. I resign. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, a couple of moves here. White's bishop has been kicked back. The Spanish bishop and Ferrugia has castled. Still nothing changing. Uh, nothing too dramatic, at least. And Magnus, the first to pause. A bit surprising, because he was the one who chose this uh, sub, kind of sub-variation of the Roy Lopez, that he's the first to think. But there we go, d3. And now it might take a similar nature to the previous game. But at least White's knight is more active than it was. And uh, Magnus, I wasn't 100% sure, but it looked like he was resting his eyes. I wouldn't say sleeping, but he was resting his eyes a few <laughs> minutes ago. It uh, doesn't look as energetic as we're used to seeing from him. Do you think the latest start today, all the games began uh, two hours later than usual? Do you think that's going to affect the players? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you may just need more carrots as well, right? So uh, <laughs> get the carrots out. But it does look a bit tired. Yeah, yeah, you're right, though, David. I hadn't really thought about it. But normally when you get yourself into a rhythm, mm -hmm. I mean, in over-the-board chess tournaments, you usually play like at 2 p.m., 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And they always hold the last round at like 11 or 10 a.m. Yeah. And you're like, why are, you, why are you doing this to us? You kind of kill the rhythm. We got ourselves into yeah. a, ru a routine. Chess players at tournaments love the routine because we just need that thing to rely on. Mm -hmm. Also, we're superstitious creatures. Yeah. And uh, I heard a story that about David. Shall I tell it to you? Yes, please. About J David and superstitions. Uh, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> <laughs> Even I don't know this one. <laughs> well, well, one of my friends, uh, one of our friends went to dinner with him and he won the next day. So after that, he made her go to dinner with him every night. <laughs> that, really? That, that just sounds like an excuse <laughs> to me. Yeah. Crafty <laughs> tactics. I know his dirty tactics. <laughs> it's like, oh, you have to come to dinner with me again. And no, like, no. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Purely innocent, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Are you all quite superstitious? Very. Okay. Very. <laughs> yeah, I mean, still, I, I saw a magpie, magpie on the way here, and I, I have to salute magpies as I see him. It's just, uh, but yeah, don't look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm not. I speak to the birds. <laughs> no, I do. It's like you're, you're supposed to salute one magpie. Two's good luck, but one is bad luck, so you've got to give it a little salute. I never knew that. One for either. sorrow, two for joy. That's right. Three for a girl, four for a yeah, boy. Yeah, see, David knows it. The old, uh, yeah, he knows his old... Uh... You've got to say hi, Jack, every time you see them. Yeah, hi, Jack. I still do that. Nice! Yeah. <laughs> We're not weird. <laughs> Strange, but true. 
And we see Magnus now grabbing a pawn, David. So Yeah, uh, yeah but wow. it was Ali Reza that, uh, with his knight foray to the edge of the board, trying to hunt down the bishop, gives up the pawn. Yeah, I was saying that we're not weird, but this is a weird decision from uh, Ali Reza. He's given up a pawn, and this type of idea is very well known in this opening. Uh, Magnus himself has given up uh, pawns in the martial attack and uh, various other kind of branches of the martial. Uh, we saw that in his World Championship match against Nepomniachtchi, for example, but... Here, it doesn't strike me as being too convincing because black is unable to break open the center in one go. And we see the evaluation bar really react. Uh, if Faroujah here is freestyling and has given up a pawn, then he's got to really hope that objectively uh, it is merited. Uh, I simply think that white can, there we go, retreat the knight. And where's the compensation? He needs the bishop pair to start working here. That's the main compensation when you give up a pawn as black in the Spanish opening. And black's bishops don't make a very impressive uh, kind of uh, sight here. It's really surprising to me. Mm -hmm. We do have a result in Division 3. Remember, Jan Pomniachi has already now won Division 2 and Division 3 is now already uh, also decided. That one went to a reset between Sam Sevian, the, the American, and Shakriar Mamdiarov, two very exciting and entertaining players. It uh, went uh, to Armageddon and with the white pieces, young Sam Sevion was able to win it, to win Division 3 and $5,000. So congratulations to him. And is that the second time Sam Sevion's won Division 3 now? Uh, I think it might be. He's been in correct. several finals. I think he uh, might be in Kamsky, was it? In possibly one of them. But yeah, he's... he even played Prague, uh, Prague earlier yeah. in the season. And mm. also Division 2 last time in the finals, he lost to Lazovic there. But... He's the kind of king of knockouts. I wouldn't be surprised if he's played some of the most, uh, well, the most games in the tour this season. Ooh, Sevian. should uh, actually check that. Yeah. Sam Sevian, another young one. Obviously, we are talking about generations. He is one of the young Americans. What do you see for his future, Ivanka? Yeah, Sam is a great player. The, uh, he's super serious about his chess. I mean, he's also, as you can see by his performance in online chess, also extremely talented. He's got tough nerves and I think that he is going to get better and better. And I think his aim is to get into the American squad, which is no mean feat, right? When you have Fabiana Caruana, Levon Aronian, Le um, Sam Shanklin, Lenny yeah. Dominguez, and I can go on and on. Wesley So, of course. And that definitely was a uh, match of generations uh, in Division 3 with Mamadiaro at uh, 38 years old. Would you also say this is a match of generations? Alireza Faruja at 20, Magnus Carlsen at 32. Is that two different generations? It feels that way. Magnus grew up when computers still weren't that strong. And uh, Alireza, I mean, part of his development, part of the reason he rose up through the ranks so quickly is because he was able to play a lot online. He was doing that all the time, training online. Uh, definitely a clash of uh, styles, generations, everything. And uh, Ali Reza Faruja told us when he was answering a question who was his, uh, who he found inspiring when he was growing up. He said that he learned chess at 2012, and Magnus became Incredible. world champion yeah. 2013. Yeah, I just can't believe how he got so good in 10 years. I mean, eight years he was world number two, right? In eight years of picking up the game, I mean, uh, that must be unheard of. I mean, incredible, yeah. That eight must years. mean he has some incredible talent for the game, yeah, an incredible 100%. mind. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, that's very special. I mean, uh, I don't know anyone else who's done that, especially in modern day chess, to, to become that good, because uh, the amount of hours you have to put in just to memorise the opening variations is is, is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, yeah, so yeah, re really, really amazing ta talent just to be able to do that. And I mean, going back to, to the game as well, I mean, I, I, I'm struggling to understand what Black's idea is. I mean, the only concept I can think that Black's trying to do is that he sacrificed this pawn to play d5 at some moment and open up his light square bishop. Um, this is the only uh, idea I can see, but I just don't believe it. I just don't believe this pawn sacrifice is enough. And he goes d6, and I'm like, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I, I'm not understanding this pawn sacrifice because you, you, you shouldn't give away pawns against the best player in the world. Um, so what's he seen, David, that I haven't? Uh, I don't think he has seen uh, kind of sufficient compensation here for Roger. He's banking on long-term prospects of his bishop pair, but 
I'm in agreement here. If you could play the move d5, and I think it's the move he wanted to play uh, without allowing white to bypass that pawn and uh, advance in the center, then maybe some compensation. If we show uh, something like this, we see the evaluation bar really drop. Uh, suddenly black is actually doing very well because the bishop and queen battery along this light square diagonal would provide full compensation. But uh, the problem is that white can simply play the move e5 and you're forced to retreat with this knight. You're forced uh, to some bad squares. Suddenly white can step forward in the center. Black has weak pawns here, especially on d5. These bishops are dead. They are not playing any role. And look at what Magnus is trying to do in the game position. Uh, Ferruja just advanced one square and Magnus is doing the exact same thing. He's trying to render these bishops passive uh, for eternity. He's just played the move c4 and we know in open positions, bishops thrive. In cl closed positions, block positions, it's the knights. And here, white's knights look beautiful. Uh, if black cannot break with d5 and it looks impossible for the near future, then long-term white just is going to I mean, slowly get ready and at the right moment utilize this extra pawn. End games will favor white, middle games will favor white. If you take en passant of this, as if this pawn just moved once, then white is going to do the same thing. Next move, he'll push again and lock down the d5 break forever. And uh, bear in mind, en passant is a one-time offer. Should he take it? Because after all, he has the bishop pair. It's an open position. Maybe the pawn on b3 could be a weakness. Yeah, true. You can only take this uh, pawn now. Otherwise, it's uh, bypassed you for good. And uh, White will play this move next. You're mentioning, Yvanka, that this pawn is a bit backward, uh, potentially a target. The one downside here is that you have given the white bishop a beautiful diagonal to sit on. Uh, as opposed to kind of not touching that pawn structure. But at least in return, yeah, maybe you can target this pawn. Uh, so I, I don't see any compensation for black for being a pawn down in any of these lines at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, I know he's got two bishops, David, but like he can't get them open, right? So, uh, um, very, I mean, it, th this is Ali Razor, though. He's very, very, uh, he takes risks. He's a very exciting player. Not many players would even think about giving a pawn up like that. So you've got to give him credit. But... It does backfire occasionally, maybe, and I've got a horrible feeling it might backfire here. Yeah. I mean, if you pick up a black pawn that's off the board now and just <coughs> put it on the e6 square, you would say it's a level position, it's a normal position. But uh, black is essentially a pawn down and really hard to come up with a plan. Uh, it's not as if you're doing too much on the queen side, you're not breaking through there. It's so blocked. The black light square bishop, which is the only unchallenged piece, should be playing a better role, uh, but it can't go any get anywhere, simply. Yeah. Very confusing. Um, it is confusing to me as well. I mean, the only thing that I can see is to do what Ali Reza is doing, which is to relocate the bishop onto the long, dark diagonal and then just pick up a knight from f6 and take it on an odyssey around the board to see if it can land on either e5 or d4. Yeah. But that is so long and it's not worthy of a pawn. Yeah, maybe it's some compensation though. I mean, some but it's not enough for a pawn. Uh, and, you know, white's got a lovely square there as well. And we see it in exchange, and there's another square for the white knight uh, being vacated by that last pawn move of white's. And uh, I think black's going to have to swap his bishop off when that knight comes around c4, uh, I would imagine now. Playing quickly, all of a sudden. Yeah, I think Magnus has really woken up, and it's because of this golden opportunity. He's been kind of gifted here. Uh, just a free pawn, a present there, and it's really kind of perked Magnus's uh, interests here. And look at this, not just to see blocked up the black dark square bishop, but there's a key target. I just want to highlight your maneuver there, Simon. I think it's incoming. Uh, this is a backward pawn after all. The base of the pawn chain is always the weakest. And knight back to d2, knight to c4, knight to hit this pawn. <coughs> and that would be disaster. What to do? Totally. And uh, also just to kind of reinforce that this is a standard maneuver when white has a pawn on d5. So it will be easy for Magnus to see that move. It's difficult to actually come up with a move for Ali Reza, unless he's going to just initiate the chaos button and just uh, <laughs> push pawns, explode open in the center. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I would recommend that, Yvanka, because, like, I mean, there's a little yeah. analogy I think that everyone can play, play by, and that is uh, <laughs> if you've got a bad position, he does. He's a pawn down against a great player. Uh, you might as well complicate it as much as you possibly can, even if it gets worse at some point, because, uh, you know, by adding that randomness to a, a safe situation, you give your opponent uh, a chance to go wrong. So I, maybe, maybe this idea is, is worth, worth a punt, we on say. It's on the board. He's punting, as we say. Punting away.
Gambling. Gambling is the other Hustling word. Hustling is my word. Hustling, that's right. Swindling. Yeah. <laughs> like I did on the uh, racetrack. Oh, stop it, David. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> if only my car worked properly. I just broke down. But, but did it break down? No, I didn't know. I didn't know where the right button was to reverse. <laughs> no one told me. <laughs> so I was sitting there thinking, oh, what do I do? <laughs> oh, look, where's the reverse? It's not on the stick. There's no stick. <laughs> so, so it took me. Yeah, I was a bit slow there. I like oh. how you were trying to get the, the car to move. Also, oh, so like... we just had a bit of body weight <laughs> yeah. to try and to try and move it around. I thought I've got a bit of disadvantage on the straights, but if I throw my midsection into it, I might be able to swing around the corners. And, that was my tactic. And even with two stops, <laughs> it got super close. It, it, it did, yeah. He drives like a granny, you know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's no surprise. It'll be safe around corners. He's, yeah, he's fine. like an old woman. It's like he's racing away. And he's, <laughs> and boom, boom. Yeah, actually, to be fair, he got much quicker. and oh, Slow and steady wins the race, yeah, just yeah, like in chess. Yeah. So, Are you known for that around your friends, David, to be a slow driver? Maybe. A safe driver. <laughs> safe. Safe yes, is the right word. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, Magnus Carlsen's bishop was forced to reverse there, forced uh, <laughs> to retreat back to e3. And no reverse gear here for Ferruja anymore because he has to just simply go forward. It's all about speed. It's all about uh, yeah. using that body weight, using the pawn's pieces to try and uh, bully white backwards. But g4, I'm assuming this will be captured. What's Magnus thinking about here? Uh, maybe he just doesn't want the black bishop to spring to life. Mm. I have to say, I am waiting for the right moment tonight to say the magical words. Look at the bar! <laughs> and it's, it's coming, quite far off oh. there. Oh. Is this looking really good for Magnus Carlsen? It's looking very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still a pawn up, and this time with a strategically winning position. Uh, we say that because white has the extra space in the center. All of black's pawns on the dark squares will be weak for eternity. Black's dark square bishop blocks, but dynamically... Okay, I wouldn't trust the bar 100% yet because uh, in human terms, there might be one chance for Ferruja to get back and look at the bar. It's yeah, dropped. it drops. Oh, you Sorry, got I stole it. Yeah, st <laughs> I think I, I was wondering if he could have gone knight h4 and g3 and, and just try to queen h5 and hold it, hold uh, hold the light squares there. Because this this pin is it's really, yeah. really horrible, isn't it, I, Ivanka? I was even tempted to... Maybe not even knight h4, but something just, like that. Yeah, I was th thinking like knight h4 and then after pawn takes pawn, you know, just... Yeah. Go forth and uh, do your worst. I was even thinking pawn takes pawn, or maybe even the queen coming in. Just uh, fun, fun, fun. Yeah, looks like a very active play there. Puts, was possible for Magnus. Queen to h5 looks very strong here. But uh, in case, instead, he played the safer move. Uh, safe isn't always the best. Uh, taking, taking. And this pin, he ran out of it. But this has come at the cost of shattering his pawns here. Uh, Magnus Carlsen, and look at this, Ferruja is trying to step forward, is trying to attack, and Magnus meets that by a simple king shuffle. Simple? Uh, well. <laughs> it's not nice moving the king like that. I, I think this randomising idea that uh, Ferruja has used of just going for it has, has worked very well here. It, it's actually now a free result game because the black queen can fly in, black's bishop is good, and there's some pressure here, surely. It's much mm -hmm. better than it was. Mm. Definitely. Do you think this uh, will be like a story of our race? A slow start from Ferruja and then yes, slowly David. catch it. Sorry, I will stop bringing it up now. <laughs> <laughs> the reverse button. He can't move the pawns backwards. Yeah. No reverse. No reverse. So, you know, you can only go forwards. Actually, thinking about it, if white just takes a time out, let's say I play a really kind of passive move just to defend this pawn, will black consider potentially kicking this bishop Evaluation bar doesn't necessarily improve, but kicking this bishop, and how is this bishop ever getting in the game, white's bishop now? That's a good question. It but, can never move. But that, that's true. That's a big downside to the position. But on the other hand, the king will have a super safe home on e2, and then the rooks can uh, join the fun. Mm. It's getting sharp. It's getting complicated. Your catchphrase might come in handy a bit later, Kaya. I... This one could certainly swing either way now. Waiting for my moment. Uh, I have to say, Ferruja, he is uh, down on the clock as well. Under five minutes now, Magnus Carlsen has more than eight minutes. And it is pressure on for Ali Reza Ferruja. He needs to win a game to be able to win the Julius Baird Generation Cup. Ooh, Magnus plays a move, I said, a passive uh, move that nobody really wants to play, but he just, uh, he just defends his B2 pawn. And now big moment, does Ferruja close it up, lock in that white bishop, but at the cost of some dynamism, or does he find something a bit more aggressive? I think, as you said earlier, David, that uh, is the kind of player who, who likes to keep it fluid, keep it di dynamic. 
And um, that, that move locking down the bishop looks really interesting, but maybe he'll keep it as... I, I don't expect him to play it here. I expect him to keep it a bit more flexible if he can improve his pieces somehow. Uh, maybe he can get his rooks to a better square. Rook f8, rook e8. Uh, and instead, he's, he's decided just to open it up. Queen f3, maybe. Yeah. He's going for mate. He, <laughs> checkmate. Doesn't it end the game? It does, it does. end the game. Yeah. And uh, as we've seen, even... The great Magnus Carlsen is not immune to the effects of checkmate. Oh, this is looking truth. really scary. <laughs> I, if I was white here, I'd be, uh, I'd be terrified actually. Ooh. So uh, with the queen coming to f3 or something, yeah. and I would be like, hang on a minute, this has gone horribly wrong for Magnus. And the queen is on f3, and there's a big trap on the board. So the whole point is that the white queen can't slide over to the e2 square because then the queen would come down to h1, and that would be the checkmate oh. that Simon was <laughs> alluding to. Yeah, and the queen on f3 just sits so comfortably there, and you can back it up with a rook coming around. Okay, queen d1, clever move. If the queen's come off, white will win, because he's a pawn up, but black can obviously try to stop that. Now, black's queen has to move, but... Whoa! Oh, queen's oh, off the board. Oh. Okay. What? Swapping queens when you're a pawn down. Farouk is banking and counterplay on the queen side, but surely this is not going to be sufficient. He's just going to get one active rook, but white's pawns later are going to start marching. And uh, when they do, I really fear for black. Really counterintuitive trading the queens. We were talking about checkmate one second ago. I mean, this is this has maybe been a, 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 a mistake that we've seen a couple of times here, because... Uh, in the last game as well, Ferruja had the chance to keep the queens on the board uh, and play for checkmate, but he decided not to. He decided to exchange the queens. And again, he's exchanged the queens off, so he can't play for checkmate anymore. And I, I think this has made it from a free result game where he could have won by keeping queens on to, to a game where he's... I don't see how he can ever win this now because uh, he's a pawn down, you know, in the middle game. And there's just not enough counterplay about the queen, I, I, I would assume. Plus, this is treading into Magnus's strengths, right? He's fantastic at the end game. He's not only just a pawn up, he also has the better pieces. Mm. Ferruja, I think once again, if I'm going to criticize him, it's going to be the queen trades. Yeah, it just feels maybe like uh, we talked about Jack Battle of Generations, maybe a little bit of uh, kind of panic here, just maybe banking too much on calculation rather than general kind of feel, uh, which Magnus kind of relies on. Sometimes you just can't calculate, you just have to say to yourself, it is that simple, I'm a pawn down, do not trade queens. And uh, I mean, my big advice against Magnus Carlsen is don't even go into an equal end game against him, but here you're going into an end game of pawn down. Uh, you're kind of giving him a standing start, you're giving him a massive uh, kind of uh, handicap lead on you here. And okay, all pawns on light squares, good kind of general chess wisdom there uh, for Magnus, especially facing a dark squared bishop. Now, where is this black rook going? It's going to be slow. It's not going to be a quick knockout here, but Magnus, if he can consolidate, kind of step his king forward, start activating the white rooks, which are passive right now, then it feels inevitable at this point, kind of slow and steady. Uh, he will improve his position. He has a nice time advantage as well on the clock. I mean, he's got uh, uh, this eight minutes versus um, Addy Razor's two and a quarter minutes. And what Addy Razor's got to try to do here, and he's trying is to get his pieces just as active as he can. As he can. Uh, his dark square bishop has some nice squares in the diagonal, uh, but white's bishop is very solid there, defending everything as well. Um, it's going to be tough here, though, for black. I mean, if the, if you can look at the pawn structure as well, just imagine all the rooks coming off. Black would be in a hopeless situation because the pawns are on dark squares, black's pawns. White's pawns are on light squares. What colour bishop it is? It's a dark square bishop. So mm -hmm. that means all the endings without rooks will just be winning for white very easily uh, because white can target black's pawns, but black and his bishop can't target white's pawns. So uh, there's that danger as well, just to add something else in. And should I say it now? Look at the bar, you guys. Do it, Kaya. Yeah. Yeah. The bar, it feels like it's, well, the bar says it's winning. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. where is the knockout blow? Are there some tactics in the air? Yavanka, you're looking very intently at the board yeah, now. Yeah, I was wondering whether you can get away with uh, the rook check and then uh, pushing the pawn to f4. Yeah, it feels like this is in the air, either now or on the next move. Uh, for example, if you do throw the pawn forward, uh, if this pawn is captured, then maybe your idea now, Yavanka, mm -hmm. give a check, force the black king into the corner, and then what next? How to finish this one off? Uh, I wanted to say we just pin the bishop, but there are some nasty checks for the black rook. This is what Magnus Carlsen is calculating right now. 
can he go straight for the win? The bar says yes, the evaluation bar. Mm. It's not obvious though. Uh, I wanted to give this pin, but suddenly this check throws a real spanner in the works. No good square for the white king to go to. If you drop back to the light square, black can actually unpin himself by dropping back. And uh, due to the fact this white rook is undefended, uh, now protecting his piece, he's won the pawn back and survives. Yeah, maybe in that line you, you can actually, after f4 uh, and the check, for example, the check is a good check. Ooh, he doesn't go for it. But... Um, I think you can just swap bishops and go king e3. Mm -hmm. And this ending should be, because you're going to swap a pair of rooks off for rook f1. Mm -hmm. And um, once you swap a pair of rooks off the d6 pawn, I know you've given up a pawn this way, so it's risky, but this, this ending with rook f6 and e5 should, should, should be very unpleasant for black at least. So well, if I, I get you right, Magnus, he wants the rooks off. He wants, uh, yeah. I think, anything off at this point, mm -hmm. uh, as long as he keeps his pawn advantage. Uh, the problem is, if you trade rooks, then, as Simon pointed out, white has the better bishop, white has the pawn majority in the center. If you trade bishops, then it's actually, just as we showed in that variation, it's actually easier for white to start advancing the pawn majority. Uh, so any piece trades here pretty much favor white. Uh, that's the problem. That's the first thing you think about in endgames, kind of which uh, exchanges, which trades suit me. Yeah. And here, for white, it's everything pretty much. Yeah. So Ferusha just has to sit and uh, he's not allowing any trades yet. That's good. Yeah, I like his last move because now, now if the rook ever checks the black king, the black king doesn't have to hide in the corner. It can come towards the center but maybe. Just because of that, I was thinking the best move might be to move the bishop all the way to the edge of the mm -hmm. board and just keep that king locked there on the g8 square. Yeah, I mean, you could even throw a check in first as well, maybe. I mean, um, and then move the rook to g8, but the, the both rook, bishop h6 looks a yeah. great idea, yeah. Uh, here uh, to to stop the black king from coming towards the middle. Oof. But so many tempting options here for Magnus. There are, and this f4 move is always there, right? Uh, just just playing for f4, and in this case, you you, you could do the same thing: I'll sacrifice a pawn of f4, move your king fours, and both your rooks are are coming over to to uh, cause a lot of trouble. So there's yeah, there's many options here, mm. uh, and Magnus taking his time to think about it. But this is. This is the best position Magnus has had so far today. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, Ali Rezo, he's paying for that pawn sacrifice that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, he's played so well today, but giving up the pawn like that so quickly, it was... A bit too creative. Too creative, maybe. Mm. Yeah, that, that's something that the top, top talents actually suffer from, being too creative. Oh. You know, they try to do something special. You know, and they go over the top and it actually backfires. And uh, um, yeah, it's, you know, Ali Razor is one of those players that does do special things, but they, they don't, they can sometimes not work. Yeah, I'm Rook to C2, just a slow improving move. And I, I'm inclined to agree, Simon. Every time I see these young players, we talked about it the other day with Abdu Satorov. He's really kind of, it feels like he's kind of uh, just testing his boundaries, seeing how much he can get away with, how ambitious he can be without it backfiring. And sometimes it goes wrong. When you're young, you're inconsistent, that's natural. But uh, when it works, it works very, very well. Exactly. Uh, that's why these young players are rising towards the top. And I think in a few years' time, Farouk is still super young, all of these teenagers, once they've kind of realized what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what they can get away with, how hard they can push, then they'll just become uh, even better. And yeah. I think that's why Magnus, we've talked about him provoking his opponents, pushing, pushing, kind of getting away with kind of these dodgy positions. He knows the risk levels that are acceptable and uh, they're getting to that level now. They're approaching him uh, in terms of risk assessment. Was Magnus like that as well when he was uh, a teenager and maybe early 20s, where he would test his boundaries, basically? Definitely. Uh, trying all sorts of different openings. Uh, that's kind of step one. All sorts of different positions. Magnus was a grinder, now he's more aggressive. Look at this move Talking of well. aggressive, yeah. yeah. What a move this is. Oh. Uh, I mean, he's played a move. And again, look at the bar. So <laughs> we've all got it in, Kai, and we're just ready. Love it. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. And, uh, but he's sacrificing a pawn back here. And uh, his last move was to try and get his rook in on the C file. But uh, what is the idea if, if Black simply takes that pawn, which he has to do, right? He, he can't do anything else, otherwise he, he will. But I mean, this is actually looking like very close to checkmate now, even if Black's not careful here. Where do you even run? If you run away from the center, then suddenly you get checked from another angle and uh, you get kicked, you get checked again. And the Black King is uh, forced to walk into no man's land. And I'm assuming there's a knockout blow here. Um, I don't really see it immediately, but it feels like there is going to be a checkmate, maybe something like this. And the White Rook can just uh, come in. Maybe you just trap the Black Bishop actually uh, in the center. This looks deadly. Uh, Magnus is about to deliver this check. 
I'm assuming. And uh, maybe that means the Black King has to run towards the center. And where is the finisher here? He doesn't even give a check. Wow. I was going to say here you can go for some nasty checkmates. Yeah. But OK, Magnus just takes the slow approach, positional approach. He drops back, eyeing up this pawn. So he's given the pawn back its level material, but uh, he has pinpointed a new weakness. And the Black King's still in a bit of trouble. I'm amazed by how Magnus is playing because I expected th this pawn sacrifice to be, you know, aiming at uh, the rook coming in, giving a check. I mean, that's just irresistible to probably 99% of the players. But Magnus, he sees chess in a different way and instead he drops the bishop back and just goes for the weak b4 pawn. Yeah, now what would uh, you be inclined to do? Magnus, he's obviously looking at this pawn, but he's also got tempting options of a check, going for checkmate again. He can activate this rook, which is clearly the worst piece uh, right now, not doing anything on b1. You could kind of bring it to the open file, try to kind of do that pincer movement, two rooks, uh, trying to catch the black king. Well, the problem is, is he didn't do it on the last go. <laughs> <laughs> he's done it now. He's given a check. Ah, OK. Well, now, mm. what about this one? You know, he's been inconsistent. Yeah, the bar's yeah. dropping, and Ferruja's been really clever here. He's created an evacuation square, an escape square for his king. Now a check will be met with the king hiding out, and it's actually surprisingly safe on h7. Uh, this is the big difference. If Magnus had gone for it quicker, uh, one move earlier, this black pawn would have been kind of back here blocking the escape of the black king. Suddenly it's game on. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, and Magnus leans forward. It's like he heard you there, David. It's game on. Yeah, I think he just missed uh, the Black King's surprisingly safe on h7. Uh, this bishop d2 move was very peculiar. It was very slow. Um, I mean, had you checked, uh, had you done the same thing you're pointing out, David, you would have forced Black's king to go into the middle, and then you could have played bishop d2. Mm -hmm. So you could have the same position as this, but Black's king could be in the middle of the board on a much more exposed square. So... Uh, and he raises back in the game now. Uh, his king's quite safe, and uh, the h-pawn could even cause white some problems now. I mean, if you push it a couple more squares, it's uh, going to be stabilised on h2. So, uh, game on. Yeah, and he will be regretting his life choices, Magnus, giving back the material, and suddenly no obvious moves. You can give a check, you can try and catch that black king, but it's not going to get anywhere. And if you don't kind of have this material advantage, then suddenly the margin of error uh, what are you even playing with there? Black's rooks are ready to get active. This could turn, Magnus. Whoa. Oh. Retreating his rook. He's just lost two moves for free. The rook was here oh. two moves ago. A sign of panic. This is that's a really sad move to play uh, because you, you've gambited a pawn, then you've retreated your bishop, you've checked your opponent's king, then you moved your rook back. I mean, what, what, what's going on here? I mean, this is, these are the kind of moves that you just really never want to play because you're admitting to yourself, I've played some bad moves. Uh, and you can see he's, he's trying to hide his face there and he, he's not happy. And look the at the engine uh, suggestions. Yeah. Whoa, OK, uh, you're right, Kaya. There was only one move actually there to hold the balance for black. That was not easy. It was the black rook coming down to a3 to target white's b3 pawn, the weak pawn on the queen side. Instead, he's gone back. He's gone passive with his rook for Ruzia, and now advantage white again, but not obvious anymore. Magnus is in panic mode. He found his reverse gear, and uh, I don't know if he's in the mood to go on the attack anymore. What would be an attacking move now? What sign are we looking for that Magnus is attacking to win this game? Well, I would expect the, the white rook on g1 to lift up to the g5 square and attack the pawn. OK, good move. That's go a target. And black gives a pawn away uh, just to lure the white king, distract the white king. And, OK, once again, white is a pawn up, but is it enough this time? The black king is getting hit, getting checked, but the white king, not entirely safe either. Yeah. yeah. Both of the black rooks are on quite a funny... They, they can be hit by a bishop e3, uh, but I, I don't know if there's any tactic that makes that work. Uh, white's king is nicely situated in the centre of the board, but what is the move here? Is it to... Where, where do you put your rook? Gives a check, first of all, and whoa, look, mm. look at the bar. Sorry, Kai, I'm stealing your words for, <laughs> for you there. Look at the bar, it does drop after that last move. And This okay. is the wrong way. I mean, whoa. The okay. king had to keep contact with the white rook. Now the white king is perfectly safe, and now you can start using your c2 rook. Move it up the board. Move it maybe down the board, actually, maybe down to c1. This is a nice move as well. I mean, just trying to force the rooks off to, to give yourself a pass pawn. It looks like a nice move. Computer doesn't like it, but you see, this is a really nervy game. Uh, I mean, the bar fluctuations. I mean, you, you want to guess the accuracy of this game? This is uh, certainly one of the lower lower accuracy games Ooh. we've had. Under 90 so for both players. Yeah, under 90, about 85%. Uh, 
Uh, and again, the bar just going oh, crazy no. again. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, Kaya. Look at five. the bar. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the time. And he's rook just... h5, what a move, giving away the rook. But he's unpinned his bishop and the other rook falls. That was, look at it. The engine said it just below the board for a second there. That was the only winning move and Magnus wow. found it. And uh, now it's winning because look at the Black King. It's so far away from all the action, which is actually going to take place and now. One second. Oh, the king's running though. A second pawn's about to drop. Magnus can just defend. He's winning. Can be two pawns up. In the end, again. it's dramatic for Ali Reza Vruja. Four seconds on the clock in a losing position. Two pawns down simply. White's B pawn is going to be the winner here. White's king is going to run out the way, clear uh, the path for the B pawn to advance. There's no counterplay on the other side of the board. The black king is active, but it's not threatening anything. Magnus can just continue advancing. There we go. B4, he's going to get his king out of the way next move. Surely, this should be winning now, but only a few seconds each. This is a bullet game. Mistakes could still happen. He's blocked his own pawn. That's bizarre. Why is going down? Really strange stuff. And now the black king is kicking away this white rook. The E pawn will fall. He's lost one pawn. And uh, what about the other pawn as well? I mean, the, he, he, you know, this, this is getting very close to being a draw now. We're going to get a rook and pawn ending. White only has one pawn left. Yeah, but this is and, no, uh, but this one yeah. is lost for black. The black king's just too passive here. Pure panic and suddenly the white king is going to move out the way with oh. gain of tempo, hitting the black mm -hmm. rook. And the white d-pawn has a clear path through. It's going to run. That's going to be a new queen. And Faruja, I think he's resigned. You can see Magnus shaking his head there as well. I, yeah. think, I think they're both... Uh, Quite shocked with, the, with that game. But that is a heartbreak for Vruja. Magnus Carlsen wins game three. Ali Reza Vruja, he is now in a must win situation in game four to take it to Armageddon to have any chances of winning the Julius Baird Generation Cup. It's looking great for Magnus Carlsen after a dramatic game. Back and forth, the bar came alive. What happened here, David? The bar came alive. This was a crazy game. Magnus was mostly in control, but he did give Faruja some big, big chances to hold. And even just three or four moves before the end, it was technically a draw. Faruja just didn't have enough time on the clock to find that path. Magnus here went for it. He went for broke. He went for gold here with king to c6, hitting this pawn. The ro black rook correctly took here and now a difficult only move to save the draw. We can forgive Faruja for not finding this. This is almost impossible. Instead of defending his rook, instead of reacting to the attack on his bishop as well, he had to forget everything and try to hit the white rook. This would have broken the white coordination and forced the draw, but this was difficult and it would still have continued. Instead, trading off these bishops allowed the white king to move out of the way and this was the winner. Faruja resigned. There was no way to prevent a queen now from appearing on the board. A great game by Magnus Carlsen. He takes the lead in the grand final. And with only one game to go, it's must-win situation for Ali Reza Vruja. He has to win game four to take it to Armageddon. And that game is coming up in a few minutes, but first, uh, a quick break. One minute, 10 seconds. Every oh, look second at the free counts. Hikaru oh. Nakamura is surviving. We're rookie eight. Whoa! He blundered his queen. It's got uh -oh. 40 more seconds. Uh oh, he's rookie burn. Five. Rookie he's five. Losing. Oh, oh my god, he's gonna flag. No! He flagged, he flagged, he flagged. Oh, he got oh my god, he made it. Oh my god. Oh, Johnny, they're making it. I'm getting on the board. He's just gonna move quickly. Oh! oh. It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things.
Magnus Carlsen has taken the lead in the grand final. And uh, this guy is actually a former coach of Magnus Carlsen. He is also the reigning Norwegian chess champion 41 years after he won the title for the first time. At 16 years old, he was able to beat Boris uh, Spassky. And at the same time as being one of the world's best chess players, he was also uh, playing for the national team in football or soccer, if you want. Today, Simon Augustein is the head coach for the chess players at the, the Norwegian High School for Elite Sports. We're about to enter the trainer's session you know, the Norwegian College of Elite Sports. And this is the chess department. It kind of starts out already out here because I need some space for my books. They say that it's, a, it's kind of a Norwegian school, which is, we focus on having fun, to put it simple. At the moment, there are 13 students here over three years. So uh, it's the best in Norway, I would say, the best juniors in Norway. Perhaps even this sofa is a bit, little bit legendary, perhaps. Magnus has been lying here, and he normally came into his office, he's just stretched out his hand, just picked anything, and started reading just anywhere. I think this was fashionable in the 1970s. The missions are high. We want to have international masters, grandmasters, world champions. We have had a couple of them actually. At the moment, most of my students are 2000 in rating and more. And I have a couple of GM candidates. Oh, five, two. It is important to be fit. But kind of at our level, we practice kind of because it's, it's fun. That's the main reason we practice, and it's good to get uh, out, go out a little bit. It's, uh, it's about the, the way of thinking, I think it's similar. Uh, if it's uh, chess or football or basically anything, breaking barriers, such things. It's easy to, get, to be distracted with a little too much respect, but if you kind of broke such barriers, uh, you, you get um, kind of dizzy when you kind of meet the best in the world if you're not kind of mentally prepared. Uh, I beat uh, Boris Paski when I was 16. I kind of broken some barriers. I, I, I played with the very best in the world. So uh, I kind of discovered early that uh, they weren't inhuman. And I played against Italy. I played with Franco Baresi. He was world champion. How cool is it to have Simon, a legend in Norwegian chess, as your teacher every day? I think it's very interesting and very cool because he has a lot of stories and obviously he's very good at chess. So. It's a wonderful experience and I really appreciate the opportunity we have here at Tentiga. It is uh, very special and very cool uh, in Norway to have an elite sports uh, high school with a group of chess players as well. Seaman, he did coach maybe one of the greatest chess players of all time, Magnus Carlsen. I'm excited now to hear the lists. Top five goats in chess. You have all been asked to pick your top fives. I'll start with you, Yvanka. Who do you think are the best chess players of all time? Well, I kind of wanted a combination between historical figures and current figures as well. And I, I was also kind of very aware that I wanted them to be very influential one. Oh. And so my... Well, my one in number five is Vera Mentik. She was the first women's world champion, also eight-time women's world champion, and, you know, just incredible. She competed amongst the top men as well wow. in the world. And think about it, it was also in the 1920s. And she sadly died in 1944 because of the World War and the London Blitz. And uh, then I was also had a toss-up between historical champions and it was like my romantic side my scientific side and in my end the end the scientific side won and i was like okay what michael botvinnik and that was to do with the fact that he inspired several of the future generations he made chess a science and then of course number three is judith polga one of my favorite female players she just shattered the barriers she broke bobby fisher's record and I could just go on and on about her all day. Yeah. Incredible player. Beaten so many world Ex champions. Being in the world's top 10. So she was my number three. Number two, Gary Kasparov, a man that I grew up absolutely idolizing. I loved his style of play. And for me, number one. Ooh, drum roll. 
the man playing in the tournament here, ah. Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> <laughs> the GOAT for Yovanka is Magnus Carlsen. And Simon, I'm excited to hear your list now. Are you agreeing with Yovanka on some of these names? I, I, I am actually agreeing <laughs> with Yovanka quite a lot for probably the first time ever. No, I'm <laughs> <joking. laughs> but, but my, my number five is, is Bobby Fischer. I, mm. I think it ha you have to have Bobby Fischer on the list. He uh, really um, made chess so popular, especially over in America. And uh, it became cool in the 70s when he won uh, the World Championships. So he was a legend in the game. Uh, number four for me was Paul Morphy, uh, which is a bit of a surprise. But I personally loved the way he played chess. He was called the, the pride and sorrow of the game. He, he gave up and died far, far too early. But his games were magical. And it was that romantic era uh, of chess, which he really uh, um, um, played and uh, really good games to to look at. And then Judith Pogar, number three. Um, I, I think you have to have her on the list because she she was just so strong and, uh, you know, she, uh, she she her and her sisters did so many great things and inspired so many uh, so much as well. And then Gary Kasparov, he, he was uh, number two. Yeah, I'm following you here. <laughs> um, you can't have a list without Gary. Um, he was a really energetic player. Uh, brilliant player uh, and number one. Well, yeah, I mean, we know we know who number <laughs> one is, right? I mean, number one is the one and only, uh, the legend of the game, Magneto, the great Carlson, and and I think he has to be number one. I don't think there's any talk about that at all. Yeah, at only 32 years old. He's still got time to do yeah, more exactly. as well. So, yeah, he's still young. So, yeah. All right. Well, David, do you agree or will you have someone else on top? Let's start with your number five. We'll see number five. This is maybe controversial. I've gone for Beth Harmon. <laughs> she might not okay. be real. <laughs> she might be a fictional <laughs> character. But uh, you talked about influence, Yavanka, and she has brought chess to a wider audience, the Queen's Gambit, everyone who came to chess uh, through watching that show. I think we have to thank her for that. And, of course, she beat the world champion there, so she, she was pretty good. Um, Creative, I like it. <laughs> number four, Judith Polgar, coolest, one of the nicest people in chess, as well as a legend uh, and a monster on the board. Then Bobby Fischer, number three, Gary Kasparov, number two, and Magnus Carlsen, number one. There we have it. There we go. You all agree. Gary Kasparov, number two, Magnus Carlsen, is the one that our experts in the studio think is the greatest chess player of all time, the GOAT of chess. And right now, he is only one game away from winning his third tournament on the Champions Chess Store 2023. He will win the Julius Baer Generation Cup with a draw or a win in this game four against Ali Reza Fruja. That means it is must win for the French 20 year old. He has the white pieces. And what does he need to do right now, Simon? Win. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. That's right. And what do we think about his opening? Interesting. Wow. Yeah. B3, not one B3, which uh, has become famous as a uh, very ambitious move these days, but a spin on the Sicilian. This is relatively rare, you've got to say. Uh, no open Sicilians, nothing too direct, but it's really flexible. And it's forced Magnus Carlsen to think. This is, uh, I think, a decent winning attempt uh, by Ferruja. Nice opening try here. Definitely caught Magnus off guard. And uh, an opening that makes me happy because I remember when I was still an E4 player, I was struggling in the main lines. They were way too sharp for me. So I was thinking, oh, how can I just switch things up again a bit? And I came up with this move as an alternative and the idea is quite simple you just want to develop your bishop to the long diagonal and if you're allowed push up the pawn e pawn one square further and then put the bishop on d3 and attack 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 see I, at one point in my life i was a hacker Oh yeah! No, no, no! I'm not like a computer hacker. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, suddenly, I can kind of see suddenly that. Suddenly, I saw you go. Oh, <laughs> yeah. and I thought, oh my goodness me! <laughs> no, no, I, I, I like to attack. I like to throw pieces to, you know, to towards my opponents. So that yeah. means you're sort of hacking the other opponent, yeah, the, yeah. the opponent side of the chessboard. Yes, oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, not a computer hacker. <laughs> I, anyone who knows me knows that. I was watching my streams, knows that I'm constantly having to call for technical help. Yeah, I had to help you turn the computer on earlier. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe uh, like accidental hacking. <laughs> Another hacker here with us, Simon. Uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, opening? Um, I think it's a great choice and I think we can already see it's a great choice because Magnus has uh, sunk into a two-minute uh, think here and uh, there's, there's a lot of venom uh, in this move actually. Uh, one of our 
and compatriots, Luke McShane, um, who was called the strongest amateur chess player in the world, um, used to play this system quite a bit. And um, there's there's a couple of ways that Black can play against it. I've looked at this as well because I think, like you, Yvanka, I didn't want to learn the main lines because I was too lazy. So I wanted <laughs> to learn a sideline. And, and B3 seemed like a good move. I mean, you put the bishop on B2, fantastic diagonal. And Black's got to make this decision now. Um, and what does Black do? There's a number of ways you can play. Uh, you can develop one of your knights. You can even challenge that pawn on e4. I think that's probably the most uh, um, direct move, even with the pawn or with the knight as well, knight f6. And play d5 the other d5, way? d5, yeah. And I, I think this is following. We're talking about Bobby Fischer, and it's really hard, that list, to put them in the right order. Mm. I mean, you know, it's going to have so much discussion because Bobby Fischer could be number number two as well. I'm mm. not going to say number one uh, on that list. But I, I'm sure Bobby Fischer had a game in this precise line with the white pieces. And um, I think this is considered to be slightly better for white. But a solid choice from black d5, David. Really solid. And uh, the main line here, as far as I know, uh, okay, these play the players are uh, kind of choosing the moves now really quickly. But uh, after black takes here, after a trade of pawns in the center, white castles. And the whole idea is to quickly deliver a check. And it's actually a bit reminiscent of the previous game where Magnus Carlsen's king got caught in the center of the board. He's taken with the knight instead. But uh, either way, it's all about the bishop landing on this diagonal and maybe white blowing open the center while he hits while he is ahead in development. So, uh, yep, still early days here, but I really like the opening choice from Farouche. I think this gives him the best bet of winning. There's no guarantees in a must-win situation, even against, uh, well, in any scenario, let alone against the best in the world. But he has caught Magnus slightly off guard, uh, forced him to think, and he will get attacking chances. It's going to be imbalanced, at least. Uh, no kind of boring, symmetrical endgames. Uh, this one is going to give white chances later in the game. 100% agree, and, and White has very easy moves to play as well. I mean, White can castle, White can check the Black King. Uh, these moves, just natural, and it's nice having easy moves because you can save your time uh, for the middle game. And uh, you can see that um, Magnus took on D7 with his Knight. That's not ideal because the Knight on D7 is a very badly placed piece actually as well, but it does, it's the most solid choice because you keep everything guarded here. But can you check and go Queen E2? This is, this is the first thing that springs to my mind, trying to stop Magnus from castling, because that'd be great, right, if we that, can stop him from castling. That's actually the main move. Uh, another alternative is actually to challenge the centre immediately by pushing the pawn forward. And i just got to tell you about the stats. The stats are significantly in White's favour here. 67% of the games have finished in a White victory. Wow, 67. 67, yeah. That's yeah. huge, and that's not even counting draws, right? Nope. Wow, so uh, the main... Sorry, Simon, the no, main no, reason sorry, yeah, uh, massive, massive White stats. is doing well here is because Black can't castle. Oh. It's tied down uh, to this bishop. If you castle, it simply falls off the board. It, and uh, simply no way to compensate for this loss of a piece. So your king is stuck, stranded in the centre again. Magnus Carlsen makes it work. We've mentioned kind of treading that fine line between uh, brilliance and disaster. Uh, he's kind of poised here if it gets to the end game for that king to be nice and active in the middle of the board. But well, with queens on, this looks really, really dangerous. And uh, what to do about this? You need to contort yourself here. You don't really want to step away from this pin. You can move your bishop, yes, later, but this rook is now kind of stuck in the corner forever. You're playing basically without that rook for the near future. And uh, okay, Magnus brings his rook across. <laughs> wow, this is creative. He's going to zigzag his rook up the board and block the white queen. So white has two moves to do something to hit before uh, black is ready. Yeah, because uh, and there's a quite a nice idea here. I mean, if you ever try knight g5, maybe black can castle. Or is that right? No, mm -hmm. can't still castle because it's mm -hmm. a pin. Okay, but knight knight g5 is not a very good move. But I, I want to stop that idea. But I'm, I'm not in a good situation to play something so aggressive at the moment. Yeah. Um, interesting good. idea, rook c8 though. Um, you know, funny way to get the rook around. Feels like white needs to do something with these pieces still asleep at home. But yeah, Ferruja with a lot of choice. Let's leave him with this big decision. Uh, he basically has those two tempi, uh, as we say in chess, two moves before Magnus is ready to bring his rook around, uh, kind of release the tension, block everything. Uh, if he doesn't strike now, Ferruja, then Magnus will solve his opening problems. We do see the bars on his side, so there must be a way. It's just about finding it. I wouldn't be surprised if Ferruja actually spends, invests five or six minutes here, because it is that important. The stakes are that high in this p exact position. Yeah. Crazy position here. Yeah. 
And it's not only must win for Ali Reza to uh, be able to win the tournament. Remember, he needs to win the tournament to be guaranteed a spot in Toronto in the tour finals. If he doesn't win, he still has to fight for the points in the final regular event that will be in three weeks. I don't think he is thinking about that right now. He just really wants to win this game. Do you see chances for him to do just that, David? Definitely. And i got to say, I love this move from Faruja. He didn't follow my wisdom. He played this move really quickly and I'm so impressed. Uh, this is not an obvious move. It's not a conventional move. Normally, as we pointed out, the bishop wants to land on an even longer diagonal than this. Uh, usually the home uh, for this bishop is the b2 square where you're staring across the board. But this whole move, uh, the whole idea here is really sophisticated. He's basically fighting against Black's plan. He knows what Magnus wants to do and he's saying, no, you cannot do that. If Black's rook lifts up the board now, look at this tension. The bishop is blocked, but it can open up this diagonal by sacrificing a knight just blowing open the center. The knight now hits the rook, stops the black rook from using this square, also wants to land on the beautiful, the dreaded f5 square. And uh, if you take this knight, of course, then your position collapses. Bishop takes e7, and this will be deadly for the black king. What an idea. Really rare, but uh, really nice concept. Nice idea. Been played two times. Ooh. It's been played two <laughs> times already? Oh, wow, OK. I mean, uh, a great opening choice um, by by Ali Razor here. He's uh, he's found something that can cause Magnus problems in the opening, and you rarely see this because Magnus is so well prepared, and uh, he has some problems now. He, he he can't do his plan of moving the rook. He can't castle. Obviously, if Black could castle here, Black would be fine, but he can't. He can't get his king safe, and White can still develop. He can bring his knight out. He can uh, place a pawn in the center, trying to open it up. And uh, there's a lot of danger here uh, for for Black. How does Black try to get his king safe here? This is this is a big question. There's, pff, it's not easy to see because you can't move your queen. You get checkmated on e7. I mean, you can't really move your knights. Do you have to move your king? And but that looks ugly as well. I mean, uh, very difficult position for Black to play here. Yeah, it's, it's it kind of interesting because um, the two games that I have in the database, both of them, I don't know whether it was by error or by plan, but they both went rook to the c6. They allowed white the trick. And how did those games end up, uh, One ended in a draw, the other one ended in white winning. Mm. Not just promising seems... stats for Magnus. Yeah. Just seems like a blunder, doesn't it? As you pointed out, mm. David, that nice tactic of rook c6, knight d4, beautiful, beautiful idea. And uh, uh, Magnus needs to use his time now because uh, one and one bad move, you just you just lose this position. Simple Easy. That. It's that critical right now. Yeah. Already. Yeah. King Ooh. stuck in the middle on the open file. It's, it's scary. Scary stuff. So. Yeah. We've seen it a couple of times in this tournament. Uh, games we would call miniatures. Knockouts in under 20 moves. And this has the potential for that again. And I think that's why we see Magnus Carlsen's body language. Uh, we're used to seeing him really relaxed. But uh, I think he's a bit kind of uh, just bemused here. He's thinking how, with very natural moves, am I in this much trouble potentially as Black? And in the end, he decides on the move A6. Minimizing his time disadvantage, I was gonna say as well, he was three and a half minutes down on the clock, nearly four minutes down there. And uh, okay, he decided A6 here. The idea, I guess, is to advance pawns on the queen side to eventually target and kick away White's bishop, but it looks so slow. He's just banking on the fact that maybe there's no immediate way for White to uh, kind of continue this attack to build the momentum. Yeah. Uh, what moves come to mind here? Well, knight d4 again is quite interesting, trying to get the knight to f5. Uh, so a cu couple of moves. I mean, that would be uh, one idea, putting a pawn on d4. I'm just trying to find, because again, it, this this position is quite, is really critical timing-wise, because if black is able to uh, calm the position down, play these pawn pushes and castle, he won't be in any trouble at all. So as white here, you, you've got you've to gotta think of ways to do things quickly uh, to maintain your advantage. You can't play, you know, you can't play slowly here. So a move like knight d4 is quite logical, but it, it's probably very easy to stop that idea um, of moving the knight to f5. Just play g6, I guess, is, is very simple, stopping that one idea. So you can maybe put a pawn on that square or, or just develop another piece as long as you've got an idea behind it. But um, Maybe moving the pawn is, is, is a critical yeah. option. My vibe is uh, move the pawn forward. But uh, the problem is, is that uh, once the knight, the, sorry, once the rook comes to the c6 square, then uh, you don't have your knight to d4. 
Mm. Yeah, it's actually really clever, really sophisticated uh, by Magnus. This is a deep move, uh, his last move, pawn to a6. He's basically waiting, slightly improving his position, but he's waiting for Alareza to play the move he wants to play, uh, like Ivanka says, because actually you block that square from your own knight. And it's like a waiting game. It's saying, OK, I know you want to play this move, but that will help me as black. And now the rook will come across. And if you do take a pawn, for example, as soon as the black rook lands on this square, blocking this tension along the e-file, breaking the pin, uh, suddenly black will be ready in the next move or two to castle and uh, most likely win the pawn back as well. So, OK, Farouge has gone for something else. He's played pawn to c4. This is a trap, of course. You cannot now push this pawn forward because of this tactic we've been mentioning. Knight takes pawn and uh, the knight is poisoned because suddenly the bishop behind it would fall. Uh, so, OK, he's asking different questions. And note how he's left this d4 square empty for his knight to land on. Both players playing really, really well right now. Um, this is really high level chess and Magnus, he's got to continue finding these uh, deep concepts just to survive. Uh, the center is about to explode and this is kind of instructive from Ferruja. Always open the center if your opponent's king is weak, especially if it's stranded, uncastled, uh, and especially if you're ahead in peace development. That's what he's going for right now. So do you think this will be another game where Magnus does not castle his king? <sighs> it's looking that way right now. It's looking unlikely that the Black King can ever move without dropping the bishop. Uh, it has to stay in the center just to protect. Uh, he would love to somehow find some maneuvers to block the e-file and get that Black King to safety. But normally, I remember one of my first coaches was saying, always castle by move 12, otherwise you'll get checkmated. Uh -huh. And <laughs> it's move 11. <laughs> Although it doesn't feel uh, as if you're playing too safe right now, if you're Magnus Carlsen. Thinking for two minutes on this move, Magnus Carlsen, what will he do? I don't see a sensible move here, or at least a natural kind of uh, productive move. I am also Phase lost as well because this. I just don't see anything natural. And we do see Magnus move his knight to the F8 square, getting ready to put it on E6. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, maybe Magnus is just going to curl up into a little ball, you know, then put the knight onto G6 and then castles. Yeah, I mean, I think both e6 and, and g6 are good squares for the knight. Just get castled then. Um, two moves and he'll be out of danger, right? If he can move the knight and castle. But that gives white two moves to stop that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we are hoping for an Armageddon to decide this grand final. And uh, it's not looking impossible right now. No, definitely on the cards if uh, Ferruja is energetic enough here. Uh, Knight on F8, we need more rhymes for that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, two moves, as you said. How can Alareza continue the action? He's got two moves. I wanted to bring my knight out here as black, but I don't see how to continue after the black knight blocks. And it's only one move. And Magnus is on paper saying this uh, in interviews. He, uh, Yvanka, you know this one better than me, I think. But he said, if you're three moves away from castling, you're in big, big trouble. Oh. Uh, if you're two moves away... You can survive if you're one move away. You should be OK. And here he's just two moves away. So he's on the brink, balancing on the edge of being all right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a really shaky position. I mean, I was thinking after this night retreat that White will simply go, OK, you go backwards, I go forwards and move with the knight. Ah, look, that, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking knight to d4. OK, knight to d4. Yvanka, it's the top computer move. We see oh. the engine suggestions <laughs> uh, below the screen there. Nice one. Jumping in this time to, uh, to f5. And we talked earlier about how you have to uh, stop that. You have to stop the knight landing on the beautiful f5 square. But suddenly this would backfire. I'm not sure exactly why, but maybe it's just because this pin is unbreakable now and this black knight is sitting silly on the f8 square. Knight in f8, there might be checkmate this time. Oh! <laughs> looking at ideas yeah. from queen to e5. And, oh, OK, computer hates it, but <laughs> just uh, some ideas of taking this knight, which is pinned. Maybe you can just go knight c3. Yeah, that's what I thought. Scenario. Introduce yeah. everyone to the party. Yeah. Yeah, look at all the white attacking pieces. One, two, three, four, five. Black's basically <laughs> fighting with a lone king and a couple of pieces around it, but all the fun for white right now. And if he finds this move, computer says it's less than a plus one advantage, but it's the type of advantage that could grow and just uh, go through the roof if uh, Magnus doesn't defend well. Knight to d4 would be strong. Is it also a move that for a human eye will, uh, will look much stronger than for a computer? Yeah. yeah. Normally, it might not be obvious, but here it's been a recurring theme over the last three or four moves already, so it's already high on Ferruja's radar. Fighting to win this game, Alireza Ferruja, and take it to Armageddon against Magnus Carlsen. I have to say, Magnus looks chill. He knows he has uh, a second life, both uh, 
in this match and in the grand final. If he does lose it in Armageddon, then there will be a grand final reset with best out of two rapid games and potentially Armageddon to decide it. That would have been fun, uh, Armageddon. Yeah. Or maybe it still will be fun, but uh, Ferruccio yeah. needs to be decisive here. Okay, he jumps in with the knight to a different square, but this was also on the computer's list of candidate moves. Uh, it looked promising, and okay, this time we see Black's replies, and only two moves keep the damage under plus one here for White, which would uh, kind of signal a large edge there. And I'm not sure they're totally obvious, Simon. Uh, the computer's saying either block the center with Black's D-pawn, just close it down, or use the Black Rook to defend the Black Bishop on the seventh rank. They're, they're both very passive. I mean, it, it might be worth just showing why Knight E6 doesn't work now, because Black really wants the castle, so uh, you'd love to play knight e6, right? I mean, that that is a move uh, where Black is now ready to castle. If he gets one more move, he's fine. Maybe he's even better in this position. But it's White's move, and White can now strike uh, with knight takes f7. I mean, there might be a knight d4 here, just uh, maybe <laughs> like holding on, but I don't believe it. So At the very yeah. least, you take this queen and uh, this endgame. I guess you're a pawn up. Yeah. Uh, at the very end here, but just to show the point, Simon, knight takes f7, destabilizing the protection of the knight on e6, and boom, queen takes e6 here. Killer attack, you've won a pawn, and we'll win the game. So, yeah, this is the idea. Really nice move. Also, if the knight goes to g6 to protect its bishop, this was the other direction we were talking about, then the knight is just eliminated on that square, and the game continues with black's king in the middle. Still stranded. Uh, just to show the computer's top moves here, very sophisticated rook c7, defending the bishop, uh, before it gets directly hit again. That's not wow. obvious at all. He's played knight g6, Magnus Carlsen. Oh, no. Ooh, and computer hates it. Knight takes g6 looks uh, kind of automatic here. Maybe you don't even need to rush. Maybe you just blow open the center. Uh, wow, and again, computer, thank you, Stockfish. You're helping mm -hmm. us out here massively. Pawn to d4, just explode the position. And this is winning for white, apparently. Over plus two advantage. Wow. That's decisive. Wow. And you did say that is uh, kind of the way Ali Reza likes to play as well. Exploding open the center. Yeah, exactly. Just to show the idea, if pawn takes pawn now, we trade the knights off first. And once again, the bishop is open. Uh, three attackers on the square, only two defenders. Great chance of getting an Armageddon. I know. Mm. Exciting times, you guys. Uh, can Ali Reza Ferruza win this game to take it to the Armageddon? It's looking good. The bar is liking the situation for Ali Reza Ferruja. Magnus Carlsen in trouble here. But he has been quite resourceful today, Magnus Carlsen, fighting out of some difficult situations. He's been very resourceful uh, with a bit of a helping hand from uh, Ali Reza. Mm -hmm. But pawn to d4 here simply must happen. Uh, I was talking about trading knights first, but actually there might be some counterplay against the white king on the h file. And oh, he doesn't play the pawn to d4. Oh. He finds the second best move. But now Magnus is still alive. Pawn to d4 might just have been a knockout. It's a very good, yeah, I mean, it, you know, opening the center, open the position where your opponent's king is trapped there, it's kind of uh, quite logical. This move also does seem very logical, right? You, you develop your last piece, you put some pressure on black center, and uh, white still has the advantage, no doubt about that. But uh, this may give black a chance to consolidate things somehow, uh, possibly pushing the pawn, or uh, uh, can he ever get castled? He still can't get castled here, right? I mean... Uh, I think it makes sense to play that d4 move right now, first of all. It has natural, right? You want to correct yeah. your pawn structure. Also, you want to eliminate the possibility of trades in the middle. And also, uh, Ali Reza is such an active player. I'm sure that in the next move, he will also be thinking about just exploding everything. He's played it. Yeah, it is on the board. Mag Magnus, accurate when he needs to be. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you know what your opponent wants to play. He, Magnus was aware maybe that d4 is an idea for white, so he's blocked it, locked it down and prevented d4 uh, by playing it himself, simply. And yeah, I'm surprised by Ferruja's move. I mean, it was natural, but uh, now the follow-up is less natural, putting the knight on the edge of the board. There are some threats uh, due to the fact that the black bishop is kind of in a pin right now. Uh, there might be threats to capture on the c5 square, white's knight and bishop. What else are they doing on the edge of the board other than attacking that black pawn on c5? But yeah, this is the thing. After the Black King moves, suddenly you're stuck with two bad pieces and the stakes are higher now. If you don't strike in the next few moves, you're just kind of regretting uh, those two pieces. I'm really surprised, I've got to say. Not 
just because we saw the evaluation uh, earlier and we saw that White did have a winning move, uh, helping hand, which uh, the players don't have, of course, but just because it looks unnatural putting the knight on A4 like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I think that Ali Reza simply forgot that the Black King can uh, move to F8 because for so long it hasn't been a great move. Mm. And now suddenly it is. It's, it's just one of those things. And still the position, I, I feel, is very murky. You can, it's some... still a lot of danger for both sides. Mm -hmm. David kind of mentioning that uh, Ali Reza's piece is on the A line. <laughs> <It's boring laughs> yeah, they ain't good. But uh, on the other hand, Magnus still has problems with his king and with the rook on h8. Anything can happen. And as the clocks tick down, well, it's going to get even more exciting. Yeah. Suddenly, I would think I would take black. I just wow. feel that white has no obvious moves here. And unless, yeah, unless you find something, then mm -hmm. things are going to change. Queen to f3, OK, he's hitting a pawn on the diagonal uh, with that white queen, the pawn on b7 hanging. But feels like black should be able to deal with this in several different ways. You can defend that pawn with the queen. Slightly tempting to push that pawn uh, if Magnus is feeling ambitious, aggressive. Perugia is trying to make things work with tactics. Oh, it feels like we're reaching, like we've been building up to this point. And OK, he hits the knight in the center now. If there's a trade of knights, if white's knight goes and captures a black knight, then the h file will open the white king not entirely safe. Ooh. Yeah, I agree with this uh, Twitch comment. The computer hates everything nowadays. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but especially, you know, especially in these complicated positions when there's so many tempting moves on every turn. Yeah. Accuracy is hard to maintain, yeah. uh, especially when the nerves are high. Yeah. And uh, talking about maintain, I think that Ali Reza should be maintaining that knight there on e5. I drop it back to the d3 square. And as David says, do not trade off knights. That's exactly what... Black would want because the knight, the rook there on h8 would suddenly get a lease of life. Yep, he has to keep pieces on the board. He has to attack. He has to win this game. Yeah. Alariza Ferruja. Can you see that from the decisions he's, he's constantly making now that he has to win this game? Yeah. He's been taking big risks. He's chosen a great opening, but he hasn't found that killer blow. I think that's uh, something we saw, for example, yesterday in the clash between Ferruja and Denis Lazovic, that amazing, uh, that amazing final game there where... Dennis had it pretty much in the bag, but finishing off these top players in the world, that's another level. Mm. Uh, that's the hardest thing to do. And OK, Magnus solidifies his queen side, connects all his pawns there. What next? Frugia needs to open something. He needs to do it quickly. Black King still not castled, so the Black Rook on H8 is still jailed, uh, still kind of unable to enter the action. Oof. OK, I said I'll take Black. <laughs> who's, uh, who's agreeing with me? Who's disagreeing here? I want to know. Because <laughs> it is a crazy position still. Just for fun, I'm going to choose white, precisely yeah. because of this move. You know, I was thinking you have to make sense of those pieces on the edge of the board. And the computer hates this. But on a practical level, I think this is good. White now has a very simple plan of just putting those rooks on the open B line. And uh, the white knight can spring forward. And, as, and, 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 I forgot the most important thing. There is a pawn under fire there on A6. <laughs> Oh, trust you to spot that pawn, <laughs> uh, banker. Yeah, why not grab it? Why not get greedy? And uh, again, we see Stockfish, the computer, suggesting king to g8. That's not obvious. Uh, the black king is on a slightly open diagonal, but running towards the corner when it looks like your house is on fire on the other side of the board. Yeah. Uh, slightly counterintuitive. First, he trades a set of pieces, not allowing white to grab any pawns, and then he runs. And uh, OK, white is playing with an extra piece. That black rook and h8. We've been talking about it a bit, but... Still stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time for Ali Reza to consolidate the C4 pawn and then just uh, work on targeting the B6 pawn. And uh, no, Ali Reza playing very actively with the queen, making every pawn grabber on the planet very happy. Yeah, shout out to Yasser Serawan, who will be very happy with this move, uh, going after these two black pawns now. One of them is going to drop. And, uh, OK, how to best defend this for Black? Magnus, the problem for him is defending is so much harder than attacking, uh, especially now the clocks are ticking down. And, yeah, it's not going to be hard, uh, not going to be easy, sorry, to survive these next few moves. OK. Still tightrope, as uh, said there in the feature chat. This is balancing on a knife edge, especially for Magnus. Stakes are high. Yeah. Two minutes and 20 seconds left for Magnus Carlsen. Only three seconds increment, but he still looks so chill 
Magnus Carlsen, he has been in this situation so many times. With a draw or a win, he's going to win the Julius Baird Generation Cup. It's getting so close for him. Yeah. Experience. Is that going to be the mm -hmm. key? What do we think? It's the battle of the generations. Yeah. Experience of time scrambles, defending bad positions. I, I don't know, but this generation, they're so experienced. Like I saw an interview with, a, with Jan Christoph Duda and he was like, I play 20,000 games online. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember when Ali Reza was playing the candidates. Do you remember he had an all night session playing bullet chess? Yeah. And you know, it was constant chess. So we have seen the stats uh, actually uh, before, right? These two have played so many blitz and bullet games against each other. I think on Lee Chess is where we've seen that, maybe. Yeah, and uh, I mean, there's other sites, of course, but guess how many games Ferruja has played on chess.com alone? Blitz, bullet, full time controls. I've just pulled up the stats. How many, David? 32,457. Oh, wow. It's wow. a lot of time spent playing chess. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and he's only played uh, chess for a little over 10 years, remember. He <laughs> revealed that uh, yesterday. Incredible how he's become one of the best players in the world in only uh, a little over 10 years. Simon, how many games do you think you've played in your lifetime? Loads. I don't, I don't want to look. It's, it'll be, <laughs> there used to be this... Um, um, then maybe they still have it on one of the big chess sites where you can actually see what percentage of the year you're playing chess. Uh, and I think it also gives you a percentage of your life. So it's like you have been playing chess for like 5% of this year. <laughs> and I, I did this one time and it was like, I don't know what the number was, but it was far too high. And I was like, oh my God, I've got to get out and get some fresh air. This is terrible. <laughs> it's such a scary uh, stat saying you've spent, literally spent 10% 10, 10 of your life sitting at a computer playing chess, and I was like, oh, yeah. But then again, was... what would be a better thing to spend your time on? No, um, not that much. Just like going for a walk occasionally, or, <laughs> oh, you know, just boring. like... Um, yeah, I mean, you can play a bit of chess, but you've got to have a break now and again, you know? So I wonder what the highest percentage is I of know. anyone who plays chess. It's probably like 40% or something. I bet there's someone there who just plays chess, you know, moving that mouse yeah. all day and all night until they sleep. There must be, so yeah. It's, Scary. I remember reading. Oh no, about... you, you got my page up. Now. I, don't, I don't want to know, David. Let I just know. don't want to know. Just don't, don't tell me. Okay, please. Mean... No, no. <laughs> Faruja is a pawn up on oh. the board. While uh, Magnus is thinking how to compensate, let's do a guess. Kaya Yovanka. God, it's how many be... games has Simon played on Chess.com alone? By the way, so I have Faruja? played. I have played for quite a long time. I just want to put that out there. So Faruja had a, a, <laughs> somewhere above thirty thousand. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, 60,000. Ooh. Slightly on the high side, but your banker? Oh. I'd go the same, 30,000. Okay, 25,000. Oh, I, I thought it was a lot worse than that. <laughs> That's okay, but I play like, they're, they're like two hour games, like classical chess. <laughs> <laughs> so seven games each, seven hours each per game. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what about David? Oh, no, I've got to get him back now. Uh, I can't David, remember. Anyway, you can't remember. Back to the position. <laughs> <All right. laughs> David, well, you've got to tell us what you've got now. That's only fair. Come on. <laughs> okay. Remember, David also usually plays for, what, five, six, seven hours when he plays over the board. He does. Yeah, Conservatively. Yeah, only 11,000. Uh, oh, that's 300. Not, that's, not <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> that's only one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 100,000 somewhere else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, back to the game. And uh, we talked about pawn grabbing. Ferruja has grabbed a pawn. Everything else looks still, uh, hasn't changed too much, but it's just the clock times. They have been ticking down. And uh, also the Black Knight landing on F4. That's very good news for Magnus Carlsen. Uh, at least for the first time in this game, he has some active play, some counterplay. The White King, no defenders around it as well. So he needs to somehow generate activity on that flank. I'm looking at the Black Rook in the corner on H8. There we go. Comes to life, hits the White Queen across the fifth rank. That is blocked, however, and Magnus has quickly replied. He's trying to force a Rook trade. At least this would help him in terms of one passive piece being traded off for White's very active Rook in the center but still a pawn down. It's been very interesting, this game, all the way through. I mean, uh, it was uh, Ali Reza who was attacking, but now Magnus has kind of turned that around. I mean, he sacrificed the pawn, but he's got this initiative. You look at White's king. White doesn't have any pieces around the king, but the black knights are getting nearer to the white king. Uh, so Ali Reza, he's just got to try to defend any attack. Checkmate is threatened on the board now. That queen, so the white queen defends it. They're both short of time. If he can just stop... Uh, the attack here, then Ali Razor should should be doing very well here. 
Yeah. Can he stop the attack, though? Well, how is Black going to continue the attack? Because uh, the Queen and the Knights are kind of all working together from a long distance. They're only pointing at the G2 square. It has been covered by the Queen. Next move by Ali Reza will be to introduce the Rook to the E7 square. Yeah, he's coming in. He, he needs to do something, Magnus. He needs to somehow zigzag his Rook over to the G file, go for the G2 pawn. Or he needs to do something and he needs to do it quickly. He could also maybe try and threaten the White Queen. But look at the clock times. Oh, he has played queen to c6, and, OK, he's cut out the idea of bishop landing on the d6 square. I think you might be right, Yvanka. The white rook needs to activate maybe into the position. Uh, at some point, you need to get these two pieces working. It's all about the attack on this square, g2. If black can ever break through on that square, he will deliver checkmate. But white is still a pawn up, and uh, rooks are about to be traded. Magnus, is he guiding this to safety? Five seconds. He made that last move with just two seconds wow. left. I mean, brinksmanship here. He's got eight seconds. I didn't realise how short a time he is. So this is getting very, very yeah, critical now. Yeah. I mean, uh, it still seems like White should be holding this, but can Magnus now move his queen into the position he can't because the knight is attacked? Oh, he yes. has. He's oh look at the bar! He's blundered. He's just blundered the, the knight. Are we heading to Armageddon? I think we are. One second for Magnus. He moved there with less than one second on his clock. He's forgotten about this check. This is the key, the killer picking up another pawn with check, only then going for the black knight. And White will be two pawns up in this Queen End game. He is winning now, Ferruja. <gasps> it's all about technique. If he's calm, if he can control his nerves, he's winning. But he's two pawns up. On both sides of the board, he has a pawn majority. It should just be a matter of time. Magnus needs a miracle. Incredible comeback. Two pawns up. Uh, and that should be enough, right? I mean, but it is very short a time. And uh, that means if Ali Razor does win this game, we're going to get Armageddon. Oh, this move, this is killer. lovely. Absolute killer. That pawn's going to become a queen. You can see it. Magnus has got his head in his hands there. I think he's going to have to resign very shortly. And uh, we're going to get more chess. Is this when we bring this up, Simon? Yeah. It is. Yeah, and I think it's about time. And look at that. Yeah, the queen is. centralizes Just, uh, itself. And now the white pawn can advance. The white king is safe as houses there on h2. It is just going to be a masterclass in Queen and Pawn endings from Ali Reza Farouja, even playing with seven seconds on the clock. Yeah, he's doing the right thing. He can take his sweet time about it. Magnus has no easy moves. Meanwhile, White just needs to prevent any checks against his king while combining it with promoting his pawn. First, he'll give a check. Maybe he'll even take a pawn uh, on d4 in the next few moves. But OK, he's still making it hard, Magnus, here. How does White prevent any checks uh, along this diagonal. How does White activate his queen to help his pawn promote? Okay, he hasn't made much progress. Oh, oh what's oh, happening? Whoa. What's happening now? This He's is gone passive. crazy ridiculous. I mean, uh, these queen and pawn endings are notoriously hard, but uh, I think he's just he's, he's just gone too passive. Now you can take the pawn. What is he doing? The nerves are kicking in for Alareza here. He could have gone for it. He could have tried to promote his pawn quickly. He's taken a time out and suddenly he's walking forward with his king, but this is not in a safe direction. Oh, it still looks borderline winning, but there is a way for Magnus Carlsen to draw. How is he going to do it? He can give a check. He can go back with the Black Queen. White's Queen is paralysed here. She cannot support her pawn and defend her king at the same time. Second time we've seen this position, Alarisa has to play for the win. He has to come forwards here, but does Magnus have a perpetual check? He just needs to keep checking the king now. Is there any way that king can escape? The Black Queen seems to be far too active here, and the White king is just running around look at this magnus not sure what to do he's only got nine seconds <gasps> it's so tense these endings forget about the evaluation bar they're so Three, hard to work two, out one second, and, one one second. Move. Oh. and he does what but what about can you queen here what's wow. happening here he's threatening to skewer the wow. white white king and queen he wants to go queen h2 check he's got a knight whoa he promotes to a knight under <laughs> promotion <laughs> defending the white queen <laughs> that is genius and now the white king is going to run that is a ridiculous move. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And why check there? Why did he check there? Why didn't he check on E3? He could have checked on E3 and taken on D3. And Magnus I himself understand doesn't this. understand it. You he know, he's making those moves. Oh. But he could have just taken... OK, But well, now, I mean... suddenly, the knight has disappeared. But, oh, my goodness me. Is Alareza winning again? He is, is winning again. <laughs> hold your breath, because this could still go either way. Magnus is going to give a bunch of checks if he can. OK, first he goes to the corner. The problem is the Black King's just caught in no man's land. It's going to get checked. The pawns are going to run. Yeah, I mean, Mag Magnus is so annoyed with himself. And I, I, I just don't understand. I mean, he's had no time. It's the clock. The clock is what has uh, just completely destroyed him in and this game. 
Yeah, the pawn is running and uh, the white queen beautifully centralized. She's going to help block any incoming checks. It's going to still be a hundred move gain. This is still going to be a grind. It's going to take an age, but Faruja should be winning. In practical terms, you can never defend these. No. I mean, with one pawn, it's hard enough, but with two pawns, uh, it's impossible. But we have said that before uh, today. We even got the, the you've got to resign t-shirt out. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, he, he had a chance to save it. It's, it's ridiculous. And uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, the, the way you win this. You always have some kind of uh, block with the queen to stop the checks and a cross check. And uh, that, that's what White's going to probably do at some point. And I'm expecting that now, but no, he steps the king forward to h6. No more checks for the black queen. Really clever. No checks there. The white a pawn is actually irrelevant. That would just be a distraction. It's all about the white d pawn running. You can push that pawn now. Um... Yeah, or now maybe. <laughs> Sooner or later, you've got to start pushing your pawns. The black king's running over. Ferruja, feel, his play feels nervy. And understandably, with such high stakes, but finally he goes for it. The pawn is running. 10, 11 seconds there for Faruja should be enough now. Just keep pushing. It's a simple plan. Yeah, I mean, you've always got to be, you, you've always got to be careful of these checks. So you push the pawn and now the black queen can come in and check. OK, but he's grabbed one pawn, but uh, that pawn is two squares from queening. It looks to be far too strong here. Yeah, Black's king, you actually want it. It's counterintuitive. You want it as far away as, as possible because now you're going to get caught in the crossfire with some cross checks. As they say, this uh, check might be blocked by the white queen. There we go. And the black king wants to be further away, oh. but now we see his oh, oh, oh my god! What's happening oh my god. here? Oh, these are so hard, hard. these endings, I, though. I They're so the hard. I have table base and table saying that the only way to draw was to put the king on the d5 square, but now it is a win for white. Because of the cross checks again, you can't check because the check on f7, the queen's come off, and the evaluation bar. These are the hardest endings because computers can work them out so quickly, but for humans, it's nearly impossible to work out the right place for the queen, uh, especially with no time on the clock. I think it's as you said, David, just the practicality of defending this is, is really hard, but it's a draw again now. Now the black king's <laughs> going around. Oh, he's gone oh. the wrong way. He could have come he nearer to the pawn there. He needed to go around, he needed to go back via b5 and then c6 towards the white pawn. Yeah. But he's doing what he should do in terms of textbook chess. We study uh, kind of these queen and pawn endgames in books and they always say, bring the king as far away as possible. That was the exception. He needed to actually go closer to the pawn. And the reason the black king's in the corner now is because he won't get checked too many times. Also stalemate ideas, watch out for those. Uh, for example, black could play queen to b3 there, uh, trying to wow. play for stalemates. And uh, yeah, King sometime. D5 would have been the only move, yeah. right? So yeah, that, that was a very nice trick there. Um, Is it still nervy for Ferruccia, would yeah, you say? Yeah, it's definitely. very nervy. Very nervy. You can definitely tell that in his play here. And uh, he's just got to find a safe place for his king. And if he can do that, he can push the pawn. Um, but I, I mean, I, I wouldn't even notice as winning now without <laughs> the, the bar because the black king has found itself in quite a safe place. Uh -huh. Well, the last pawn move was on move 81. Plus 50. So, uh, one, three, one. A still a long way to go. Yeah. But bear this in mind because as the players tick down and they get nervous, then uh, inaccuracies will happen. Yeah. And maybe Magnus can claim a 50 move rule. Okay, and the pawn is ready to push next move. It's yeah. guaranteed now. There's no more checks. Yeah. He needed to hold out until move 131 without allowing the pawn to step forward. But then the counter resets. The 50 move rule is obliterated there. Uh, we start again and Magnus needs to survive. Uh, not allow another queen to appear on the board. But ooh, yeah. there were no checks there. He's pinning the pawn. He's living right on the edge. Yeah, the, the, the black queen is just too passive. The way you, know, you want to try to win these positions is keep your queen in the middle. Because if the queen in the middle, you control more squares. And white's queen is just controlling so many more squares than the black one. And uh, I, that D pawn... It's so close to queening now. I keep thinking Magnus is going to resign, though. I did, I did about 50 moves ago, uh, and he keeps finding some resource to, to play on here. Pinning the pawn now, and White just guarding against that. Yeah, and the uh, beautiful thing here for Faruja is you can just go round and round and round. Eventually, you find the right configuration and you make a new queen. And this is clever. If any checks appeared on the H file, White's queen would have blocked. Uh, note how the Black King is actually on a vulnerable diagonal as well. You cannot. Now, for example, check on the H file because of queen h7 check and the queens would come off, white would win. 
Uh, yeah. So he's trying to defend from afar, but now with some zigzags, you can inch closer with the white queen, check, check, and eventually you cover the promotion square of your pawn. This should be game over now. Yeah, a couple of checks here, and I, I, I think it's going to be... Armageddon time. It's going to be Armageddon, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to get it. So I, I, I think Mangus is going to be so annoyed with this game because uh, he had many chances. Quite nervy, quite a nervy game this yeah. one. You can see that the tension is very high. I mean, it's been a oh. roller coaster of uh, uh, sort of up and downs here, and uh, they both had chances, but in the end, defending was just a bit too hard. He's still got to win it. What move are we on now? 440? Yeah, yeah. It's like 8,036. Yeah, it's four in the morning, and uh, yeah, I mean, it must be 100 and something now. 121. 120. 120. Yeah. Wow. This might be the last few moves, though, because I think if the White King just... Uh, OK, I was going to say slides across one square, but uh, he's going to find safety soon, and the White Pawn should promote. This might be the clincher. You cannot give any checks, because remember the block and the hit on the Black King. OK, now the Queen's behind the Pawn. The pawn is pinned, you can't promote, but the White King's going to run to safety. Still a bit nervy, it seems, with the White... Yeah, but it's so hard to know. Where do you put your King to escape the he, checks? He could have put it in the corner. On H8. Yeah, I think you're right, Yvanka. That might just have been winning. And Magnus Carlsen, I've seen it before. There was a famous game against Gregorian. This is it. Yeah, this but... is it. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing to be done here. Yeah, Ooh, some stalemates, I was going to say. He saved some stalemates before, but the Black King is not trapped in the corner. He's trying to check. Ooh. Don't take the Queen. It's poisoned. That would be stalemate and a draw. Yeah. But the problem is you don't have to take the Queen. And Magnus, he's going to resign. Two Queens are better than one. It's over, and this means, everyone, we will see Armageddon to decide this match in the grand final in the Julius Red Generation Cup. An amazing comeback by Ali Reza Farouja to win game four in a must-win situation. How impressed, Simon, are you with the 20-year-old? Very impressive. I mean, he just kept on going yeah. and going there, and, uh, you know, Magnus obviously had some chances, but he just kept the pressure up, and that was key in that match, and, uh, yeah... It's going to be a really exciting Armageddon game now. <laughs> really exciting. And it was a long, drawn-out endgame as well that Ali Reza won, so Ali Reza will be feeling elated. For Magnus, it's just an exercise in frustration. He knows that he shouldn't have gotten to this point, but we are going to be treated to an Armageddon. And I'm dying to know who has picked the black pieces. Yeah, we will be excited to see the bids. But first, David, what a game. Take us through the highlights here. What a game. A roller coaster full of ups and downs there. But uh, congratulations to Alareza Farouja for fighting back and taking it. A real clutch victory. It was this one moment where he actually confused Magnus Carlsen and managed to uh, confirm that winning queen and pawn endgame. And it was here after Magnus played the really sneaky move, queen to e2. If Faruja here had promoted to a queen, the idea was to skewer the white king to the white queen afterwards. And uh, when the white king sidesteps, we would have seen a drawn endgame. Instead, Faruja played the really ingenious move, knight uh, promotion here, pawn to c8, under promoting to a knight, defending the queen. And as we saw a bit later on, the knight did eventually drop but White was able to win with the extra deep on. Crazy game, but Farouja took it. Incredible stuff. And that means the grand final uh, could be now decided with an Armageddon game winning one game each. Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Farouza, they tied their uh, match and Armageddon. It's coming up in a few minutes, you guys. Here first is a break. Look at the clock. I don't think Ali Reza has enough time to convert this advantage. He's beating! Oh mm -hmm. my goodness! This guy is unreal! Mm -hmm. Farouja, relax! Say Magnus needs to win. Chad, will he do it, Chad? Is Magnus gonna win or not? And this position looks really good for Black as he steals a pawn in the center. This is the moment of truth here, Chad. Mm -hmm. Well, Magnus. Oh, he's made it. To the lose. Oh. He's made it. I can't he's... even say nothing. It's done. Farouja. Woo! That's game. That's match. Fire Far on fire! You see the gentlemanly clap, and Faruja, he doesn't even celebrate. Magnus Carlsen still has that edge, right, that, that, that made him the GOAT and got him to be the best player in the world, the highest rated player in history. Uh-oh. But now things have turned around, and Faruja has got attack. Magnus is, like, unbelievable there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Bishop takes H3 with mate on H2. That's a win from Magnus. Magnus has already won a match today. 
He's looking fresh, feeling fresh in his home environment. The lead on the clock for Magnus. I think that might even be the worst part of this. Not only are there two pass pawns supported yep. by Bishop and then the kick in. Whoa, he resigned? Ten seconds early and Ferruja leans back and Magnus is celebrating. Yeah, that's it. Magnus moves on to the grand final and he's dancing into a matchup against Akari Nakamura. It was super exciting when Magnus and Ali Reza played the Bullet Chess Championship and some more excitement is coming up with Armageddon between these two incredible chess players. Another incredible chess player is eight-year-old Bodana. We have been getting to know her during this Generation Cup. And uh, here is the story of an incredible young girl who is very good at chess. We're here for a special event. Bodhana is going to give a clock symbol against six of Harrow Chess Club's finest. I'm going to try to win all the games. When one of my dad's friends was throwing away some things, uh, um, my I started asking about some pieces and then I said that I wanted to take them away but then my, um, my dad said we needed them and then he taught me how to play. I liked that I could win games and more trophies and also I could go to more countries and make more friends. When I first met her uh, at this Blitz tournament, yes yeah, she won this ending, obviously this should be drawn. But um, she won this, and I thought, heavens, that's something I'd hope to do in a Blitz game, just by playing and playing. I'm just impressed by this. And I thought, this is really fantastic that this young girl can, can play this well. I don't know at what stage it actually becomes winning. It's already very, very unpleasant at this point. These two I got at my first international tournament in Serbia. There's another three somewhere here which I got in Greece, but I'm not sure where they are because there's so many of them. I quite liked this one because straight after I got it, I started trying to like break it off because this part kind of breaks off it. Her thing is positional grinding, and she is pretty scary at that. Knight f6. Good. And she's very good at rook endings, actually, really in the same ballpark as, as you know, proper international players. And checkmate, well done. You spotted the queen sacrifice immediately. Did it, did it just come to your mind? Yeah. I'm impressed. You're getting them all. I thought that would be tough, but no. <laughs> My dad doesn't really want to play against me now. I think he doesn't want to get beaten. We haven't played for a long time, so I think I would beat him, though. So well played. My goal is to become the youngest um, GM in the world, or if not then, the youngest GM in the UK. After that I want to play in the World Championships and get World Champion. I think it will be hard, but I still think I can do it. It's a perfectly reasonable ambition. She understands she's the best in her age in the world, in the world at the moment, so why shouldn't she carry on being? I hope she becomes a, sort of, a very strong player indeed. The final score was Budhana five points, Harrow Chess Club one point. I have two twin sisters. Whenever I try to teach them, they just run away. Like I started when I was five and a half and I keep shouting at them saying, you, you don't even play chess yet. <laughs> Looking at uh, this young girl, I guess there is no doubt the future is bright for chess, Ivanka. No, I mean, it's really bright, especially, I'm especially excited for English chess yeah. as well, because I'm also hoping that her success can also kickstart a new generation of young girls coming in from England and uh, just taking over the world. Yeah. Basically. Basically, yeah. And the future is uh, looking bright uh, for Ali Reza Fruja as well. He's only 20 years old and here he is playing a big match against Magnus Carlsen. He has been able to make a big comeback. First of all, how impressed are you with that, David, that he was able to make that comeback in that must-win situation? Yeah, so many impressive factors. First, he found an opening that Magnus was uncomfortable with, unfamiliar with, which is hard enough in itself. Then the middle game, he managed to spin it in his favour. He won a pawn. That creative under-promotion, promoting to a knight in chess, happens once in a thousand games. And he found the right moment and the finishing technique. Mm. All of it put together shows why he's so classy. 
Yeah. And right now, everyone, we are waiting for the bids from Magnus and Alireza. The lowest bid can decide colors. Probably will choose to play with the black pieces. The player with the white pieces has to win the game to uh, win the match. What do you expect now, Simon, when it comes to the bidding? Um, I, I think Ali Razor will want to have white okay. uh, because he, he, he's really causing Magnus a lot of problems with the white pieces. So I, I, I don't think the bid will be too low from him. I reckon um, let's go 13 and a half minutes. Okay. So that's what I'm reckoning, 13 and a half. So. so how about Magnus? Do you expect he wants the black pieces? I reckon he'd be happy to have black as well, but um, let's say 13. And 13 for 40, Magnus. Yeah. Wow, that's high, Simon. I was yeah, expecting I... eight, nine minutes. Yeah. Uh, that tends to be Magnus's average around eight and a half, maybe. Um, I think he'd be okay with black as long as he had enough time. So I'll say nine and a, nine and a bit. <laughs> and the bids are in. Let's take a look at the bids for the Armageddon. Magnus Carlsen against Ali Reza Faruja wow. in the big final. Eight Perfect. minutes, 56 seconds for Magnus Carlsen. Nine minutes, 10 seconds for Faruja. That means Magnus Carlsen chooses colors. Do you think that is very low, Yuanka, or around what you expected? Well, I kind of expected Magnus to go around that because I remember him and Hikaru were doing some crazy bids. But uh, yeah, Magnus is confident with the black pieces. So uh, that's going to be interesting. Mali Reza, if he plays with the white pieces, has to win on demand again. Exactly. Yeah. And with 15 minutes, because he will have 15 minutes with the white pieces, how difficult will that be? even be for Magnus with 8 minutes 56 seconds. It's going to be a real challenge for Magnus, especially if Alarese can play like he did in that last game. Uh, both players have struck with white. That will boost Ferruja's confidence now. And I think this is uh, yeah, a real 50-50. Could go either way. Too hard to call. It's going to be another must win then for Ali Reza Ferruja with the white pieces. And 15 minutes on the clock. Magnus Carlsen going as low as 8 minutes 56 seconds. I think he's opened a window. Magnus getting ready after losing game four. And here comes the 20 year old, the new generation. Ali Reza Faruja feeling confident and winning game four. Is that momentum change important for him now? Yes, surely. And uh, as long as he starts fast, I think that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Armageddon, we've seen it a few times throughout this tournament. And if you can keep your lead on the clock, you will get chances no matter what. And it's a repeat. It's uh, the exact same opening. And Magnus raises his eyebrows. Uh, he's like, how dare you do that to me twice? Uh, and uh, okay, this time he's come ready. He plays the move A6, that's not what we saw earlier. And a double Fianchetto, pushing both the G and B pawns forward. White's bishops are gonna line up on the longest possible diagonals. Mm -hmm. Interesting play, he's playing a slower approach. Either you attack in the Armageddon, or you keep the tension and try to win on the clock. And Ferruja's maybe mixing matching, doing both. Remember, there is no increment in this game. Magnus Carlsen with a win or a draw will be the winner of the Julius Baird Generation Cup. If Alireza Vruja wins this game, he will take it to a grand final reset with best out of two games. It's uh, now or never for Alireza Vruja. Yeah, and we want to see more chess, of course. Uh, but uh, Vruja, he still needs to win this game first. And at least in terms of opening, it's much healthier for Magnus. No king problems. The last thing you want in Armageddon chess is to be facing an attack like he was in the last game with a king stranded in the center. Both sides have developed very naturally. I think Magnus will be a lot happier in this game than uh, the last game he had in the same opening because, well, look at his king. <laughs> He's managed to castle it for a start, which is which is a big improvement. And uh, this is more positional by by nature compared to that game because uh, uh, it was all that last game was all about keeping the tempo up from Ali Razor's perspective and stopping Black from castling. This this position is going to revolve around the centre. And you can see White putting pressure on that and possibly uh, a weak black pawn in the centre. Uh, so definitely more positional this game. But do you think Magnus will be comfortable playing with that weak pawn? I think so. I think, I think he plays these positions quite a lot. And this is where having the draw in hand is, is very handy uh, because isolated pawn positions, they often give the person playing against them white in this case the advantage the black pawn in the middle if you're not sure what isolate pawn is is weak it can't be defended by another uh, pawn there uh, but they often they often end up going to a draw uh, with correct defense so I, I think he'd be quite happy with this magnus to, to be honest uh, yeah I, I agree simon i've seen too many games where magnus uh, takes the isolated queen's pawn as black this pawn on d5 
He trades off the right assortment of pieces. He's left with one weakness, but one weakness is not enough for the opponent to win the game. And uh, I've actually, yeah, I've spoken to him about it a few times as well. He's very confident in these positions. He's not worried at all about the structural uh, defects here. And uh, this last move also really nice uh, in terms of breaking the white coordination. The white queen was sitting pretty, defending her knight in the center of the board, but now she's been hit. Either you have to move her to some really awkward squares or you have to block this attack from the bishop, uh, from the black bishop against the white queen, and that's not pleasant either. Uh, really tough choice. And Farouk just slowed down. The six minute time advantage that he had at the start of the game has now become under five minutes. And uh, I think he really needs to uh, up that pace again if he wants to win this game. Magnus has done a good job only investing one minute to this point so far. Yep. Yeah, he has done a great job. And uh, Ali Reza using the time on the clock and there we see him retreat the knight. I didn't quite like this move because it was self-pinning. It's very passive. And it felt like it was a little bit loose. And I'm just, if I were Magnus, I would be just thinking about uh, either stepping the queen forward or this one, which one I preferred just to introduce the rook to the open lines. Yeah, really awkward move. I guess this is the first uh, sign we've seen from Ferruccio that he's desperate in this must-win situation for the full point. Uh, this, uh, this kind of night retreat that he's gone for, it's last resort type of thing. It's basically if you see no other attractive options, maybe he thought others would lead to simplifications, trades and a draw. Uh, so he's put his knight on a bad square. Now he's blocked in white's light squared bishop. He's breaking the rules here. You can't do that. And uh, also take a look at the white king. It's on an open diagonal. I just feel like... And, and then the bishop now comes to a, a loose square. Loose pieces drop off. This feels really vulnerable and really kind of edgy uh, from Ferruja, not in a good way. Okay, how does Black take advantage though? Thinking, push the pawn, push the B pawn forward and attack. Is that possible or is there some... Attacking that this... white knight on the edge? Yeah. Makes sense. He needs to move Magnus though. He's spent 30 seconds on this move and that's too long in Armageddon chess. Especially when there's no real calculation to be done. It's just about feeling, piece placement. You don't get extra time. This is such a key thing. So, so he has gone for your move, Ivanka. And um, the the problem is that this this time ticking down, you can get flagged a lot. And Ali raises very quick when he wants to be. But good move here. I like this move. You, I like the way that Magnus is playing aggressive, uh, giving himself this isolate pawn, but he's keeping up the activity. And White has the decision now to make where that knight goes into. Uh, it has two tempting squares there, David, I guess, going into b6 or c5, both of those dark squares. Yeah, the knight could also retreat, but no real tempting options there. Ferruja wants to jump forward with this knight, but there might be tactics. Um, white's pieces are so loose right now, especially the white dark squared bishop sitting uh, kind of stared down by the black rook indirectly right now. Watch out for the black bishop to jump out the way at the right moment and uh, unleash and discovered attack. It's actually really tricky because if you, where do you go? I mean, like, if you go to B2, there's also Bishop A3. So maybe this is one of the only squares which is reasonably safe here. But uh, the white pieces are lacking harmony here. Uh, if you could put the pawn on F3, back on F2, where the light square Bishop is going, then great. But Magnus just improving uh, mm. each move. Looking good for Magnus so far, but not on the clock. Yeah, and uh, Ali Reza will have to go on full-on calculation mode as he had to anticipate Black Pawn stepping forward. And Magnus responding quickly with the bishop coming to A3. A3, the bishop is threatening to come to B2. And once again, Ali Reza is being asked questions. Big, big trouble for Ali Reza on the board. Simply, he's got no coordination. Look at White's pieces. We talked about traffic jam earlier in the day. The White pieces are around the White King. They keep the King safe, but they're not active. They're just passive. They're stuck. And there's holes, meanwhile, on the other flank. That's why Magnus has invaded now. Uh, this black dark square bishop, as uh, Yovanka's pointing out here, is creating some threats. Black's pawns as well in the center, holding the space, holding the territory here. White has no attractive moves, no active moves. You can't grab this isolated queen's pawn, black uh, pawn in the center of the board with the white knight because uh, the other white knight would be hanging there. And look at this. Magnus is just saying, I'm going to keep coming forward, keep pouring forward. Evaluation bar says maybe there were better moves, but this looks really beautiful. You've locked down this flank now. The queen side is blacks and Alariza needs to fight back. Yeah, 
And uh, Magnus of Pieces are threatening to spring forward because the Light Square Bishop is also threatening to mobilize to F5 and hit at the C2 point. And White's Pieces are just in a cluster. It, they're not doing anything there on the right side of the board. Yeah, the six minute time advantage he started mm. the game with, Ferruja, it's now three minutes. It's been halved and uh, already momentum on black side. I think that's only going to uh, increase uh, that pattern. I think he's got to keep playing quickly, Ali Razor here. If he can keep playing at a decent pace, when I say quickly, obviously take a bit of time to think, um, then he keeps chances alive because uh, uh, the position, all the pieces are on the board. It's not that bad for white at all. Black's pieces are a bit better, but it's still okay. And you're, you're going to get the, some chances at some point. Maybe just move the queen up one square, play a logical move like that, connect the rooks. Connecting the rooks is a very good idea because you want to use your rooks to get into the game, into the middle. Um, something along those lines, and but I think he's got to he's got to keep the pace up. Uh, he doesn't want to get down to an equal situation on time, and have a slightly worse position. Yeah, and Magnus made a bit of a face there. He was like, "Oof, you're still thinking? Come on, <laughs> speed up." And uh, Queen D2, Simon, I like it. Move the White Queen. You could play the move G4, start pushing pawns, do something towards the Black King, take away squares. You have to just decide. Yeah, for better or worse. No tempting options here. You just have to kind of trust your instincts. And I like your G4 because it is a must-win game. Why not? You take away the F5 square for uh, the bishop and you push push the pawns on the king side, basically. I like that idea. Uh, you know, this is this is kind of Ali Reza's style as well, uh, attack. So um, what's he going to play? Uh, he spent a lot of time here. Yeah. And... That must be so uncomfortable. You no, know you have to play fast. You know you have to speed up. It's frozen. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's made his move. Oh, oh no. is that a blunder? And you can just see the evaluation bar just zoom all the way down in Black's favour. I mean, uh, I think Bishop F5, Bishop is, F5. Is, is just a move with very logical move here. Yeah, let's show this. This is a big stronger. mistake. Wow, the computer says there's something even stronger. Wow. Uh, bishop to f5 looks very good hitting this pawn, but the whole idea is that the white knight would counterattack against this bishop and keep the game going. Black's still better, but uh, minimizing the damage. The winning move here on the spot, plus five advantage for Magnus if he finds it, is pawn to d4, taking away that square from the white knight. You cannot take it with... Oh, oh he doesn't find it. it. You it. can't take it with the knight now because the knight, the other knight would be hanging on c3. Uh, this would lose a piece after the rook takes here. But uh, if you take with another piece, for example, the bishop, only now bishop f5 would have won the game on the spot, crashing in on C2. Uh, Magnus doesn't see it, but still in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. Onto H5, can't be a bad move. Maybe trying to loosen up the white king side over here. Stopping G4 as well, and uh, just gaining a bit more space. Well, uh, Forza did spend a lot of time before he made that rook move. Could there be some sort of a trap he wants to set here? I think he just missed that D4 uh, pawn push. I think he was hoping for the black bishop to land on F5 so he could spring forward knight D4 and... At least it's slightly messy. Uh, but, but he's okay again now, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I say okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still a game on, you know. He's not losing immediately. Uh, he's just worse here. But Magnus's time, again, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, look at it tick down. You don't get any extra time. If Magnus gets to one minute, no matter what the position is, he can get flagged. Um, he can lose on time. So, uh, And it's getting near that, that stage already now. And we did see uh, those uh, images from the bullet chess championship wow. between these two. They are quite good at bullet chess, both of them as well. <laughs> but who would be the favorite if we're down to the minute? Oof. I mean, they were taking, yeah. I mean, they were punching each other. They were hitting each other, striking, knocking lumps out of each other, uh, trading blows there. It was so close. I think they won one match each against each other in that. I, I think Ali Razor won the first one and then Mag they're, they're so close, aren't they? Yeah. They're just both brilliant bullet players. But uh, Magnus simplifying things here by making an exchange. Simplifying. It looks good, at least uh, from a practical point of view. He's getting pieces off the board. He's temporarily sacrificed a knight as black to lure the white queen onto the C file where she's stared down by a black rook. And now we're getting the material next turn. Uh, this white knight uh, will disappear on C3. Uh, Magnus... Pausing. I'm not sure why. He's got to take that knight in Armageddon chess. You can't burn 10 seconds on a forced move. What else is he thinking about? He's got to take the piece. Yeah. There we go. He does eventually go for it. But, OK, still a two and a bit uh, minute advantage for Ferruja. At least now the pawn structure is in balance. OK, he's really fighting back. Uh, Alareza here. I, I would not write him off at all. I mean, again, 
black is better here because black's pieces have more space, more, more area to breathe. Um, all of black's pieces better than white's pieces. But white is quite solid and white has a sizable time advantage and mm. these things do count. Uh, you know, there's no obvious way that Magnus can break through in this, uh, in this position. But having said that, there is a big dilemma for Ali Reza on the board. You know, he has to recapture that rook. Does he recapture it with a rook and allow black to retreat the bishop and pin the knight? Or is he recapturing with a bishop, which does expose the king? Are both of them tempting? Well, they're not tempting. That's the whole point there. They're both unattractive in their mm -hmm. own way. So, okay, see, so he does capture with a rook. And there we see Magnus step back with a bishop. And now the knight on c3 is pinned. But you know what? At White's position, he, he's, he's, uh, if he can get out of this pin, his pieces, his bishop in the middle of the board, they're starting to look quite nice for White. I oh. mean, uh, it's, it's improving for Ali Reza, definitely. He's also always got a threat of taking the Black Knight, opening up Magnus's king. Massive improvement from Alareza just over the last few moves. Magnus maybe not finding the killer blow. It's hard to in Armageddon when you're watching the clock. And OK, he's curled up into a ball. He's defended everything. Magnus has traded off his beautiful bishop uh, in order to win a pawn on a2. Uh, OK, materialistic. Maybe this is uh, the way to go. But still, anything can happen. The bishop pair for white have great potential. He needs something now, though, Alareza. And, I mean, you've got to just imagine white at some point going bishop takes knight. Uh, black would have to recapture and the black king is opened up. But fortunately, the white king is very weak as well uh, on the first two ranks. There's a lot of air you can see going towards white's king. So black has counterattacks with his rook coming down the board to check the king. Uh, and this, this would be uh, very tragic, a bishop coming in, adding to the firepower there. So that... That move you can't play now, but it's always there as a threat. Magnus taking another pawn. Um, wow, this is this is really now getting to the critical critical point. Ooh. Ooh, and oh, and oh, pushes his pawns forward. This is just him taking risks in a must-win situation. Uh, that's not the move he wanted to play. If he was happy with the draw there, maybe he could have snapped off the Black Knight. The queens would have come off in a draw, but. OK, he's got to win here. And Magnus right, is forcing the queens move. off the board. Great move there. Brilliant move. Love it. Look at how he's going to trade queens now. There we go. Queens have been eliminated. It cost black a pawn, but he had two extra pawns anyway. Magnus is playing for the draw here. That's all he needs. And look at the clock. He's only 30 seconds down. He's a massive favourite to hold this. But two bishops are white. Uh, some space advantage. It's still game on. Uh, definitely Magnus is over the worst now. And there's some little tricks here. If you try to move your king upwards to get out of the, out of the pin, uh, there's a pawn check. But, you know, there's still chances here. It's definitely still chances. White does have the ability to push forward with the pawns and at the right time, if he can, then if he manages to release the light square bishop, then it's still very much going to be anyone's game because Black's king is in potential trouble. So that's how uh, Ali Reza is thinking. Can he just step forward with the G pawn? Look at his time right. He's now caught and overtaken Magnus on the clock as well. Mm. That was the thing I was saying, you need to really keep that time advantage no matter what because it gives you another way to win the game. If things start to go wrong, you can just play moves. You don't even have to play the best moves, just play moves and win on the clock. But he's really he's really sinking into a think here. Yeah, maybe and, uh, Yeah, maybe Ali Reza has to activate his rook, put it on E7. He has to do something. He has, he has to, to do, do it something. Yeah, he has to do it quickly here, simply. If he had more time on the clock, if he still had a two-minute time advantage, he could even trade rooks and play on that position forever and ever and ever, opposite colour bishops, whatever, just to try and win on the clock. But that option is gone. He will never win on time now, Alareza. He needs to win on the board. He's a pawn down. He's a pawn down. He's got... OK, this, this is the move that Ivanka recommended. Looks like a good try. You've got to try to get your pieces into the game. Magnus moves quickly. Magnus threatening to win a piece now with that bishop he just moved, coming down to add pressure to White's light square mm. bishop. He can come all the way down. That light square bishop is pinned. So Ali Reza is threatened with quite a nasty move there. And he's got to find a way to deal with it. And look at the time as well. He's down three minutes now. Yeah. But the problem, Simon and David, is that it's really difficult to deal with that threat of the bishop coming into F1. 
If you step back with the king, you're just going to get checked. And that's why Ali Reza's had to sound the retreat. But unfortunately, now it's the knight that's going to spring forward to the F4 square. Black's piece is taking over here. I mean, I know white's got the two bishops, but the two bishops are really bad, especially the bishop by white's king. It can't move. It's in a pin. And that black knight, as you said, Yvanka, is just threatening to come and attack it again. You've also got an extra pawn. It's quite handy, isn't it, as well? So... Yeah. Alarez's body language is not positive right now. He knows that he's on the brink of elimination and he's come close. He's taken it to Armageddon. But how is he ever going to win this position? A pawn down facing this pin on the second rank, the deadly pin there. His bishop's now getting kicked around the board. And uh, Black has various ways to guide this game to safety, let alone, uh, yeah, let him maybe even playing for the win if Magnus is feeling ambitious. Mm. Uh, First time expecting him to maybe even lock down this king side. The second rank pin is not going to go away anytime soon. Black's A pawn could start running as well. The pass pawn, that's the side you have the extra pawn after all. There's, there's, pushing it. there's still some tiny hope for white because white, if they manage to push the F pawn forward, can uh, one day release that light square bishop. So I like your idea of locking everything down. Yeah, it's a great move. I mean, there's always hope in Armageddon as well, isn't there? Mm. You always have a chance with the nerves on show. Suddenly Magnus uh, having this long think. We've seen it a few times, long think, wrong think. When uh, Ferruja was tanking earlier, he made a mistake after uh, investing a lot of time. Will Magnus do the same? Wow, he's jumped in with his knight. Oh! And he's trying to go for the draw. He's not playing for the win here, Magnus yeah. Carlsen. He's just giving up his knight after the white rook takes. It's been lured away. And Simon's idea, Black Bishop jumping to F1, winning that pinned... There we go, winning that pinned white bishop. And notice how the remaining bishops on the board will be of opposite colour. So phew, this one almost dead drawn now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, unless your bishop gets in some trouble, but I don't think it does. I mean, yeah, this this uh, obviously should be a draw now. Uh, White's piece is slightly better though, so white can try to get in, but opposite colour bishops. I mean, uh, the, these are... Uh, these are notoriously drawn positions. I mean, the bishops, the reason they're so drawn is the bishops can never connect. Uh, they can never challenge each other, so they can keep passing each other in the wind there because they're on different colours squares. So they always just drift by, meaning that they can't hit the same target. So yeah. a draw becomes very likely. And uh, whilst a draw might be likely, it's not the result that Ali Reza wants. And uh, bear in mind that if there's any side that is pushing for the win, it's going to be black with that extra pawn mm -hmm. and the bishop attacking the h3 pawn there. And Magnus, just uh, ask a question to the c5 bishop. There is a check. The king can hide. Oh, and he's going in. There's only one weak spot in black's camp, and that is the pawn on the dark square on g7 next to the black king. He's going to try and hit it with his rook next move, but that can be easily guarded against. And uh, Magnus can start trading off pawns if he needs to. A lot of time on the clock, even without Black's A pawn. I think this is uh, an easy draw uh, for someone of Magnus's calibre. You, you almost feel like the White King is on danger of getting checkmated if you can remove some of its escape squares. It's been spending a lot of time though, yeah. Magnus. Yeah. So, I mean, you're getting under two minutes now, and this is where it just gets really random. Uh, you lose on time, no increment, you lose the game, and. Uh, that's quite an aggressive move. He's checking oh, the king. But he's, he's securing the draw, right? And now the rook is going to well, come he's down. Checkmate. Threaten of position. checkmate. The rook. Harry. Yeah, with, with Harry and with the rook. H4. That'd be a, a very appropriate way to finish the match, I feel. Checkmate with Harry. And uh, there it goes into the board. And he's now taking some pawns. And is there any way the black king can get in danger here? Um, I mean, I don't see it. But the black king is a little bit short of squares, but. You need to get either, you need to get the white king. The only chance now, I think, is for the white king to try to encroach on the black king's position and to get a checkmating net around it, or to win on time, um, or for Magnus's internet to go down, <laughs> or for uh, mouse, slips. <laughs> mouse slips. Yeah, or uh, seen it before. That is true. And uh, Magnus here. If clock times were reversed, he might be starting to feel a bit panicky. But okay, he has paused here. He just needs to get all white's remaining pawns off the board and make sure he doesn't get checkmated. Those two things, either or, will guarantee the draw now. And how look does at, he secure this? But look yeah. at the clock. They're, no, they're going to get under a minute and they're playing very slowly. I mean, you can just flag. Yeah. These are times where you, you know, you're going to get 
real tense finish to this because in a moment, look at him. He's, oh, he, what's he's that also about? Saying, I think he's like, what? What am I doing? I'm spending far too long. But, but now it's a White, bullet game. White has the chance to actually push the F pawn to F5 and create like some kind of attack on the Black King. Uh, Magnus here, he's banking on the black rook, sliding behind the white king with a check. And uh, there's some targets on the e-file pin. Oh, he's dropped what's back. happened here, though? Okay, but the h-pawn now surely can come forwards. Yeah. And that h-pawn is two, is a couple of squares of queening, but they are playing so calm for under a minute I now. I know. Uh, they, and, but this could be a killer. There's a big threat, h2, h1, queen. And I don't think there's any checkmate nets there. The only, the only chance is to go f5, as you said, Yvanka. Bishop takes pawn. Maybe you could try that here. Push the pawn to f5, h2, bishop takes f6, threatening checkmate. Could be, could be worth <laughs> a try. It's the only chance that white has. Otherwise, the h pawn is just going to queen. He's and he's uh, setting it. it up. And Magnus has to be careful. And Magnus it. is... Now the Black King has some light squares to escape to. Magnus finally kind of makes a head movement. And he knows he's winning. His pawn is soon going to promote. First, he gives a check. He's still a bit nervy here, but 22 seconds for Ferruja. It surely isn't enough to even complete this game. I mean, yeah, he, he, but that was a nervy check there. They, they are they are so nervous in this match. You can see it. And Ooh, the F-bomb coming forwards. He's but given it's, up his rook. He's, wow. <laughs> he's given up his rook to try and promote the black F-pawn. But uh, White's rook would then have had to give itself up, and that would have been a draw. Magnus is going to win on the clock here. 12 seconds, 10 seconds now yeah. for Alareza. This one is over. Look, the pawn's about to promote. Yeah, he's going for checkmate, but this is forlorn. Yeah, Black Queen on the board now is going to win this game. Magnus, he's, he's got it. He's got it in the end. Wow, what a fight though that was! Amazing. It's, uh, over, Magnus Carlsen. He takes it. This is the winner of the Julius Baer Generation Cup after an exciting final match here against Ali Reza Ferruja, who took it to Armageddon, but eventually Magnus Carlsen he wins his third event in the Champions Chess Tour 2023 with a very exciting performance here and a good performance by Magnus Yvanka, impressed by the world number one. Yeah, I mean he pulled it together, you know, because it must have been a really frustrating fourth uh, game loss for yeah. Magnus, but uh, comes to the Armageddon and he has his opening improvement ready and. He just played as if he meant business. Yeah. Very impressive game. It's been a battle of uh, generations, uh, Simon. Does Magnus prove that, well, his generation with him in the lead is still the best in the world? The old guys are still doing well at the yeah. moment. So, yeah, but who knows how much longer that will last. I mean, Ali Reza was playing really good at moments during that match. And we're joined by uh, Magnus Carlsen, the winner of the Julius Baer Generation Cup. Uh, congrats, Magnus. Thank you. Intense uh, final air, especially with that final uh, rapid game and heading to Armageddon. How do you feel about how this day went for you? Uh, relief. Um, I just, it was not my day at all today. Um, I think, to be honest, I think I was pretty lucky um, to, to even make it to the Armageddon. Unfortunately, I got a position that was pretty easy to play in the Armageddon, but my brain was not working today um, at all. Um, I, I had a um, um, I had a nice dinner with my family before before I played, and uh, even before that, I could feel that I, it was not working. Um, but I guess especially after that, I was just I was just dead. So I'm super relieved to to have won the match. Um, and uh, I think that some days, like, some days are good, some days um, you got to try and get through. And that was one of, this was one of them, and I'm really happy that I did. So do you think that is down to your experience then, that on a bad day where you feel drained, you are actually able to win it? Mm, a little bit. Um, I think it's mostly mostly that even on bad days I can usually sort of sort of compete. But yeah, it was um was tough. Maybe maybe he could have uh pounced a bit earlier in the um, the first rapid games could have been out for blood like a little more, especially in the first game, like 
I have, I mean, I had a terrible position and I had no time. Uh, so I think he had a great chance there. Uh, but um, yeah, it was um, Mustafa. Yeah, was this a day uh, also then when Ali Reza didn't take the chances that you have to take if you're going to beat uh, yourself in a match? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's exactly um, exactly right. That um, he needed to be um, even crisper than he was. Obviously, he's really he's really strong, and on a day like this, he posed me a lot of problems. But um, in the in the critical moments, we're both kind of uh, floundering a, a bit, and um, yeah, for him that was um, just about not enough. Um, Magnus, congratulations. Uh, did you feel that Alareza did anything different from the last match? Could you tell that he maybe adopted a different strategy this time? To be honest, I just think that I played worse. <laughs> I think that was the main difference. Yeah. So, um, um, frankly, I didn't feel like anybody except Lazovic had a, had a really good tournament from, from the others. So, um, yeah, um, Alvarez was, I think, pretty good in his match against Wesley. Otherwise, I was, um, I, I, I think he's played better in the past. Yeah, this, uh, congratulations, Magnus. I just wanted to ask you, did uh, starting two hours later impact your routine? Um, well, it meant that I had time to join my family for dinner, which was nice. Um, <laughs> Apart from that, um, not really. Like, I just woke up today, um, well, fairly late, but feeling really well rested, but also, um, also without much energy. And yeah, maybe I needed to change things up a, a bit today to to get that energy. I was just hoping I would be able to get through mm. get through it. And uh, the fact that you are feeling a little drained, Magnus, is it coming off a long World Cup playing here in the Generation Cup? Uh, do you need a break now? Is that what you feel? Maybe a little bit. Um, I am taking a, um, a break from tomorrow, so I'll be, um, I'll be away for, for about a week. And will that break include uh, training playing chess or is it uh, to get chess off your head? Well, it wouldn't be a proper vacation without looking at any chess because I love chess. It's <laughs> like it's been my biggest hobby as well as work for uh, for such a long time. So I'm not going to be completely away from it. For instance, the speed chess championship is starting, so I'm going to be following that for sure. Um, but I probably won't be playing much. All right. And I also have to ask you, Magnus, this is second year in a row that you win the Julius Baird Generation Cup proving that you are still the best in the world. When do you expect the next generation with players like Fruja, Gukesh to take over? Um, it's kind of up to them, to them, really. Like they have, they have what it takes, but um, the final boss of chess is um, usually pretty tough. All right. <laughs> Uh, and Magnus, after like winning everything uh, that can be won, pretty much, um, how do you like stay motivated? Is it just your love of chess, or uh, is there anything else you want to win? Well, you can always win things again, no. But I, I think what I play for is days like my first game against Alreza. You know, Sicilians feeling good, feeling the flow and so on um i just yeah i love playing uh and i love the feeling of winning still so that's enough for me and magnus it's been a big week for you uh of course the highlight though is surely the release of a book i think uh one of the co-authors <laughs> in the studio any words about that one um yeah uh can i get a copy <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you one. Grind like a grandmaster. Yeah. Out now. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm looking, looking forward to, looking forward to it. And um, did you pick the title for that book? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, David is the one who came up with, um, okay. with uh, the title and the uh, concepts. Um, 
to be honest, like she did most of the work for, um, for the course and all the work for the book. So, um, <laughs> he's the one who should be, um, he should, he's the one who should be praised. And, uh, he is, um, the real grandmaster. Ah, <laughs> some beautiful words there for David Magnus, big congratulations on another win and enjoy your vacation. Thank you so much and uh, good to have you back as well, Kaya. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. All right, he is the winner. Magnus Carlsen of the Julius Bear Generation Cup. And uh, that was an uh, incredible performance by him, losing only two games in this tournament. Today's match, Ali Reza Faruja losing game three, was able to make a great comeback in game four to take it to Armageddon. But we do see Magnus uh, getting two brilliances in today and the accuracy 84%. What do you think about that? I think that just reflected the complexity of the games, the nerves. We're used to high, maybe higher numbers from both players, but uh, they entertained us and that was the main thing. Simon, how will you sum up the Julius Baird Generation Cup? What has impressed you? What do you feel about the battle between the generations? Uh, it's been great all the way through. I, I did like those Sicilian games. Uh, I, I love that action, but um, other things that have been very impressive, Dennis, the young Dennis, 16 years old, played such great chess. I think he's going to be a real uh, name and player to to keep an eye on for, for the future. So he, he was a highlight as well of this tournament. Yeah, but Magnus Carlsen is the winner with some incredible play. And I hear rumors. We have some very nice stats here. Uh, Magnus Carlsen, the Julius uh, Berry Generation Cup winner, overall event performance. Look at that. Wins with the black pieces, four. Winning with uh, Armageddon here, accuracy almost 90% throughout the tournament. Total moves played 950. What's your reaction to this, David? Firstly, that's a lot of moves. Yeah, Magnus I know. Will wish he got paid uh, by the move here, but uh, either way, impressive stuff in terms of accuracy, considering how many complicated games he had. Interesting that he's gone back to basics. Uh, we talk about Generation Cup, he's gone, he's gone back to what he knows best, playing E4, playing the Sicilian as black, his uh, favorite openings there. But uh, yeah, impressive stats either way. Yeah, I was really impressed by the fact there's only been one Armageddon. I so, I mean, I would have expected more. Um, but anyhow, Magnus has been very, very impressive. And uh, I'm very impressed by his performance today because he said it, you know, he felt tired, he felt out of, out of sorts, but still, he managed to beat Ali Reza in one game, in a very impressive game, I have to say, and uh, also in the Armageddon, it made, made it look very clean. Mm. I think there was that list of the top three players in the world, um, which I think it was Ajamato, a very famous YouTuber said, and it was uh, Magnus Carlsen, number one, and then it was uh, maybe Magnus when partying, number two. Then number three, it was uh, a, a tired Magnus, I think. <laughs> and uh, so the list goes on, even a tired Magnus Carlsen is, a very dangerous Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. it, it feels we often talk about his motivation. Do you think Magnus Carlsen seems very motivated right now, David? I mean, he seems happy. He was talking of his love of chess. I mean, if I was on holiday, I'm not sure I would be uh, checking out the latest games, the latest opening developments, but he seems to be in a happy place right now in the zone, uh, still grinding out those results, even if he doesn't feel at his best. Um, long may that continue. I think uh, the new generation as well, they want him to be at his best when they uh, finally catch him. So, yeah, it's a good time for the chess world. Yeah, sure. definitely. And only one regular event remain in uh, the Champions Chess Tour 2023. Magnus Carlsen is guaranteed a spot in the next event. And also in the Tour Finals in Toronto, five out of eight spots have been taken, most recently with Wesley So and Fabiano Carona qualifying but three spots are still up for grabs and Ali Reza Faruja, well, he is qualified for that final sixth event and he is five points behind Denis Lazovic. It's going to be a battle for those points in event six to make it to Toronto. Who do you hope and who do you think we're going to see there in Toronto, Yamanka? Um, I kind of hope that Ali Reza Faruja and Denis Lazovic, because he's such an exciting talent, only 16 years old, will make it to Toronto. Um, it's going to be exciting because what I love about this event is that you have the big play-ins where every grandmaster is allowed to play in that. And it could be anyone, actually, if they have a great week, great day. 
being there in Toronto. Yeah, and I, I think you've got to remember that Nepo's playing the next plane as well, he right? Is. And uh, well, he's such a great player. That's going to be it's going to be very exciting. So yeah. Yeah, Division One is going to be stacked. It's going to be a huge event. Uh, remember, whoever wins that can still book their place in Toronto. At least two rating spots, therefore, or two ranking spots uh, on points. Stakes are higher than ever. And uh, we're closing in on the season finale. It's been a great year. It's going to get even better. Yeah, it is. Only one regular event uh, left before all roads lead to Toronto. Six events, eight players. We are nearing the end of the 2023 season and the fight to secure a spot at the finals is definitely on. Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura and Nordibek Abdusatarov have already qualified through winning individual events. Plus Wesley So and Fabiano Caruana punched their tickets with tour points. And now only three spots remain. The finale will be played from December 9th to 16th in Toronto, Canada. Follow to see who will get a chance to fight for the 2023 Champions Chess Tour title. It's going to be one of the most exciting events on the chess calendar in Toronto in December. And actually, you can get tickets to the Tour Finals by bidding on the Julius Baird Generation Cup trophy. Owning the trophy comes with tickets for the tour final, and uh, you can submit your bids at chesschamps.io. And we also have to announce another winner. We had the quiz today, and uh, the question today, the final question in the Julius Baird Generation Cup was in 2006, Vichy Anand crossed 2800 in rating as the fourth player in history. Who were the three other players who had achieved this at the time? Let's take a look at the answer. Okay, Kasparov and Topalov. Correct. I'm very confident about those two. Then I've put Kramnik because I know he did, but I think it might have been a bit later. I'll say Kramnik is my third. Okay, and you, Simon? Okay, um, yeah, I've gone Kasparov and Topalov as well. Uh, and I did also go for Fisher, which is a bit back in the, no, it seemed logical. <laughs> so he was a good player. So one of you have all three, correct? <sighs> I must be Kramnik. It's going to be Unfortunately, Simon, ah. yeah, 2800 was just uh, not... It was uh, a dream. Uh, it was a dream away in those days. I think he got 2790. Yeah, I mean, that's... Close, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was... But David, you got all three correct. You get one point. And you are the winner of the quiz. Congratulations. Well done, Dave. <laughs> well done, Dave. <laughs> Good work, Dave. Uh, thank you. <laughs> he, knows, he knows his chess history, this man. Time to get back he to does, school. Yeah, so. <laughs> been a good day for you, David. Winning the go-kart, winning the quiz. What can I say? I'm lucky. I'm sorry, Simon. You'll get me next time. <laughs> I'm not sure if you technically won the go-kart because on the leaderboard, I did the faster lap. <laughs> it said number one, and we have evidence of that, but just, just to put that straight. <laughs> you did, you won. All I'll right. give you that one, Simon. No, you won. Well done. So I guess David as well will win one of these great t-shirts. And uh, let's take a look at who uh, won the t-shirt. From you guys at home, answering Kasparov, Kramnik, and Topolov, SLK Chess is the winner and will receive Simon's You Resign Now t shirt. This is super cool. It has not been worn by Simon Williams. I'm sorry, I bet you would prefer a worn t shirt, but uh, <laughs> smells nice. <laughs> you guys, it's been so much fun being back in the studio with you guys, learning about chess, enjoying some drama. Hope you enjoyed it, Kyle. So good to have you back with us. It's been very fun. And still, one event, regular event left. And the Champions Chess Store 2023 is starting in only three weeks. So we will be back very soon. It's been so much fun having you guys with us for the Julius Baird Generation Cup. And we'll see you soon again. Bye. Whoa. Oh, whoa. Oh. Okay. What? Swapping queen to when you were a pawn down. Suddenly it's game on. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, and Magnus leans forward. It's like he heard you there, David. That is a heartbreak for Ferruja. Magnus Carlsen wins. Yeah. Oh, look at the bar. He's blundered. Are we heading to Armageddon? I think we are.